waiting for the attorney, Sean Mason. Sean, you're muted. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A report to make out of the closed session before we uh, adjourn the special meeting into the regular meeting. The council did meet uh, in closed session on the uh, trip and fall case noted on the agenda and the council unanimously approved the settlement of that case for a, a settlement payment of $45,000. Thank you. Thank you. And we have everybody here, I think. Okay. Welcome everyone to this regular meeting on Tuesday, um, January 19th. And will you please uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, Madam Clerk, can you please call roll? With pleasure, Mayor. Council Member Goethals. Here. Council Member Pappen. Here. Council Member Lee. Here. Deputy Mayor Bonilla. I will note for the record when he joins uh, the meeting, uh, Mayor Rodriguez. Here. Okay, just a quick housekeeping announcement. Um, due to the health orders in place at this time, we are holding meetings remotely. Information on how to provide public comment is explained at the bottom of each published agenda. When public comment is announced for the item you wish to comment on, when signed into the Zoom call, use the raise your hand feature and you will be called upon at the appropriate time. If you're using the phone, um, press star nine to raise your hand. And when you're called upon, press star six to unmute. <clears throat> These options for public comment will remain available until I close public comment period for, a specific, uh, for that specific item. Okay. Um, do we have, we have item number one, and that is re Rethink Waste Poster Contest. And we have Emmy, oops, just took over my, my notes. We have Emmy uh, Hashumi and uh, Ec Environmental Education Manager for Rethink Waste. Take it away, Emmy. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members, and members of the public. As the mayor noted, my name is Amy Hashizumi, and I'm the Environmental Education Manager at Rethink Waste. And one of my favorite things that our agency does is we get to host an annual poster <clears throat> contest for students every fall. So this year's theme was Rethinking Waste on the Move, which encouraged students to think about the ways they can reduce waste while they're outside or while they were at home during the pandemic. And we received many beautiful submissions and posters, but we did choose Ellie's as our honorable mention. Um, Ellie, are you on? I hope she's here because she has a great poster that we would like to share. Oh, there it is. Well, I'll go ahead and share that um, Ellie uh, won our honorable mention and she had a uh, poster titled um, Costumes Reuse. So as you could see, she had a very colorful poster and she illustrated how she actually takes old clothing and she made masks out of it. And she does everything she can to make sure she's not throwing away those uh, clothes or used fabric. So she did a great job and we loved how specific she was um, and how she conveyed that through her artwork. Wow, that is, that's amazing artwork. Mm -hmm. I, it's always never ceased to amaze me of how talented a young artist we have here in the community. So thank you very much for that. And we will be sending a certificate to Ellie um, when we, as soon as we can. So, and if you're listening, Ellie, thank you so much for participating. Great job. Thank you. All thank right. you, Emmy. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on to the next item then which is the consent calendar. Um, we will now review the consent calendar. Madam Clerk, please read the consent calendar items three through 50. 
With pleasure, Mayor. And if, and if there's any member of the council who would like to pull any of the items from the consent calendar, let us know. And same thing with the public. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the council to be routine and will be enacted by one motion without discussion. If discussion is desired, that item may be removed and considered separately. Item number two, city council meeting minutes approval. Item number three, ordinance adoption, housing rehabilitation loan committee, municipal code chapter deletion. Item number four, ordinance adoption, transient occupancy tax municipal code amendment. Item number five, city council 2021 regular meeting calendar adoption. Item number six, personnel board appointment subcommittee recommendation. Item number seven, Microsoft software support agreement renewal. Item number eight, contracts with contingency component and update. Item number nine, sewer system management plan, five-year update and recertification. Item number 10, wastewater treatment plan upgrade and expansion project acquisition of easements. Item number 11, 303 Baldwin Avenue, final map and subdivision improvement agreement. Item number 12, 2021 annual investment policy approval. Item number 13, 2020 to 21 comprehensive fee schedule amendment. Item number 14, San Mateo County Gang Intelligence Unit Agreement. Item number 15, 1409 Beacon Avenue, property owner appeal of temporary relocation costs. That's the consent calendar. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there any member of the council who would like to pull an item from the consent calendar? I'm not seeing anyone. Okay, is there any member of the public who wish to comment on any item of the consent calendar? Now would be the time to raise your hand. And this is for consent calendar items only. I'm not seeing any hands. Do you see any on your end, Madam Clerk? No, sir, I do not. Okay, I will I'll move that we approve the consent calendar. Second. Okay, Madam Clerk, can you call roll please? Yes, Council Member Pappen. Yes. Council Member Gothels? Yes. Council Member Lee? Yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla? Yes. Mayor Rodriguez? Yes. Great, thank you. That passes unanimously. Um, I'd like to move on to public comment. Members of the public wishing to comment on any item not appearing on the agenda may address the city council at this time. State laws prevents council from taking any action on any matter not on the agenda. Your comments may be referred to staff for follow-up. Public comment is limited to a total of 15 minutes. However, an opportunity for additional public comment may be provided later in the agenda. Madam Clerk, do you see any members of the public wishing to say anything? I, I'm sorry, I have no hands raised on the attendees. Okay, I don't see any either. Great, so I'm gonna I'll close public comment and we're gonna move on to public hearing. Item number 16, continued from January 4th, 2021. Um, appeal hearing for 123 Waters Park Drive Residential Project, uh, Appeal of Planning Commission Decision PA 2020-043. And I'm gonna hand things over to Associate Planner, Wendy Lau. Thank All you. Yours, Wendy. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Rodriguez, members of the City Council and members of the public. My name is Wendy Lau, Associate Planner and Staff mm -hmm. Planner for Planning Application Modification PA 20043. The item for Hello, the time... Hello, I'm sorry. Um, the item for you tonight is for the appeal of planning commission decision approving a planning application modification number 20043 located at 123 Waters Park Drive. To provide some background, in February 2019, the City Council approved planning application number 2018013. The, the development project consisted of removing an office park to be replaced by 190 residential units. The units at that time consisted of 28 single family homes and 162 townhome units. In 2020, the applicant entered the building permit stage and requested changes to the site and design of the buildings. The changes included alterations to the building materials, color, windows, door, and height. The changes also included the removal of a townhome unit 
and addition of a detached residence on an enlarged lot due to the, the relocation of the trash enclosure. The city requires that any proposed changes to the project must substantially conform to the approved application. Changes that are not in substantial conformance require a planning application modification to be approved by the Planning Commission. As a result, the applicant submitted an application for the modifications, which the Planning Commission reviewed and approved on October 27, 2020. On November 6, 2020, an appeal from a neighbor, Ms. Loriana Seja Diaz, was filed. The appeal listed several reasons for the appeal. The appeal stated that the project has since has increased impacts to the community and the environment due to design changes, height changes, changes to garbage facilities, replacement of a townhome with a single family home, reduction of bike racks and related impacts on traffic, and increases to floor area ratio. The appeal letter also added comments expressing concern that the project should receive additional environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and due to changes from COVID-19. While this was not a reason for the appeal as stated, staff reviewed this inquiry nonetheless. Staff review has reviewed and analyzed the concerns raised in the appeal and respectfully disagrees with the points raised. Staff will discuss the concerns raised in the appeal and staff response in the next few slides. The appeal raises concerns with the design changes and increases to neighborhood impacts. However, many of the design changes were triggered by the need to meet the California Building Code requirements, which result in changes to the proposed window and door locations, materials, and awnings. The design changes are compatible with the existing project design and were determined to be consistent with the multifamily design guidelines and were approved by the Planning Commission. The appeal does not list specific concerns regarding how the appellant believes the design changes increase neighborhood impacts. Staff has not identified potential additional impacts which would result from the design changes. The appeal has also stated that the buildings have increased in height. However, the subject buildings would not be increased in height. In fact, the buildings would be decreased, reduced in height. For example, the five and six unit townhomes would be reduced in height from 31 feet, nine inches to 30 feet, seven inches. The nine unit townhomes would be reduced in height from 44 feet to 43 feet, five inches. And the 12 unit townhomes would be reduced in height from 44 feet, zero inches to 42 feet, three and a quarter inches. Both the entitled and proposed building heights are within the maximum height limit of 45 feet, which is allowed per the general plan. The appeal has also expressed concerns with the changes to the garbage facilities. However, the relocation of the trash enclosure away from the neighboring residences was approved in the original planning application in 2019. The plans associated with the current planning application show the relocate, relocated enclosure. However, since the relocation has already been approved, it is not a part of the current application. The appeal also expresses concerns about the replacement of a townhome unit with a single family dwelling. However, the trash enclosure relocation away from the neighbors was proposed in order to reduce potential neighbor impacts from garbage and encroaches into the space of one of the originally approved townhome units. The addition of a dwelling unit on lot 28 will replace the missing townhome while maintaining the originally approved 190 units. The appeal does not specify, does not express, uh, has not expressed uh, specific concerns regarding how they believe the unit swap would increase neighborhood impacts. Staff has not identified potential additional impacts that would result from the unit swap. The appeal also expresses concerns with the reduction of bike racks and related impacts on traffic. However, the project would not result in a reduction in number of bicycle racks. The original planning application approved 285 bicycle parking spaces, and the modification proposes 292 bicycle parking spaces. The appellant has also expressed concerns with the increase in floor ratio. The project would add an additional 1,259 square feet for a total of 435,725 square feet, which is a less than 1% increase or 0.2% increase. The additional square footage, which exceeds the maximum allowable square footage of 411,942 square feet is allowed as an incentive request in accordance with the state density bonus law. The project will still be providing 19 below market rate units as originally planned. The appellant has not expressed specific concerns regarding how they believe the added square footage would increase neighborhood impacts. 
staff has not identified potential additional impacts that would result from the added space. The appellant has stated that this project must be reviewed in light of COVID-19 and changes to the way people live and work in our community. Staff has reviewed and the presence of COVID-19 is not a change to the project. The presence of COVID-19 does not conflict with the request to allow the project, which consists primarily of exterior building modifications, a one-for-one -one unit swap, and a site plan change at Lot 28. The appeal also states that the city must conduct additional CEQA review because it is conducting an additional discretionary approval. Staff has reviewed the CEQA guidelines and noted that section 15162 of the CEQA guidelines requires additional review only in certain situations. For example, additional review is required mainly when there are substantial changes to the project or project circumstances, or when substantial new information about the project comes to light, and these changes or new information impact, impact the conclusion of the original CEQA document. Staff has reviewed the proposed modifications and concluded that there are no substantial changes to the project or project circumstances, which would result in any new significant environmental impacts. For example, the vehicle trip count would change slightly by five additional daily trips, resulting in a total of 1,150 daily trips. However, this is still less than the previous count of 1,305 daily trips for the former office use and is not a significant impact. The appeal also states that COVID-19 has created a substantial change and increase in the significant environmental effects created by the project compared to what was previously studied. Staff has reviewed and the specific project modifications do not constitute a substantial change to or increase in the environmental effects created by the project. The initial study mitigated negative declarations, analysis of the project's construction and operational impacts to surrounding residences were based on an understanding that they would be occupied during the daytime by some residents. The fact that more residents are staying home temporarily to work remotely or for in-home instruction does not fun fundamentally change the CEQA document's conclusions, given that the magnitude of the disclosed impacts were not based on the number of residents expected to be at nearby homes. Rather, it is the initial study mitigating negative declarations conclusions that based on the magnitude of the project's impacts, such as the sound produced or the emissions generated. The appeal has stated that construction and demolition has caused more severe significant impacts on the surrounding homes and was previously considered. Project proponents have refused to adopt mitigation measures that would reduce the significant impacts on the environment. The appeal does not specify which more severe significant impacts the appellant is concerned about. Required mitigation measures have been adopted and implemented for this project and is confirmed through city inspections. For example, the public work staff is currently inspecting the site daily and building inspection staff is inspecting the site at least two to three times per week. The appellant believes that the city must conduct a full environmental impact report or revise or, and recirculate the mitigated negative declaration and prepare a subsequent or an addendum to the mitigated negative declaration. Staff has reviewed and the proposed project, which again consists of exterior building changes, a unit swap and a site plan change at Lot 28, do not change the conclusions of the initial study mitigated negative declaration, which was certified by city council in 2019. Furthermore, the project changes do not result in significant environmental impacts. Therefore, the project modifications do not require additional CEQA review. Staff has received public comments from neighbors, some of which were submitted after the appeal was filed and are not part of the actual appeal, but are additional commentary. Many of the public comments are concerning noise, dust, dirt tracking, shaking, rodent control, and lack of communication with the applicants and the city. Staff has taken many actions as of date, including but not limited to inspections from the Bay Area Air Quality Management District to ensure compliance with mitigation measures related to air quality. Inspections also included from the San Mateo County Vector Control District. Um, they've also conducted site visits, including visiting neighborhood residences to verify compliance with the vector control plan and offer suggestions to neighbors. The city's building division also conducts inspections two to three times each week, and the city's public works department has begun inspecting the site on a daily basis to ensure compliance with stormwater management requirements. 
city staff has required the applicant to adjust uh, vehicle heights when picking up and dropping off haul loads, as well as required Pulte to switch to equipment rather than rubber tires instead of metal tires to decrease noise and vibration impacts. And in situations where it would not uh, increase vibration, city staff has required the applicant to use smaller equipment in an effort to reduce noise and vibration. City staff has also required additional site watering for dust control. A list of additional actions and measures are listed in the agenda report attachment eight. Staff would like to emphasize that the item before us tonight is for the appeal of the plan commission, uh, planning application modification, not the entire project. Staff has reviewed the appeal request. Staff recommends that the city council deny the appeal and uphold the plan commission decision approving PA 2020-043 for modifications to PA 2018-013 and relying upon the initial study, mitigated negative declaration, prepare for the project as originally proposed, as no increased impacts that would result from the proposed modifications have been identified and the need for further secret review has not been demonstrated. This concludes the staff's presentation. Um, staff is available for any questions that council may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very thorough presentation. Um, do we have any questions from council? I'm not seeing any. There's quite a few participants, so I ask that you raise your, your digital hand if you do want to speak, but I'm not seeing any, any hands. So, um, okay, the next part of this, um, I'm going to officially open the public hearing, and the next part of it is the applicant will have 15 minutes of total time for all speakers. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, it's the appellant who goes first. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say appellant. My apologies. Thank you for that, Madam Clerk. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Jonathan Cathrine, and I represent the appellant, um, and I'm with KDV Law. And thank you to the staff. They've been excellent to work with. Um, as we've exchanged emails, and uh, that was an excellent presentation, Wendy. Thank you. Re really, the um, I'm going to share my screen so I can talk about a few things that are going on here. Um, let's see if everybody can see me. We can see that. Thank you. So really, let's let's uh, reiterate this a little bit differently than it's been presented so far. Excuse me, the slides are not changing. Um, Look, it looks like you could be in editing mode instead of presentation mode. Let's see here. It is not wanting me to share the presentation. Um, let me see, excuse me. Now, maybe, maybe that this will work a little bit better. So um, really, this is sort of the theme tonight is about protecting the community. Um, what we're asking is that the city grant the appeal in the sense that the city conduct a full EIR. And, and let me tell you a little bit why. Um, the legal argument for this is unusual because it's we've never been in a COVID scenario before. We've never so drastically felt the shift of being in an office and being in school to working from home. And the purpose of 
the California Environmental Quality Act is to measure the impact on the environment around us. And the, the impact at the time that the, uh, in, the mitigated negative deck was made was in 2018 and it was pre-COVID. And so we, we couldn't possibly have studied the environment in the way that we could study it today. I'd like to talk also a little bit about, I'll, I'll come next to enforcing many, many violations of the existing COAs and then also about adding new COAs. But, but first let's talk a little bit about the legal background for this. So the city in approving a project when the city is conducting discretionary, discretionary review as it is tonight is getting sort of a second bite at the apple from the perspective of the city. If the environmental review was insufficient the first time when Pulte comes back and asks for additional discretionary review, the environmental review is being opened up again. Um, in this case, the environment is so different. And the legal threshold for conducting a full EIR is that it must be done for any project where there may be a significant effect on the environment. It doesn't have to be certain that there's a significant effect, but that there may be a significant effect. And the importance of that is that the bar is extremely low. So when there's a project that may have a fair argument that there's a significant effect, and there may be a fair argument otherwise, it's necessary to conduct a full EIR. Relying on a past study, in this case, the initial study and in, in MND, the mitigated negative declaration, the, the staff report as thorough as it is, is lacking in pointing out places, factual places where things have not changed. In other words, our, our contention is that the world has changed the environment has changed. The study needs to be not only redone, but it needs to be done more thoroughly. The staff report has not drawn those conceptual lines connecting, um, connecting significant evidence with the, uh, the, to support the statement that the environment has not changed. And an important part of all of this is that when the effects are on humans, there's a mandatory finding of significance that in this case has not been mitigate, mitigated to less than significant. So in other words, the fact that, that this impacts human lives brings us into a category where an EIR and definitely environmental review um, is necessary and required. More importantly than than focusing just on the legal arguments here tonight. This is a rare opportunity we feel for the city to see the impacts um, actually on the community and the sorts of things that the community every day is facing. Is uh, Ms. Keha Diaz available? Is she on as a presenter? I am, can you hear me? Yeah, would you mind talking us through a little bit about the day-to-day -day -day experience that you have in the community? Well, you know, it's it's tough. I think you know when you're dealing with with COVID, you're dealing with the person with personal issues. You've got kids at home um, doing you know distance learning. Um, you know, it's it's tough to begin with, um, but when you add to it. Um, you know, the constant, you know, bee being in your backyard, um, that view that you can see on this picture, both views uh, for that fact, um, you know, the, you know, my kids are not allowed at school. They're not allowed at the park. Um, but if you look at my virtual background, my background, my backyard was, was a good place for them to be. But when you compare that to what it has become in the last nine months, um, they're not allowed outside. The dust is intolerable. Um, if, if, if it's safe for them to be outside, I've got to go out and wash every, every bit of that dust and dirt 
daily. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're being held hostage in our own, own home because of, of this project. Um, you know, and then you add to it all the, the rodents. I mean, the size of these critters, and, and hey, I get it, they're everywhere, but when the vector control can, can take away on a week, you know, twice a month, uh, 10 to, to 15 of these critters, and this is just from the service that, that they provide on the property line, um, how many more of them are, are getting away? I mean, it, it's toxic outside at this point. Um, so, you know, we have the rodent infestation, we have gophers. I had to step away for several weeks out of the area, and I was pretty excited to come back to, have, to know that they weren't catching any rodents. I came back to an infestation of rats inside my house. I mean, it's bad here. Um, you know, and, and so when we bring this up, are we having issues beyond the, the, the visible, we are. I've got a six-year-old who screams up, screams crying every morning when she wakes up because the vibration is, is beyond anything that anyone can understand. Uh, Jonathan, I think I, I sent you a comparison of, of what we feel several times a day, multiple times, uh, you know, a, a week. Um, Saturday night, we had an earthquake, 4.2, the Aroma earthquake, and you all know it was at, at about 8 p.m. at night, and my kids are, you know, we're all home, and they say, hey, mom, is Pulte working at 8 p.m. on a Saturday? So kind of let that sink in for a minute, 4.2 earthquake, and that is the vibration that we feel all throughout the day with the development in the back. So, you know, is that something that can be controlled? Yes, I mean, we, they have soil reports. We know what we're sitting on. And so if, if we know that, then there's, you know, the, the builders must take action um, and make sure that, that that's mitigated. And I will say, you know, I've tried to work with Aaron. I've tried to work with Andy Cost, who, who was there before these, these guys. And listen, I mean, they're trying their hardest, but they also work for a, a multi-million dollar company who's here to make money. So, you know, there's only so much that they can do to help mitigate the problem. Um, you know, so back to the earthquake, the earthquake that, that we had, uh, registered on their monitoring system, but we did not get an alert. And all the neighbors are on an alert system. Well, it was explained to me that although you can see that huge bar on the, the report, it, it did, didn't exceed the tolerance set. And so if you can kind of put that into perspective, basically my takeaway from that is that the multiple times that my ground is shaking, I'm dealing with 4.2 plus, you guys, 4.2 plus earthquakes. So that very much puts us, you know, much more, you know, uh, on edge. And, and so you've got the emotional problems. I've got kids who can't concentrate at school. I've got the nausea with the kids. I've got the headaches with the kids. I've got a kid screaming and yelling because the wall's moving again. I mean, it, it's gotta get to the point where, you know, I, I'm coming to you guys for, for help. You, you know, Mayor Rodriguez, you know, I voted for you. Um, you know, you have the power to say, you know, we've got to reel this in a little bit and take control um, yeah. because we can't keep being submitted to this. If, if I may, just to, to wrap this up, we have a, a list and it's in the letter that, that we sent on Friday, but there's a list of uh, uh, COAs that in the very, very least we would like the city to impose. And, and we believe this would be just the absolute minimum that the city could do because we believe that a full environmental study is necessary. 
to go through the list, the, the first one is um, the noise is constant as you can hear described. Uh, the barrier is really too short. An eight foot barrier is not stopping the noise when you have heavy equipment that's towering over the barrier. Um, it's certainly that eight foot barrier is not stopping the dust. The hours of construction, seven days a week, including holidays, when, when kids are learning from home, when parents are working from home, that just, it needs to be reduced quite simply and it needs to be reduced significantly. You know, construction should stop before dinner time. It shouldn't be on holidays. Um, the heavy equipment, the COAs have a lot of detail about what heavy equipment is allowed from the pictures you can see us scrolling through, or I hope you can see. When there's an alternative uh, in all the pictures that we've received, the alternative, the low impact alternative is not being used. Um, this, this has to do largely with COA 82. Um, this needs to be enforced. The alternative, whether it's you know, mufflers, electric instead of gasoline, uh, there need to be some changes there. Pulte is ignoring the vectors. It, it seems that it's quite clear that a third party needs to be involved. Somebody who's um, actually responding to the rat and vector issues. This is a theme throughout the community. And then um, there's no doubt, and we haven't showed them here, but there's no doubt that there's damage being caused to homes. Um, not only the home of the, the um, appellant, but of the community. And Pulte needs to create some sort of fund. Um, we understand they've offered some money to, to some of the neighbors, but not all. But we also understand that it's been very difficult to collect that money. But Pulte needs to put some money aside in a fund to repair, whether it's people's decks and, and backyards, um, their driveways, their, their roof. Um, so this is just a short list. Uh, and uh, is there anything else you'd like to add, Loriana? Um, you know, I, I think that we will, if it's okay with Mayor Rodriguez, we can forward him um, the, you know, 80, 90 page presentation that ideally if we had more than 15 minutes, we would, you know, need to show him um, with the various pictures from you know, the onset of, of this debacle. Um, if he's okay with that, we can go ahead and forward that to him. Um, and then, you know, whatever he needs from us, I, I think that, you know, if, if there's more time needed to really go through what we're dealing with and, and the repetitiveness of, of the violations, then, then I also think that's fair. It's not about deciding, you know, quickly. That's but time, Mayor the violations are there. Thank you very much for that presentation. We're going to have to um, move on to the next part of, of this hearing. And um, we now have the applicant um, has 15 minutes total time for all speakers. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, I know we're all still getting used to this Zoom format, but... Uh, we can hear you. Thank you. I appreciate that. My name is Greg Powers with the law firm of Jackson Titus. I am land use counsel for Pulte Homes, and uh, I submitted a letter in opposition to the appeal to you on December 28th, 2020, which was before the last uh, council meeting on January 4th, but hopefully you've had an opportunity to to read that letter and our responses to the legal points raised, uh, at least at that stage, by the appellant, Ms. Diaz. Um, so I will start off by saying that it's, it's a little ironic that um, after reading the letter that Mr. Catherine submitted today, um, you know, accusing my client and me of being bullies and bullying people and bullying the city, uh, when the letter itself was filled with just really nasty personal attacks. Um, I'm not going to do that. This is an appellate proceeding. I'm going to stick to the facts and the law. Hopefully everyone can do the same from here on. Uh, the law says that CEQA does not permit reopening previously issued approvals, period. 
This hearing is only about the modified site plan approved by the Planning Commission, which city staff recommends you uphold. The appeal is not and cannot legally be about the project as a whole. I think Ms. Lau did an excellent job of summarizing that herself. Um, the relocation of the trash enclosure under the modified site plan was pursuant to the city council's request. Uh, it moved it further away from residences. Um, and that necessitated dropping an attached unit and replacing it with the detached unit so the lot count remained the same and the unit count remained the same with what was approved by the city council previously. I want to clarify that height limits were decreased, not increased as the appellant has incorrectly stated. The number of bike racks were actually increased, not decreased as the appellant has incorrectly stated. The mitigated negative declaration for the project and the mitigation measures were approved in February 2019 and challenge periods have expired all the way back in March of 2019, almost two years ago. No challenge was filed. And as stated by the court in Save Our Neighborhood versus Leishman, which was a case from 2006, quote, the event of a change in a project is not an occasion to revisit environmental concerns laid to rest in the original analysis, unquote. Unless project changes meet one of the criteria listed under Public Resources Code Section 21166, there is a statutory presumption against environment or subsequent or supplemental environmental review under CEQA. Staff has correctly determined that none of the factors under Section 21166 have been met because those factors include substantial changes in the project that require major revisions to the mitigated neg deck. The appellant has provided no evidence that any of the criteria under Public Resources Code Section 21166 have been met to substantiate a subsequent or supplemental MND. Reducing building heights, increasing bike, rats, bike racks, relocating trash enclosures pursuant to a city council request, and switching an attached unit for a detached unit does not result in significant new impacts or new mitigation. The appellant has provided no evidence, much less a fair argument based on substantial evidence, which is what is required under state law, to show that these changes warrant a supplemental or subsequent mitigated negative declaration, much less an environmental impact report. The appellant argues that COVID-19 pandemic warrants a new EIR. We're all in a tough time. I get this. Everyone gets this. It's a very challenging time. But as stated in my letter that I submitted to the city on December 28th, this is a quintessential example of what's called improper reverse CEQA. The point of CEQA is to analyze a project's impacts on the environment, not the environment's impacts on a project. This is well established, especially under the seminal case in 2015, uh, of Bay Area Air Quality Management District versus California Building Industry Association. Um, you have to think about this. If you follow the appellant's logic, then every residential, commercial, industrial construction project up and down the state of California that is in close proximity to a residential project that's happening right now should stop and new CEQA analysis should start. This would result in projects across the state being delayed, uh, prolonged. It would result in the loss of thousands and thousands of construction jobs. And it is illegal under CEQA. It is reverse CEQA. Um, None of the elements under section 21166 of the public resources code have been met. No evidence has been provided to show they've been met. I'd like to address some of the points raised in the letter submitted by Mr. Catherine earlier today, because I think it's worth noting a lot of these. And again, it's unfortunate they chose to make personal attacks. It's unproductive and unprofessional. Stick to the law. Let's start with the statement on page two. Quote, this should not surprise Mr. Powers, who has not responded to the appellant's continuous request for help. 
requests that Pulte make repairs to the substantial damage they have caused her property. Let's talk about what really happened. First, it's not true. The appellant has never reached out to me and asked for help, much less continuous help, as they state. What really happened was the appellant sent a letter saying, enter into a settlement agreement with my client, saying enter into a settlement agreement with my client for $175,000. Can you hear me? I see Councilman Bonilla saying he can't hear me. Um, yeah, we're having some interference. Um, I don't know where it's coming from. Is everyone getting the interference? Yeah, can everybody just make sure they're on mute? And I'm not sure if it's coming from your mic, Mr. Powers, but um, we are hearing a little bit of like wind noise of something. Oh. <laughs> it's quite possible because we're in a massive windstorm here. I'm, I'm in Southern California right now and it's okay. 60, 70 mile per, hour, uh, mile per hour gusts outside. So I apologize. Um, I'll get a little closer to the mic. So the appellant sent a letter, appellant's counsel sent a letter saying, enter into a settlement agreement for $175,000 and we won't appeal your planning commission approval. My response in writing was, we did a pre-construction survey of your client's property and we do that for a reason, to measure whatever damage is there. And if my client's project causes damage, we wanna know and we wanna help, we wanna fix it. So we do a pre-construction survey and then if there's damages, we go back in, compare the new damage to the pre-construction survey damage, and then compensate the appellant appropriately and accordingly and help in any way they can. So I responded and said, we would like to come back onto the property because your client consented in writing to a pre-construction survey. We have hundreds of photos and we'd like to go back on and take a look and compare the current damage to what was happening pre-construction and we will help in any way we can financially and any other way to get this fixed. We wanna be a good neighbor. Pellant's counsel told me, no, you can't come back on the property. You just have to enter into a $175,000 settlement agreement. And if you don't, we will appeal your project. And now here we are today. Obviously Pulte cannot write a check for $175,000 without at least being the, having the opportunity to go onto the property and looking at it and seeing if the alleged damages are true. Um, we need that opportunity. That was the whole point of the pre-construction surveys that Ms. Diaz consented to in writing. Um, we've still to this day been denied entry into the property to compare any con existing damage to what was existing before the project. Um, moving on to the next point. There's a lot of talk about compliance with conditions of approval, and I want to address those. Uh, the appellant talks about the sound barriers. I want to make note that the appellant would not let Pulte onto her property after she signed a consent to construct a sound barrier. So Pulte did the best they could to construct it on their side of the property line. Okay. The condition of approval says that Pulte must build a temporary sound barrier anytime they're doing work within 30 feet of the property line of a particular residence. Pulte went above and beyond that. What they did was they built a sound barrier wall, a temporary sound barrier wall along the entire Eastern border and along the entire Southern border of the project, okay? They could have just done a mobile, you know, a sound blanket that wheels along from house to house. They didn't do that. They built a wall, a temporary sound barrier wall along both those boundaries, the entire boundaries of the project. Then they build what's called the good neighbor fence, which was part of the conditions and the mitigation measures. And then the sound barriers come down and then Pulte then added an extra layer and is adding an extra layer of plywood on the backside on their side of the property line to the sound barrier walls to get above the three uh, uh, PSF requirement and the mitigation measures um, that's pounds per square foot, I believe, but it's to exceed what the mitigation measures require. They weren't allowed onto Ms. Diaz's property, um, but they did the best they could to build a temporary sound barrier on their side of the property. The good neighbor fences are going up and they're, and they're fortifying the fences with extra plywood to make them extra sound resistant. Vector control, 
Um, Pulte has had their consultant, and the name of that consultant is Animal Damage Management, go on to the appellant's, appellant's property with her consent and other properties and install additional trapping devices and repellents on the properties and they continue to work with property owners to try and help any way they can with this issue. Surveillance cameras. The appellant raises an issue that Pulte was supposed to put up surveillance cameras. Why haven't they done it? Well, this was a condition from the San Mateo Police Department and it's not for construction, it's for when the project is built. It's when the homes are existing and it's for per police surveillance of the streets for the residents of the neighborhood. It's not a, a condition for construction. So I think appellant's counsel misunderstands the condition. Another condition that I think is being misunderstood by appellant's counsel. They talk a lot in their, in their letter today about Pulte using scrapers instead of loaders and hauling trucks. Well, here's the thing. Pulte has used scrapers. They have to use scrapers. The unfortunate part is that scrapers are not capable of lifting construction debris and demolition debris and dirt into a truck so that it can be hauled away. A scraper knocks things down and, and grades the ground, and then you have to pick it up with something, and a scraper doesn't do that. A loader does that, and it puts it into a truck, and then a truck hauls it away. The condition requires that Pulte use scrapers to the extent feasible, and they've done that. And then they use haulers and loaders to remove the construction debris. And finally, construction hours. Uh, the appellant has suggested a revised condition that Pulte stop work at five o'clock every day and not be allowed to work on weekends. Um, they're doing that already. Um, under the city code, Pulte can work until 7 p.m. and they can work Saturdays and Sundays. Pulte stops work at five and they do not work Saturdays or Sundays or holidays. They would love to, I can assure you that, because it would get the project done quicker and everyone could move on. But they have made that accommodation because, you know, trying to be a good neighbor, again, they're not working weekends. So the condition that the Appellants Council has asked for is already being done voluntarily by Pulte. So with that, um, I, I thank you for your you know, for this opportunity, I'm available for questions and um, we respectfully request that you deny the appeal and uphold the Planning Commission's um, approval of the modification of the site plan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for the next part of the hearing, we're going to open it up to individual uh, speakers from the public who will have uh, three minutes each to speak. So if you would like to speak, please raise your hand and Madam Clerk is going to be calling on you. Yes, um, Vince, Vincent, I've allowed you. Can you please unmute yourself? Hello? We can hear you. Hello? We can hear you. Hi, it's Vincent Fobbs at 1383 Adrian Avenue. And I just wanted to bring attention to uh, what Loriana brought up. Is the earthquake that you guys, did you guys feel the earthquake? Mayor? Um, we, please continue, we'll answer questions at the end of this. Come well, in. that particular earthquake that I think you felt, uh, I know I felt it, my wife and I felt it, it was a 4.2 or 4.5. And the first thing I did was reach for my phone to see if I got a notification from the seismic monitors in my backyard didn't get a notification it didn't even meet the seismic specs that Pulte has put in place for our houses in october we were up to 200 was it 251 or 261 notifications from seismic shaking from Pulte's equipment in our backyards so i just kind of wanted to bring to everybody's attention is if you felt that earthquake at a 4.2, we have been living, and I estimate somewhere around 7.0 earthquakes constantly every day. And I'm really, really glad to hear tonight, and it's on the city council, 
that Pulte's attorney is saying that Pulte will take full responsibility for fixing our houses, these cracks in the walls, the cracks in the driveways and the patio and all the damages that are going on to our houses. And I'm glad to finally get this on the record. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then next speaker is Marty Jones, followed by Clayton Lau. And then Pat W. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. This is Marty Jones, and I'm a neighbor of the 190 Project. And a, a few things I'd just like to talk about, and, and a, a lot of it has to do with, with the exact environmental impact that this is having on us as people. I mean, there were some comments made earlier about, you know, if we, you know, if, if we sort of considered the environment in, in the way that the appellant's uh, attorney described, we'd have to look at projects up and down California. Well, maybe we should be looking at a lot of projects because the mental health, the mental stress, the physical impact, the, the financial impact, the, the structural impact of these projects or of this project is, is intense, right? Um, you know, we, we, we talked with her, I made some comments at the Pl planning commission meeting back in October of 2020. If you count it, it I'm, I'm losing track of the number of alerts that, that we received, but it's, it, it has to be a, at least 200, maybe 250 since the alert system got established. And one of my main concerns, you know, a little bit of what Vincent said was, you know, the, the damage that's being done to the property, it's, it's undoubtable that there's, there's no doubt there's damage being done based on the construction. The construction uh, survey was done after construction had started. So I just want to make that point that the, the, the the construction survey, the photos were not done before demolition began. And so there's question marks, or there could be question marks as to what caused the damage to the property. And I certainly would want some additional conditions so that a third party who's not, where there's no conflict of interest, um, it's not Pulte, it's not the appellant's uh, uh, attorney, but there's some third party that the city council can can leverage to take a look at the analysis of the survey and the damage that's being done and not do this after the property or after the construction is complete. Two years time frame, as Pulte has commented, um, I certainly would expect quarterly, uh, you know, certainly month, um, I'm sorry, certainly uh, twice a year uh, reviews to be done or at least some sort of inspections to be done to, to determine when and, and what has been the damage being done um, and, and have some proper uh, uh, analysis done by a third party so that there's no conflict um, because certainly there's a lot of interest by Pulte in, in pointing to other factors that could have led to the damage or even existing conditions that have been just really exacerbated by the, by the damage. So just as a, as a very concerned neighbor uh, please uh, grant the appeal and uh, certainly consider the comments by the planning commission about Pulte's uh, actions in our community. Thank you. It's on record saying they'll take full responsibility. Excuse me. Um, if you are, do it, please mute yourself. So the next speaker we have is Pat WH. Yes, um, I was going to comment about item 21. Shall I wait for that to arrive in the meeting or? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. I will do so. Thank you. Okay, then, um, forgive me here. Um, then Clayton Lau. Uh, hello. Hello, council members. Thank you for your time and your service to this community. My name is Clayton, and I'm a resident of Millbrae and a junior at Mills High School. Recently, I have joined an environmental club. In addition, I have eaten a lot of takeout food. Now, these two things might seem like two very strange things to relate to each other, but being part of an, an, environment, sorry, an environmental or club has helped me to realize the ever-creeping threat of climate change. Excuse, Every time I, 
Excuse me, um, we're talking about the appeal. Oh, right now. so sorry. Okay, thank you. So, um, the if you have your hands raised right now, you should be for uh, commenting on the appeal. So, the I see Julie, you. Yes, hi. So I want to speak because I live perpendicular to Elliott or to Adrian on Elliott Street. So my backyard is not all the construction, but I'm perpendicular to that. And it has been absolutely just havoc since the construction has started. I'm happy to hear that things are put in place to mitigate dust, to mitigate for vector control. Well, all that's managed to happen coincidentally is that now the rodents that used to be in the vegetation there, aside from being there, are now in the ivy that runs along Adrian. So with the onset of the construction, we have also had huge rodent pro problems since the start of the construction. Neighbors on my both side, and again, I'm not on Adrian, but I'm on Elliot perpendicular to that. The dust is horrible. I have to dust every day. I have young kids. We have to wash our car every day and the trucks that go by spraying water. After we wash the car, they just get our cars dirty. So I'm not seeing any relief in terms of that. And I feel the shaking and my street is perp perpendicular to that again. And so I can't imagine the people that actually live on that street. I'm happy to hear the offer for them to come and check out decks. Ours has shifted. Um, and really, like, the vector situation is horrible. So I'm happy to give whomever my address and please come help. Thank you. You're going to do talking for me? Mm -hmm. OK. What are you going to say? I'll let you talk. You're the attorney. Mm -hmm. Are you going to call the next speaker, Madam Clerk? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to see where that was coming from. Um, Angela is the next speaker, please. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Angela Beck Elioto. My husband, Peter Elioto, and I live on Hosmer Street, which is about four blocks over, same neighborhood. It is a great neighborhood. And after I saw what's happening, to our neighbors on Adrian, very concerned. Uh, my mother-in-law lives on Claudia. She's been there all her life. And last summer when my husband was planting a garden, we noticed a lot of rats. And it seems to be continuing. Um, our dog walker actually found a dead rat laying on the sidewalk on Claudia. And she asked me about it. And I said, I don't know, it's kind of strange. And then uh, once we heard about our neighbors, what they're going through on Adrian, I thought, okay, this all makes sense. And it's uh, just seeing the, the photos. It's like, oh my God, who can live with this every day? There's gotta be, I mean, can't you put up a higher barrier? Can't you do something about the dust and the noise? It's like, who can live with this? Uh, and on Norfolk, Norfolk's a mess. It's a mud slick every day. And it's like, how, what on earth is required to clean that mess up every day? Um, you want me to say something? Yeah. Well, uh, hi, uh, my name is Pete Aliotto. Um, but I, I've lived in this neighborhood for 57 years. I played in the field when there was no uh, buildings, but, but it was an empty field and it is was a junkyard. So I know, this, and I've just retired from construction for 40 years. So I have the, I'm going to deal with, first of all, the dirt on Norfolk. The, the cleaning, the uh, street sweeper isn't going to do the job. What is probably, I mean, unless you, okay, obviously we're not going to be able to put uh, camp park here signs for the street sweeper to uh, go into the uh, gutter areas. But what could potentially be an idea is have a water truck from the contractor and have it low flow so it dribbles out enough where it's not spraying cars, but it could wash that black 
gray material that has uh, all over the place of sticks. And I don't know what environmental studies we did for the soil, but uh, um, I would be concerned for kids and stuff. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, is that rats, I have my mother's, um, I, I grow a, a tomato, tomatoes for my grand, for my mother because when my father died and just kind of keep remembering. So this summer I seen the rats and I put netting around the tomatoes and I was getting three to four rats every other day, which never occurred in all the other years. Now, so I, it is definitely, um, first of all, I think it's a health hazard, obviously. Uh, children can get bitten. Um, um, Mr. Aliota, your time is up. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is uh, Christina Cabrera. Good evening, council members. My name is Christina and I am a resident of Elliott Street. I would like to address two things that were brought up. One is I am a mental health therapist that works at the local high school. And I would like to speak to the challenges that our students and the families, um, their families are dealing with right now with the pandemic. We cannot ignore that these are very unusual times for all of us where students are tasked with completing their studies at home, where there are already lots of distraction, um, distractions with families and students sharing spaces. But given the additional issues that our community has had to deal with, um, major construction, the black flow of traffic on Norfolk due to the you know, semi-trucks that are trying to get in, the vibrations that are felt, all of those things are further impacting, um, you know, the, the kids that live in this community. And it's um, adding to the issues of them already trying to learn in, um, in, in these times that are very unusual. I also, my heart goes out to the families of Adrian Avenue whose backyards um, go into the construction site because I cannot imagine that if their children can't even go outside to do PE or to run or to just be out in the sun, that that does not help their mental health. And I'm sorry, you know, if some people don't agree, but mental health is a, a huge issue. And right now this community is suffering. The other thing is that um, we've also noticed an increase in rodents in our neighborhood. Um, my parents put out traps and they got in four days, four different rats and that's something that needs to be considered because while Vector is considering the families directly connected to Adrian, um, we are, rats do not stay in one location. They go wherever they find a food source. And so we really want you guys to take into consideration that this is a pandemic. Families are working from home. Children are trying to work from home and we cannot ignore that these are unusual times that might require unusual measures by the city council, like perhaps putting a pause or um, restricting some of the construction that's happening. So please take into consideration what we, the neighbors, we, the citizens of San Mateo um, are dealing with at this time. Thank you for your time and consideration. The next speaker is Sue. Hi, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Um, Thank you for the council for your time. My name is Sue Lombardi uh, and my husband is Scott Lombardi. We, li we live at 2304 Elliott Street. We are on the fence line of the Pulte construction. I have actually been in this neighborhood for 56 years, grew up on Claudia. I wanna reach out to the neighbors that are not on the fence line that have concerns for us. Thank you very much. Um, this is not only about the rat problem, it is about the everyday issues that we go through living on the fence line with the shaking of the homes, the noise, the damages to our homes. Um, we have a broken window, we have uh, cracks, we have rats, we have continuously shaking of the homes. Um, so we're happy to know that Pulte attorney is going to fix those for us. 
I just, and this is Scott Lombardi. Thank you for your time. I just want to uh, point it, out we all have cracks. It, in our it, excuse me. I, I think that um, we're going to let the, the original speaker finish. And then um, if you'd, I, I'm not quite sure who was talking there, but. Um, My husband, we're in the same home. This is Scott Lombardi, uh, same house, 2304 Elliott Street. Um, I just want to reiterate what was mentioned earlier. Think about it. 4.2 earthquake didn't even register the meters. 260 of those. We all have cracks in our homes. Nobody did any markings, length, width, or anything. And I don't want this builder to come back and say, we're not fixing your property. I have shattered stucco. I have a broken window my driveway the cracks are huge the cracks are huge through my backyard i just want to make sure and i had councilman here rick Benillo, rick you were Benillo here i was here and he said you got damage to yep. your house remember i want to make sure that pulte doesn't back out and say you had cracks before nobody put tape nobody measured anything this house rocks and rolls every day and rick said you work for the people you work for us so make sure and i appreciate pulte coming to the table and say they will be responsible please make sure they fix the damage to all of our homes we've been here over 20 years and me 50. and it, when i walk outside and i and inside my house and look at the cracks it makes me sick to my stomach because i feel at the end of this game pulte's gonna go ah not responsible you had cracks in your house existing if any of you lived in this environment it'd be a different story it'd be a huge different story thank you thank you for your time uh next speaker is isaac chavez asia uh can you guys hear me yes good evening mayor uh, rodriguez i'm a fellow and fellow uh, council members i'm a sophomore at sarah high school and have lived in san mateo for most of my life when construction work began, I was happy and as I would be able to see the progress firsthand. I liked the construction work and was considering architecture as a college major. So I do watch the work um, being done often, but it has pretty much sucked. Sorry to say, say it like that, but it's pretty accurate. Maybe it's just a company out there, but I have seen from the beginning how irresponsible and careless they are with everything they do. They do not take pride in their work and overhearing conversations led me to worry if their style is ethical. A lot of people tonight have shared examples of how bad deeds um, the builders have done. I want to discuss a bigger issue, the one that is an ongoing theme at my school. Our society requires us to be socially responsible. Um, to do business in San Mateo, you should be required of the same, nothing less. The petition letter circulating reminds me that Pulte Homes must be held re uh, socially responsible. So if there were no, if there were not rules in place, Pulte Homes is by any measure required to be socially responsible on their own merit. But that is too much to ask. It states the following: Corporations have social responsibilities. There is a moral uh, requirement that business goals go beyond the bottom line to include, in this case, um, the constituents and communities we share of City of San Mateo. Successfully and powerful corporations must be actively involved in absolute resolutions to issues and problems that they cause. Um, the development of this housing project could be seen as necessary and full, uh, fully justified, but that does not change the fact that problems are produced and with them comes responsibility to participate in elevating and negative effects immediately. It is required, it is a requirement of morality. It is required of extendentals and it is the best interest of any corporation who wishes to continue to be successfully successful in our community to treat the city's constituents with respect as people and that extends to um, real property 
thank you for uh, listening to me today. Thank you. And our last speaker is SFZ. Hi, yes, my name is Sheila and I live at 1335 Adrian Avenue and I am on the fence line. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things. My son actually wanted to come onto the call, um, but the sound barrier was done after we actually um, brought attention. They were shut down is actually when the sound barrier was put up. And I want to say that Aaron and Max are doing the best. And like Loriana had stated, they're working for a multi-billion dollar company, million dollar company that they have to appease as well. Um, and my son is going to come over. Eddie, come here. Okay. Um, one moment. I'm going to pause and then have Eddie come on. Just say your name and then how old you are. Put your, put it. Okay, say um, your name. My name is Eddie and I'm having a really hard time except during school. I'm getting really bad headaches from the construction behind me is a lot shaking and there's a lot of noise coming out. It's like making me a lot stressed out and I just really want to stop. <laughs> okay. All right, say thank you. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. And he's 11, by the way. Thank you so much. That's all. Oh, no, uh, next speaker is Renee Theory. Hello, I am a resident on David Court at the corner of Adrian, and I attended the October 27th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting where I expressed all of the issues that we are having in the neighborhood with the faulty construction, and the Planning Commission was in complete and utter discontent at how Pulte has interacted with us neighbors and the community and city staff. But the planning commission at the time said they did not have the authority to make recommendations or modify the permit. So, but in this case, now we're having to appeal to you all city council members where you have the ability to help us. Where do we go at this point? If everyone keeps saying no one's going, no one can help us. We are enduring a serious amount of stress and damage to our homes on a daily basis. And this project is gonna go on for another two years. How, how can we do this? We're, we're getting no help from our city elected officials. City employees will lead you to believe that Pulte is meeting all of its permits and doing the right thing, but that is not the case. We have had to bring up issues to the city ourselves. So then the city then responds. So it, I don't believe it when they say they have someone on site at all times, when half the time we're the ones bringing up the issues to them and then they mitigate it. So how is that even you know, truthful? At this time, we are in serious jeopardy of the, our home and the value of our home. We have cracks all in our ceilings and in our walls and our stuccos and our driveway and our patios in the outside. We have no um, serious um, commitment from Pulte that any of these damages are going to be repaired or taken care of. They're holding it until the very end of the project, two years from now, really seriously. They won't include us on any riders, on their insurances. We have no assurances that any of this is going to be repaired or um, mitigated in any way at all. We, we sit here, we work from home every day. I have two children who are in school, at home every day, who are nauseous at all times and in complaint. How would you like to work every day and hear the backup beeper in your background for hours and hours on end? Beep, 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 beep. That's what it sounds like. My chandelier at my table is constantly rocking. And if I could give you an idea of how it feels, it's like I'm on a cruise ship, constantly swaying and swaying as I'm sitting down at my computer trying to concentrate of course, when you get up and you walk and you move, you don't necessarily feel it, but sit down, lay down, wake up in the morning. You are swaying because you feel the movement of the earth. You feel the constant earthquakes and the vibrations 
we cannot live with this. And like another resolution, if you all live, this would not be happening. Your response would be completely different. Thank you, Ms. Theory. I'm Your sorry that I'm up. emotional, but... Thank you. Next speaker is David. Good evening, council members. My name is David Checky, and I'm a resident at 2323 Holland Street in San Mateo. Um, back in May of 2018, the Daily Journal quoted me as saying that nothing good would come out of this project. And sure enough, nothing has. Our lives have been turned upside down. It's unbelievable. The stress, the anxiety, never mind the damage to our homes, but the stress of anxiety is crazy, crazy, crazy. Okay? There's been very little oversight by the city of San Mateo. Anytime we get any action from the city of San Mateo is when we call and complain and email that Pulte Construction is not doing the right thing. They're not living up to our expectations that were spelt out to the city council on the conditions of the permits. Dust mitigation was done after we complained. Street sweepers were put out after we complained. Cameras were never put into place to hold Pulte in to hold them accountable for what their actions for, for their actions. Sound walls were not put up. Dust mitigation was not proper until we screamed and yelled. Why there was no oversight by the city, I don't know. Okay? So I respectfully ask that you deny the permits or impose significant res restrictions on this construction project until common ground could be met to make our lives more tolerable. Thanks. Thank you. The last speaker I have right now is Michael Weinauer. Michael. Good evening, Council, and uh, and uh, sorry, Mayor Rodriguez, and members of the Council. Um, I'm just speaking up, sort of ad hoc, as a board member for the Central Neighborhood Association, and a, and a neighborhood that is that is heavily impacted by daily construction, and you can't help but hear the real suffering that's occurring. Uh, at the hands of Pulte it, to these residents and feel like there's some wrong happening. And I'm immediately skeptical of high paid, large corporate lawyers who are trying to, you know, kind of work on technicalities to get around real issues that these, that these residents are suffering from. And while I agree, you can't go back and maybe uh, redo CEQA and all the things that, that they may be suggesting, the conditions of approval, the CTAs, can indeed be enforced. And if they can't be enforced, then you know people like me in, in neighborhoods like Central, where we have multi-story buildings going up on a daily basis, and Sunny Bray and North Central, um, what can we expect? So, Councilwoman Lee, you frequently talk about how North Central is targeted and has all these impacts from development. So, surely you can relate to this, Mr. Bonilla. You campaigned on working hard for the neighborhood. So. Here's a neighborhood that's suffering. Let's step up for them. Um, I would just contrast the behavior of Pulte and what I've seen here with distinctly with what I've seen from Windy Hill, who has done numerous projects downtown and near Central. Uh, and they've been amazing. They've used quiet equipment. They've respected the time periods and they've listened to neighborhood feedback and, and, and gone back and invested in the neighborhoods. They've been tremendous. So I, I contrast that starkly from what I see from Pulte. And I think this is a, a time when you, you're sort of the last bastion here. And we hope that you really step up and, and make a firm statement and repudiate the behaviors of Pulte. Thank you. Patrice, I think you have a very patient uh, first grader waiting to show her art. Oh, okay, Mr. Mayor, we have no more speakers on this, so uh, do we... maybe we need a little break so we yes. can some art before we uh, continue with this. So, 
So I see the hand raised and to the panelists, can they unmute and um, enable their camera? Wow, I see it. That is great. Animals are poorly cured by cutting down all the trees. This is all the dirt. This is the guy on his knee hanging. These are all the houses that are sad because the dirt is on them. And these, these are the people that have been working and they have dementia because they do <clears throat> crazy things and they forget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your art with us. Is, is that the end of uh, public comment, Madam Mayor? I mean, excuse me, <laughs> Madam Clerk. <laughs> Promotion. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> All right. So we're going to move on to the next part of this public hearing, which is applicant rebuttal, which will be five minutes for all speakers. So the first one to go is the applicant. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of council, hopefully you can hear me and there's no interference. Um, first of all, that was the cutest thing ever. I have uh, four kids between ninth grade and fourth grade and it makes me miss the second grade days very much. Um, I just, you know, I'm not gonna go through everything all over again, but I do wanna say that this appeal is limited to what the planning commission approved and that's all it's not an appeal of the project approvals they were issued a long time ago this is an approved project um it, it what was approved what's being appealed now is a modification to the site plan to move a trash enclosure uh, per the city council's request uh, and to drop a an attached unit and replace it for a detached unit based on that relocation and some architectural changes to comply with the building code. Um, I'm available for any questions you might have. We appreciate your time. Pulte wants to be a good neighbor. It wants to work with its neighbors. Um, we understand these are difficult times, but um, we respectfully request that you deny the appeal and uphold the planning commission approval. And I will be available for any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we will move on to the um, appellant rebuttal. Five minutes for all speakers. Thank you. Um, can you see my share screen? Yes, we can. Okay, before I address that, uh, let me just say that this is your community asking you for help. Set aside all the legal arguments. What tonight comes down to is that the folks in your community are being covered in dust, their houses are being shaken and their home and their kids are home and they're crying out for help. As far as what you're able to decide tonight, it's discretionary review. You can approve, deny, or you can approve with conditions. But we're not just focused on the project itself and what's happening and whether trash enclosures are moving or not. What we're saying is that the study that was done for this project is no longer adequate. And what I'm showing on the side of the screen is the code section that was cited by Pulte's attorney. And there's, an, there's three exceptions. There's an A, a B, and a C. He is saying A doesn't apply, B and C do apply. There's two reasons why this project needs to be studied again 
and there need there needs to be more environmental review. These are pictures of the community. It, if you can see the heavy equipment towering over the pile of dirt that is towering over the sound wall, Pulte's best argument is that they have, in some cases, done the minimum. Yeah, there's some plywood there, clearly not doing anything. And it's it's whether it's two layers of plywood or one layer is beside the point. The COAs, my letter to you is 11 pages and it could be much longer, but the COAs, COA 82 um, specifically says that the, um, excuse me, that the backup beepers are supposed to be turned off on the equipment. Another COA, the one that's argued by the Pulte attorney, is that the video doesn't need to be in place for the life of the project. The fact is that the COA 38, it says in the first sentence, the project shall install and operate for the life of the project, a video surveillance system. It doesn't say after the project is complete. They're not meeting the requirements. These are just some pictures of damage. I mean, cracked ceilings, and, and I, I agree with most of the speakers that after the point, after this is all done, Pulte is not going to say that they caused these cracks in people's homes. So in addition to the need for more environmental review, the second thing is setting aside any decision tonight. The COAs that exist today need to be enforced. And the third thing is, is as I've outlined in my letter, and I'll show you on the screen here, there are, there is definitely a need for, some new measures imposed on this project. Noise, hours of operation, you can see them on the screen. I'll submit this uh, to Madam Clerk after this hearing. Um, there needs to be some sort of damage fund because nobody believes that folks are gonna be paid for the damage to their property after the fact. Um, our client has had significant damage to her to to her home. I mean, I can scroll through through these photos, but the damage of light fixtures being broken, falling from the ceiling. The point tonight isn't that we get into a long legal debate. The point is that people's lives are being damaged. They are stuck at home. They don't know what to do. They can't even rent out their homes. Who would move into a home where you have a piece of heavy equipment towering over the backyard wall? I mean, these are these are COAs specifically say that there's not supposed to be heavy equipment within certain distances from the home. So I think these these pictures say much more than the legal arguments. We're prepared to make all the legal arguments. Um, it would be a fascinating legal case because it's the only time we've ever experienced COVID in our lifetime, and we're convinced that. CEQA does require when the environment shifts as it has done during COVID that CEQA does require um, additional environmental review because the old review just simply doesn't apply. And kids are trying to get their homework done while buildings are being torn down over the back of their fence. So, so thank you for your time. Um, and I look forward to uh, finding some solutions to all of this. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing and council may ask additional questions and then we're gonna deliberate. Um, does, are there any council from question, or are there any questions from council? I see uh, council member Pappin's hand up. Just really quickly for Pulte, how, how far into the heavy equipment are you and how much more time is left on it? That's with all the grading and whatnot. Hi, uh, Council Member Pappin. I'll, I'll defer to uh, Aaron Head of Pulte. I can tell you that the majority of the undergrounding work has been completed. The project is already half paved, I mean, all the streets, half the streets have been paved. Uh, if Aaron Head is on here, which I believe he is, he can probably provide a little more detail on where we stand on that. Sure, Greg. Thanks. You're right. Um, Ms. Pappin, is there any further questions? We, we basically, um, <clears throat> 
as Greg mentioned, everything is, is uh, pretty much undergrounded um, and we're gonna work on providing subgrade uh, to the Western portion of the site, which has been uh, you know, provided to the neighbors as well, as far as one of our updates, so. So how much longer are you looking at? For horizontal construction or vertical? Horizontal with the heavy equipment that we're hearing a lot about tonight. Um, it really depends on the weather, to be honest with you. It's, uh, it's hard to say, but if everything, you know, goes as planned, you're probably looking at six months, um, if not less. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Uh, Council member Gothos. Uh, so my question has to do with triggering uh, a, a new EIR. Um, is there any is there any court in California that has suggested that COVID is a change circumstance that would that would force a new CEQA analysis? Um, and if not, what's the closest analogy to something else that's happened that? Uh, there would be a legal basis for us to uh, go with the appeal in this case. Uh, Council member Gothels, thank you. So I'll obviously defer to your city attorney to respond to you, but I would submit as I did in my letter, um, CEQA is very clear that it's meant to analyze the effects of the environmental impacts of a project on the environment, not the reverse. The reverse is called reverse CEQA and there's a very big case that came out in 2015, Bay Area Air Quality Management District against the BIA. Uh, so recent case, as far as case law goes, five years ago, um, almost six years ago now. But what it says is you don't analyze the effects of the environment on a project. You take a project, you look at the baseline of what the existing conditions are when the notice of preparation comes out, and then you analyze the impacts of that project on the environment, meaning air quality impacts of the project, um, you know, traffic impacts of the project on the environment. There's no case law on analyzing the environment or at least supporting case law, analyzing the environment on a project because the courts have already found that that's impermissible reverse CEQA. Um, so, I'll submit that for the record. If I may, the um, the baseline is based on today, not so you're you're essentially reapplying the studies that were done in 2018 to today, and the difference is today the baseline is different. So you're saying today the analysis is the, the exact same if you if you deny this appeal is the exact same as it was in 2018. And there's no denying that that's not the case. And I would disagree with that council member. The baseline is the same. The baseline is existing conditions on the ground with respect to the project. You take the, what was there before and you analyze it against what the proposed project is and what the impacts of that project are on the environment, meaning noise impacts, traffic impacts, all of that analyzing what's going on in the environment on the project, again, the courts have clearly found violates CEQA and that the criteria under 2166 have to be met in order to require additional CEQA. Otherwise, additional CEQA is prohibited and none of those criteria have been met here. Certainly no evidence has been introduced into the record, substantial evidence to support that. And the burden is on the project proponent may I add, and I just showed that 2166 has three criteria. We've met two of the three. Anyway, thank you. Sean, do you have any um, any thoughts on that exchange? Sure, um, first with respect to um, council member Gilfel's question, I'm not aware of a case that has addressed the question of uh, COVID and how it relates to in the review, the environmental uh, analysis for an existing project. I think for me, the most important um, thing to focus on is what is what what is this application about? It, it's not about the construction of a project from, from scratch, demolition of the buildings and the construction of the project. It's very minor changes to the site plan. 
And so the question is, what are the environmental consequences of those minor changes to the site plan? And, and you know, as staff uh, explained in their, in their report, uh, there really isn't much. Um, most of what we hear about are the environmental consequences of the implementation of the project and, and not the environment. We hear nothing with respect to what are the environmental consequences of moving the trash uh, enclosure to the other side of the project, which was done to address the concern of the neighbors about noise um, for the enclosure being next to their, their property. Um, the, the very minor changes to uh, the buildings themselves, and then the relocation of the one uh, townhome to accommodate the, the, the boo trash closure. There's no discussion whatsoever about what those impacts are and how those impacts have been made worse by COVID. And, and so I think it's just speculation uh, statement, but really no evidence about what the environmental consequences are of what they're asking approval of. Do you have more questions, Councilmember Goldis? Okay, I think I saw Councilmember Lee's hand physically go up. I thought I saw it. Thank you. So, um, so I had a, just I, a, a couple of questions about um, about the vector control process, um, and if we could get a little bit more detail in terms of the steps that have been taken um, and in the oversight in place. Yeah, thank you, Council Member Lee. I'll defer to Aaron Head from Pulte. He's in a better position than I am to respond to that. Sure, Council Member Lee, can you more specifically answer your um... The question, is it during demolition or is it a, a different phase of construction or what's been uh, transpired with the adjacent neighbors? I think what's been transpired with the adjacent neighbors um, and I, it's, it would be helpful to hear to better to understand, you know, um, and have, you know, on the record what what the, you know, sort of like what the full storyline is here and what steps have been taken and what um, what's planned going forward so that we have everybody on the call and, and our council has a clear understanding of where we are today. Sure, Councilman. Um, so, you know, going back a ways, um, back to the demolition phases, there's been, there was some concern um, with our parameter, obviously we, we had vector control in place and um, there was additional concern. Um, during a neighborhood meeting, we spoke to um, all the neighbors that were attendants in the meeting and offered additional vector control with their likings of, you know, what their preferences, preferences were for, you know, either trapping or poisoning or whatever they were uh, for their project for their properties since you know our you know edge condition would be ever changing um, so some of the of the neighbors definitely took took that option um, and that's that's kind of what's been happening so far um, I would add that there's been a uh, a Caltrans project on 101 that's been a, probably affecting some of the folks that we heard from um, on Elliott Street that we didn't hear from, you know, previously in these neighborhood meetings um, that potentially could be impacted by that work. But, um, you know, we continue to, uh, you know, have the vector control in place based upon what the residents are, are requesting from our contractor. So I'll, I'll just like to chime in, uh, Council Member Lee. Um, when the demolition actually began in June Excuse of 2020, me, um, I, I, there was no vector control provided. The, the vector control was not provided until code enforcement uh, ordered a stop work order on the project. Vector control was in place per the conditions of approval prior to demolition and was verified by the city of San Mateo on our property. This is vector control that we are offering to the neighbors on their property. The condition calls for yeah. vector control in the adjacent yeah. neighborhood. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, 
I want to make sure that we're we're holding an orderly meeting here, and so the. I apologize. No, no, no worries. Thank you. Okay, um, and and so I mean, I I just think it's helpful for for all of us, you know, in this meeting to understand if there are new neighbors who haven't come into this, um, or haven't opted in to vector control on their own property, um, are you the point of contact to? To in, to get that set up, I am the point of contact, and we will determine that when the time comes. But I will, I would like to again mention that there has been ongoing construction along 101 that would potentially impact Elliott Street, which we've demonstrated and, and communicated several times. Okay. But um, for the sorry, go ahead. No, finish your thought, please. I'd say for the record that we have not been asked for additional vector control and denied any request to this point. Okay. Um, and then my other question is about um, is about the pre-construction surveys and um, and what the what the process is for determining um, uh, payment for damages. Of course. So there is a. Again, we had a neighborhood meeting, a couple of neighborhood meetings. There was very detailed, um, specific items that were brought up in that meeting. We provided a specific work plan to that, um, to the pre-construction survey. And, you know, it's up to the residents, the neighboring residents on when they'd like to come back. We have our own opinions um, on when the time is right for that, but we'd obviously want the time to be right and feel that the residents of the neighboring properties would feel comfortable at that time um, to do that pre -con or that post-construction survey. So we have the pre-construction survey that was been done. We did have some latecomers that came into play. Um, we obviously um, welcomed those and we, we took those on as even though if they were late. Um, so, you know, there was a little bit of mention of, you know, it was post-construction Frankly, it was folks that were not adjacent to the property line that um, some of the other neighbors pulled into the of, of the uh, conversations, um, which again, we obviously want to do the right thing and want to give everyone the same opportunity. So we, we did that even though it was post-construction. And so um, based on what, what we've heard, you're saying that um, you do a site analysis and take evidence, uh, you know, whatever point that they, um, the neighbors opt in and then, um, and then the, the post-construction sort of uh, site visit, then you decide um, internally, is that, is that how it works? Or is there, mm -hmm. is there a third party that involved in making these determinations in terms of the scope of um, responsibility and, um, and any compensation? Sure, so we, have, we do have a, a, a third party um, consultant, engineering consultant on board. Um, it's their opinion that once the site is paved, which we previously mentioned that half of the site is paved at this point, um, those post-construction surveys have, would, that's the time would, that they would be completed. However, um, based upon, you know, some of the, the feedback that we have from the neighborhood, I think from Pulte's perspective, you know, we would like to say, you know, whenever you're comfortable saying that we're done with that piece of the pie, We'll, we'll do your survey. Survey. We're not in any position, you know, in my opinion, to say this. You know, okay, we're done paying. This is what our consultant says, right? We want to obviously open it up to conversation, be collaborative about it, um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page, so that this doesn't linger any further. Uh, thank you. Those are my questions. Okay, but before we go to Councilmember Pappen, I just wanted to give um, Ms. Diaz a chance to respond. If I may, you, you know, the challenge here is that there's no clarity on, you, you know, we haven't seen any reporting. We haven't seen anything in, that's pu publicly accessible on what the criteria are to be included. So what, what we're hearing from neighbors um, 
and Ms. Keha Diaz can elaborate on this, is that folks are going to Pulte and asking for vector control and they're not getting it, but they're being told that they were, they're not getting it because they failed to follow some procedure or that it's not necessary. So in other words, they're getting denied. What would be helpful to the council is to see how many folks ask, specifically who and why they're being denied. But to, to, to move forward on additional COAs, some clarity on who qualifies and not having the third party hired by the, um, the, the builder, not hired by Pulte, but paid for by Pulte through the city. We need it. We need a third party that's not biased, um, and just really clarity on who who gets, you know, the, these um, corrections, whether it's vectors or it's damaged, you know, homes. Um, so just some real clear criteria, and that's why we we built in this question of what additional COAs can we include tonight, if the council does move forward with what we think is a a project that should be studied further. So that's what we ask. Yeah, and I'll just add to, you know, Aaron's comment. Um, those inspections were all done, not just a few, but they were all done um, after the demolition began. And, and we can compare that if we need to get technical when, you know, compare that to when they started out there to when those reports were conducted. So, you know, we, we can verify that. Um, I personally know um, that the vector control is not offered um, to anyone um, if you are not on the property line. Um, and even if you are on the property line and have voiced concerns or you didn't voice concerns from the onset, um, then those services are denied. Um, I personally asked my neighbor because I, I've got such a bad problem if he would be willing to ask Aaron and his team for the service to try to mitigate, you know, the back and forth. If I, if he has them and he's not controlling it, you know, can he? Um, and he called and he personally told me that um, Aaron, you know, was not willing to provide the service. Um, my neighbor across the street had to have uh, Aaron come out to the house and verify, you know, what was going on. And, and it, I know it took a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails to get, um, to get Pulte Aaron to, to agree to that. So, you know, I think it's not to say that they're not trying, um, but as of June 20th, when they arrived on the site, the vector control was only along their property line. Um, and through verification from the animal control company that is providing the services, they were very unsuccessful in the beginning on the onset. Uh, because the bulldozers, all the big machinery that they had out there, they were running over the trap. So there, were, there wasn't that consistency because of how, uh, you know, whether it was the subcontractors or the contractors, how they were dealing with it. So a lot of the times they were pulled away. Um, two to three weeks into the, the project, the demolition, um, Pulte had those traps removed because they were not successful. Um, and again, I go back to they didn't come back until, you know, the neighbor started raising the voice. So, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that that Pulte has not attempted to mitigate, but I do feel that there could be a whole lot more being done. And like Jonathan has mentioned, um, setting that adjacent neighborhood, um, you know, territory, uh, everything it, it can't, it just can't be on the property line. It does need to go a little bit further than that. I'll end with that. Thank you. We're gonna move uh, to Council Member Papin, questions. You're on mute, Diane. I swore I was never gonna be one of those people. So I think what I'm hearing is that the um, the appeal isn't particularly related to the application that's before us. So I get that part of it. But I also get, Mr. Powers, Mr. Head, I can't see you, that Pulte hasn't necessarily been the greatest neighbor. And that we do have some conditions for approval that uh, to Council Member Lee's sort of inquiry, I don't know if they've been enforced. I don't, we have that there's been daily inspections is what I'm hearing from staff. Um, but somehow going forward, if this appeal is not related to the application 
and there's there's not that direct correlation, then it looks like we would have to deny the appeal. But how do we, and maybe I should be asking this of city of the city, how is it that we can make sure that these conditions for approval are enforced and rigorously enforced? And, and rest assured, uh, members of the public who said this wouldn't be happening if it was in our neighborhood, I endured a whole bunch of construction, including six weeks of a jackhammer, followed by six weeks of a saw cutter, followed by a whole bunch of vector issues. So it happens throughout the city. And I'm, I'm willing to concede that, but what can we do going forward for some of these things if in fact the appeal really isn't related to the application? Because we've heard a lot of very unhappy residents tonight. And that's why the first question I asked is how much longer? because I wanted to know kind of what I was dealing with here. So maybe my question is to staff, maybe my question is to the Pulte folks, but we gotta be better neighbors here. So how do we get some of these conditions for approval rigorously enforced where we're all at the table and we're not screwing around with, well, the traps were on our side, not on your side. And, and I will admit there is construction going on in 101, that's the express lanes. So I recognize Pulte that might not be all of you, but we're dealing with it. So how can we go, you know, handle some of these things going forward? That's what I'd like to see. I know it's a little off of what we're being asked to decide, but we have to respond to the public here. So that's where I'm coming from. If we can hear from city staff first, please. So I think that there are, there are things that we can do and things that we have been doing to address the conditions of approval and the mitigation measures. Um, when the site activities that were problematic first came to our attention at the very end of July, I believe it was shortly after the permit was issued and before any inspections were required, we did go out there and we did find that there were some conditions that were not in conformance with the conditions of approval. We issued a stop work order and had all of the corrections made before we resumed. Since then, we've been going out there regularly. I believe someone said earlier that we're out there all day long. We're not out there all day long, but we do have someone from Public Works go out there every day to look at the dust control, the storm water, um, the dirt tracking, and then our building inspection staff goes out um, about every other day, two to three times a week at least, if not more, in addition to required inspections. At those inspections and at those site visits, we are doing things like looking um, at the equipment they're using, looking at the watering, looking at those things that have been brought up. We do get a lot of feedback from the neighbors and we've tried to be responsive to that. And so some of the issues happen when we're away. Once in a while, you know, someone will, maybe they've, they've started using their equipment in a slightly different way. Maybe an operator is, is not doing exactly what we said, which is why we're going out there so frequently to reinforce that and to make sure that it's happening. Um, I believe Pulte's crew um, was trying to do the same. And so as we move forward, we do continue to monitor that. We will continue to monitor it. Um, we've had vector control out there. We've um, run Pulte's plan by vector control. And so um, we, have done, we have done a number of things um, to ensure that those things are being met. More recently, I believe Public Works also issued um, a warning letter or a notice of a violation for their stormwater. So there are things we can do to, um, when we see things that we think need to address, to stop the work, get things back on track before they start. If we have a continued issue with that, um, and we do find ourselves um, in a situation where we have a bad actor on the part of the applicant and they are continually in violation and, and we're observing that and, and um, confirming that, then, I mean, we could go as far as revoking permits. There's a section in our municipal code um, that does allow for penalties and I believe for, for treating this um, as a misdemeanor. And so there are avenues to take if we were to get to that, to that point in enforcement. Um, at this point in time, we have not observed that yet. And I don't know if Mike might have anything to add about side observations. Um, his crew is out there um, more than, than I am. Um, so that would be the my, my basic answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Pulte and, and... that's okay with the mayor. So yes, I mean we've been we've been in in touch with everyone um, on site. We've we've been in full compliance with the mitigation measures. Um, you know, Greg talked about where we were with the um, 
with the good neighbor um, sound barrier, the good neighbor fence. Um, you know, the city's been in contact with us on any anything that we've been you know issued with, and and frankly, um, you know, to Loriana's point is that we did and currently have vector control on someone that is not on our property line. Um, so I'm not sure who this person is, but they have not contacted me. Um, and, and again, if there's other issues on, on Elliott street, then I'm not aware of it. So what I'm not aware of, I can't control. Um, we're doing what we can. Um, we, again, to our earlier point is that we, we've minimized our working hours, um, due to the neighbor concerns. Um, again, we would love to work more work. We would love to fulfill, you know, what the city codes obligations are for our working hours, but we haven't um, based upon just the city, the, you know, the neighbor complaints and, and their voice. So um, we're, we're do honestly doing what we can. Council member, if I may, and Mr. Mayor, if I may. Yes. Just to, thank you, just to reinforce what Aaron's saying, there have been multiple inspections by Bay Area Air Quality Management District and the city's building department, uh, many, many inspections um, where there were no violations. And when violations are found, they are addressed immediately. Um, and when Aaron is made aware of an issue, the team gets put on it because at the end of the day, no one benefits, including Pulte, no one benefits from delays. Um, it just prolongs construction. It, it's not a good thing for anybody. Everyone wants it done. And so Pulte is being as proactive as they can, but they have to be aware of the issue. There have been a lot of inspections by a lot of different regulatory agencies, which Aaron can speak to, where there have been no violations found. But uh, I'm confident in saying that my client will step up and address violations immediately if and when they are found. If I may ask a follow-up question, um, just what you were what you were talking about, Councilmember Pappen, to, to city staff. Um, how do you reconcile um, all this the the stories and pictures and everything we've seen and we've heard from residents with with um, kind of what we, what you're saying is that we're we're um, properly enforcing our COAs and we are. Um, we are doing everything we can. Uh, that's one thing that I'm, I'm having trouble reconciling in my, in my mind, because it seems like I, I'm wondering if we are doing everything we possibly can as a city to, to proactively enforce these into existing COAs and not, and not have to be um, so kind of reactive the approach that I'm, I'm seeing. So that, that question is directed to uh, Christina, if you may. Yes, so I, I think, um... From our perspective, the proactive approach is that we are going out there quite frequently. We don't wait for inspections to be needed. Um, we don't know what's going out there, going on in terms of what the neighbors are experiencing until we hear from them. And so sometimes we do need to hear from them to know that. So we're going out there, we're looking um, at the equipment, we're looking at the conditions, we're looking at, at the best management practices that they're supposed to be implementing. We're requiring adjustments when we see them. We're not waiting for um, for reports from neighbors to enforce those basic things that are required. Um, I did see a lot of those photos. I believe that um, at least some of those photos um, may be from when site activities first began. As I mentioned, there was a period where there was some non-compliance and we did do a stop work and we did ask Pulte to make several adjustments and so I think what we've been doing um, since that time is keeping an open dialogue. We've made a point of contact with the city so that um, Pulte and the neighbors have a place to go um, when new issues come up. We've um, tried to provide information to the neighbors so that they can better understand um, what the city can do and has, and has done. Um, and so we're really trying to keep those lines of dialogue open to proactively be out there looking at the site, asking for adjustments before we're asked for them if we notice that something needs to be done. Um, we have asked for things that are uh, 
not things that are conditioned or conditioned or part of the mitigation measures um, early on. Um, and Poldy has agreed to do some of those extra measures as well. They can probably speak um, a little more to that than I can. Um, there was um, some fill material that was put in the ground to offset some vibration. We relocated some of the staging area to the opposite end of the site. We had them um, reroute some of their, their truck routes. Um, we had them put in um, a delineating um, barrier to keep construction away from the properties um, earlier in the construction phase. So I think we are we are doing we are doing um, what we can proactively, but there are some things that we just don't know unless we hear hear about it. Can I respond to Pulte and the previous point? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, you know, first and foremost, we don't want this to be the citizens against the city. You know, the, the city staff is working incredibly hard at a lot of different things and handling this project excellently. So we're not blaming the city. But there's two things. Pulte needs to show that they're meeting these COAs, that they're meeting their obligations, which they're not. We welcome Pulte to call and fix the problems at not only my client's property, but every property of the folks who called. Let, let me point out three COAs quickly, 21, 27, and 82 that need to be fixed. 21 is about the sound barrier. Eight feet is too short. 27 is about vectors. It's, it's unfortunately just the way that it's written. It's hard to tell what Pulte really should be doing and so that they seem to be able to dodge you know, our questions on um, why they're not doing what they've committed to do. And then 82 is a long list of noisy machinery and it just needs to be revised and clarified. Um, the hours, Pulte seems to be more than willing to reduce their hours, yet I've heard from my client and from other neighbors that they're working at times that are beyond what they've sound, what they sound like they've committed to. So in 82, we'd ask that the hours be um, shortened in that COA, COA. And I think on a final note in response to this is that really, you know, the city deserves an explanation and that should come from Pulte before the city grants additional approval. And so we'd ask that the city ask for those explanations from Pulte before deciding on this item. Thank you. And then I'll add, um, and I- Sorry, I'm gonna go back to council member Pappen now because we got to keep this flowing and I interrupted uh, her questioning. Nope, she's done. Thank All right. You. Mr. Mayor, may I respond to counsel for Ms. Diaz, please? Yes, quickly, please. Will do. Uh, a couple things. First, we have tried to work with Ms. Diaz. We were denied access back onto her property by her counsel so we could evaluate the damages that she alleges have occurred and we could compensate and assist in any way we could. And when I say we, I mean Pulte. Um, when we can't get onto the property to compare the current conditions to the pre-construction survey, it's impossible to work with them on that. So the ball is in their court on, on that matter. And we look forward to Ms. Diaz working with Pulte to allow us to compare the current conditions to the pre-construction survey. Um, and and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, I don't, I don't see any questions. I have some questions some more. Um, Numerous residents, and, and I, I kind of feel like the, the, our, this council is being put in a difficult position, or at least I'll, I'll speak for myself, I'm being put in a difficult position because we're, we're here to have a hearing on one thing, but then all these other issues are coming up. And um, I, I, I'm going to take the opportunity to, to follow up on some of these issues because um, you know when, whenever a project like this comes, comes up, Nobody wants it in their backyard because they're afraid of all these things that we're hearing about right now. And so, um, and and usually when we when we approve these, we we say, okay, you know, it's probably not going to be a, that bad, and we need to build it. And this is an example, at least from what I'm hearing from residents, is that uh, it it is looking bad. And I want to make sure that we, as a city, are doing everything we possibly can, and. It's just I, I'm having trouble like seeing those pictures and then and hearing all these stories and then also reconciling that with the fact of how many resources we we already are putting in. Um, 
I guess a question I have, uh, a concern that all residents or many of the speakers were, were, were asking was, is, is the, uh, the applicant, um, are, are they agreeing to pay for the damage um, that is done to the homes due to this construction? So we have a, a work plan put in place, right? So we have a pre-construction survey for those who agreed to it. Uh, we have that in place. We have, based upon our meetings, we have a work plan put in place, which lays out what the end, what the goal line is, right? So what, what, what happens at the end of the day, how we come back and justify what is damaged, what is not damaged, and what we're going to fix, what we're not going to fix. So again, that's been put into place. Um, I'll reiterate that our consultant has a different time frame on when these things have occur, but um, we're going to leave it up to the neighboring residents um, to when they feel comfortable to get that post-construction survey completed. Okay. So the answer is yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bonilla. Rick is uh, muted, but do you have questions, uh, Deputy Mayor Bonilla? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. Um, regarding um, the vector control, which seems to be a huge issue. Um, Aaron, did I hear you say earlier that you would be add, willing to add some vector control in the neighborhood uh, where we see? I mean, I know that we probably need to take a look at Caltrans. Um, I think I, uh, we should probably ask our um, uh, public works inspector to have a look around that edge of the site and see um, if we should ask Caltrans to add some of their own vector control along there. Um, I don't know if that's what they do, but clearly if it's impacting where the wall's been torn down or whatever, um, changes are being made, uh, uh, shrubbery's been removed, the rats always leave when that happens. Okay, sure. So, sure. So, so, sorry, go ahead. No. So that's my question for you, though. Are you willing to step it up a little bit if we ask Caltrans to take some of it? Yes. The answer is yes. So we we stepped it up in in August when we were asked to at that point uh, to put metric control in the neighboring residents' properties, and now I hear that there's additional properties that are impacted. So so the answer is yes. Okay. Good. Thank you, Aaron. So now you regarding, I heard somebody say that the uh, the street sweeper is not doing it. He wanted to just run the water truck along there and wash it. I guess into the storm drain. And uh, Aaron, this is not for you. Um, uh, staff, could you please explain why we can't uh, do that? Okay, then I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so ideally the dirt would not leave the site. And so um, they do have control measures at the entry exit to the site that should be taking care of that. Um, we have had some instances where we've seen the dirt on the ground and we have gone out there and had the site um, improved. The reason why we can't rinse it down the storm drain is because you can only rinse rain into the storm drain. And so we can't um, require folks to um, wash the streets and to um, channel dirt into the gutters and into the storm drains. And so it does need to be vacuumed up when it does happen or dry swept but ideally it just doesn't leave the site. And so um, that is something that, 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 that is the reason why, why Public Works has been going out there to monitor that. So I know there have been a couple of occasions where we, we've needed to have Pulte fortify that. Um, I don't hear about that all the time. Um, just like the vector control, we do hear from residents a lot about noise and shaking, um, about dust a little less so lately. But the vector control and the dirt are things that we hear about intermittently, and so this this conversation is actually quite informative in that in that respect because it gives us a little bit more information about what we need to be a little bit more diligent about as well. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Christina. Additionally, we do require the um, applicant 
the builder to take out the STPP permit, right, which says that they will not wash stuff down the mm -hmm. storm drain. It's against the law. It's not allowed. Yeah, they yeah. cannot do it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, for for city staff, another question I had was: It sounds like your team is is really um, putting a lot of effort into making sure the COAs are enforced. If if um, if we would were to ask you to redouble your efforts and do more, and, and are there any other areas you think our city staff could could do to kind of just you know mitigate some of these construction, some of this construction, especially considering that all these residents are home during the workday during COVID shelter in place. Um. So one of the things, like I just mentioned, that I'm hearing um, quite a bit about tonight, which I haven't heard so much about lately, is the vector control. And so I definitely think that there's more that we can do with that. We have been working with San Mateo Vector Control, who's been looking at the compliance reports. I don't think that we fully realized how far spread that issue was. And so uh, we would be happy to meet with Pulte and to meet with Vector Control and see what more we can do on that. Um, I would look to Mike, who I believe is an attendee for the construction site control measures. He's a little more well-versed than I am on that in terms of if there's things that we can do in addition to what we've done for construction equipment. I will say that following the planning commission meeting where we got questions about this, we did go and take another look to see if we could find any more areas where we thought, um, that changes could be made that would minimize, further minimize um, any impacts. And, and we thought that that um, they were pretty much doing all of the things that, that we identified. Thank you. Um, last question, and then um, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Um, in terms of, you, you said that, that that the city has some recourse if we are finding um, additional COAs not being um, met. Is there is there any um, kind of set point in time that you would be able to kind of revisit this and perhaps if if you're what you're finding or if the residents still do not feel uh, satisfied that they are that they are uh, that the applicant is is meeting the requirements that we would be able to bring this up again in front of this council? Not necessarily the appeal, but but talking about this and, and seeing what else we can do to enforce these, these COAs. Um, I would have to look and see what our, what our avenues are, but I think that if we were to find ourselves in a situation where there was repeated um, non-compliance of conditions of approval, we would find ourselves in that stop workplace and we would find ourselves um, probably pursuing a different avenue if that were something that were persistent um, and egregious and it, it probably would come before you. I believe it would at least go back before the planning commission because we could end up in a revocation situation um, if there was that type of ongoing non-compliance. Um, as I mentioned, we have not seen that so far. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we're getting to the comments, deliberation. Any council member want to start? Council, Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Thank you much, uh, very much, Mr. Mayor. First, I want to say that I, I really feel um, sad for the predicament that the neighborhood and the inhabitants of the neighborhood find themselves in. Um, it's not their fault that uh, COVID-19 happened and they and their kids and everybody are at home uh, while all this is going on. Um, the world has changed, but I think it's been shown already um, in the proceedings tonight that there is no remedy for that in CEQA. Um, and so while it's a very difficult situation, um, it's something that the city is left pretty much without any tools to deal with, except what we're trying to do. We're seeking greater enforcement of the conditions of approval, which I believe we're already getting, according to our uh, uh, director of community um, uh, development. Um, and, but we're gonna seek to, you know, 
um, like the mayor asked, can we do a little better? I think that we can. We're going to definitely take a good look at the vector control. Um, that has to be uh, controlled. Uh, in fact, yeah, I think that I have an idea for future uh, vector control conditions. Um, but this is what it is now. It's what the project was approved under. Mr. Head has agreed to go ahead and take additional steps. And I believe we should look at the bordering Caltrans project to see if there's anything can be done there. Um, the quality of life issues are very difficult. If, 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 if you had not been at home because of COVID, this would probably not be as big of a deal as it is. Also, it's not your fault, homeowners, that you have the kind of soils that you have that really bounce a lot. That's not normal. It doesn't happen everywhere, but it happens there. And um, because of those soils that your homes are built on, those vibrations travel, travel uh, farther. And um, there's very little that can be done about that. The Aromas earthquake at 4.2 on the Rector scale was 76 miles away. And I'm not, I, I'm no geologist. I don't know whether it's 4.2 all the way from there to here, but it's possible that, well, I mean, I'm not getting conjecture about that. I don't know. Um, the vibration monitors are an excellent thing that need to be in place. Uh, maybe they can be checked to make sure they're working properly or recalibrated if they need to be. Um, in terms of the mitigation for any damages that may happen to your home, uh, I'm in, I, I've been in construction all my life, and it is actually, uh, and it makes most sense, that conditions are checked before, and then they're checked after completion of the project. Um, that's the only reasonable time to check, because then you're done, whatever damages may have occurred along the way, then you take care of that. Um, that's just the way that's done. So all that said, um, I find that since we're, there's an appeal of an approval of some uh, um, items that don't really add a level of complexity to the project that would call for an additional sequel review, then I have to say that um, I think that legally uh, uh, we're bound as a city to uh, find um, against the appeal. So that's going to be my decision. Thank you, uh, Council Member Goethals. So I agree with Council Member Bonilla uh, for the most part. I'm looking first and foremost at the appeal itself. Um, and I think on the, on the grounds that were stated and as it was outlined by our city attorney, uh, the changes that are being made to the project are not significant, uh, not in a way that would warrant granting the appeal. However, um, what I've heard is very different from what I went through when, when we had a major project going next to our house. Um, I did have major equipment within six feet of my fence and within 15 feet of my kitchen window, uh, but it didn't happen during COVID. And so I recognize that this neighborhood is going through something very different. I also want to recognize what Michael Weinauer said, which is that we operate in a world where we're trying to build homes for people. We know that we don't have enough homes in the, in the, neighbor, in the neighborhoods, and we're trying to do our part to create homes for people. And we have good actors, and, and we have uh, other companies that, that have a lot more complaints. Um, and for whatever reason, we've seen that Pulte's had a lot of complaints in this particular instance. And so we need to add conditions of approval that will control the dust, that will control the hours of, of construction, that will control vector control. So whatever uh, we can agree on tonight to include as added conditions of approval, I think will, will benefit the community significantly. Uh, but the last thing that I want to have happen is for us to prolong this and to put this neighborhood through a year or 16 months of construction when this project could be done six months from now. So I'd, I'd like to see this project move forward swiftly uh, so that the community no longer has to, to go through this. 
Thank you. Anyone else? I'm ready to make a motion at this point, but I, well, you can I want to hear from everybody. <laughs> I'd like to hear from myself. No. Um, so I, I had a question for Council Member Gothels in terms of uh, condition of additional conditions of approval. Did you have any um, particular in mind you were thinking about? So it sounds like it's not an explicit condition of approval, but it's already been agreed to that the hours of operation be limited to um, not on the weekends and ending at 5 p.m. Am I correct that that's already a tacit agreement and it could be codified in a condition of approval? I don't hear any objection to that. So I guess I guess that 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 is the what what they're already operating under and we could codify that in an additional condition of approval to make sure that those are the hours and and we have an enforcement mechanism i'm waiting to hear from from pulte if they're amenable um to that uh council member gothels thank you for your question i can tell you that to this point pulte has been adhering to those rules. They have not been doing construction during weekends or holidays. Um, I will defer to uh, Mr. Head as to whether or not, you know, throughout fruition of construction, when this project is completely built out, whether they can, you know, if the plan is to stick with that or if there's going to be periods towards finalizing the project where, you know, in conformance with the conditions of approval and mitigation measures and the city's municipal code, they may need to do work on a Saturday. So I, I, that's not something I can answer off the cuff. I'll defer to Aaron Head on that one. Sure, I mean, so it, I mean, if, if I'm stating correctly, this is a city code, correctly? A COA, COA 82 would be revised. Understood, but it, but it is a city the city, the city allows you to actually build longer hours and on weekends. And we're suggesting that um, uh, an additional condition of approval would be an agreement with the neighborhood um, to only, to only uh, operate, to only operate in construction up until 5 p.m. and not on weekends and not on holidays, recognizing that that may take a little bit longer, but for those who are who are home all day long with school and kids and things like that, that it, it may be the respite that they need at the end of the day. Uh, it sounds like you're already doing it. So I just want to codify that in a condition of approval. I think it would make everybody happy here. Some formal commitment. We, we'd prefer, go ahead. We're just asking for some formal commitment. So I, I understand the ask. And I understand where we've been, but um, understanding where we at, where we're at in the time of year. So what that's that's directly impactful to the project, um, especially in the winter months when we may have three days where we don't work, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then there's be some days that we are able to work, right? So to put a condition to say that you can't work weekends. Um, or holidays that would impact us during the winter months. So I'm trying to understand, right? I'm hearing that we want the project to move forward quickly. We want the impact to be less, but then we don't want you to work weekends. So I'm trying to understand what the actual ask is um, and what's best for everyone, right? So is it an hour limit on the project um, per week? Well, you know, what's the best um, that we the ask was was clear and it's to protect the community. That's the ask. And it's to impose the same clear standard for the vectors, for the hours of operation and for other conditions. So I think I hear Aaron's point being that when it rains, is there, is there some, is there some may, if I may, work done during that week when it rains? If I may, Council let's, Member. Let's, let's just finish, let Council Member Gothel's finish. I've seen these agreements that apply to that. So. Sorry, Council Member Gothel's, please. Um, yeah, I, I understand that when it rains, it's not going to be as simple as I tried to make it out to be. Rick, did you have a solution for that? 
Well, I've seen uh, agreements on job sites that say that if you get rained out one or more days a week, then you can work on a Saturday, right? The so, whole point is to give the community a respite. If the respite is when it's raining, that's one thing, and, and maybe it, it shouldn't matter, way. right? It, they're home all the time anyway, I think. It's the same argument with the vector control. It shouldn't matter if nobody's really looking. We've already discussed the vector control, though. Well, it's an easy ask. The community just wants a little bit of a break. Okay. I, I'm not asking any more questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Mr. Let me Bay, know what you want me to make the motion. Yeah. Additional conditions of approval would be, uh, those were the, the thoughts that I had. It was uh, codifying the, the agreements that have already been made. I, I still, I, I mean, maybe, I, I still don't understand what the, if, if this is a practice that you're, you're trying to do any, or the, the um, applicant is trying to do anyway, and there is some sort of um, uh, like condition as council member or deputy mayor of Bonilla was, was talking about. I'm not, I'm, I still don't understand why you wouldn't agree to that. So if it, if it was raining, then, then of course you could work on the weekends, but if it's not, not. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're okay with that. That's, that was, that was clear, but the, the original statement was to not work on weekends ever and not work on holidays ever, right? Which is against what our work hours are currently. So during the winter months, um, when we do have rain occurrences, there is times when we're, we're shut down for you know weeks on end. And frankly, that some of the only times is maybe a Friday or a Saturday that we're able to work. And mind you that we are in communication with the neighbors of what we're, what we're planning on doing and what our um, intentions are in the project. Okay. Okay. Um, real quickly, I'll just, um, I, I kind of feel that um, the applicant's case as, as put, uh, or I guess the appeal as put to us, um, I feel like we have no choice but to deny the appeal based on the legal argument. But I do, um, I, I do um, have a lot of sympathy for the residents and I, don't make that that vote lightly. I want to make sure that uh, our city staff is really doing everything we can. And if it requires more more time, more resources to this, I think we need to. to I think we owe it to these residents, especially in this time of of COVID. So that's that's the only comments I have. Um, if anybody wants to make a motion, so I, if I may, Mr. Yes, Mayor. Please. Uh, so we, we're talking a lot about enforcement rather than adding on to conditions of approval. Um, and with that, uh, with all, I think we're all on the same page that folks from Pulte, we don't want we don't want to be back here. And we don't want to hear folks uh, being as unhappy as they are to this day. But I, I'm ready to make a motion to deny the appeal at this point with um, some greater enforcement and uh, greater communication. Understood. We don't like, we don't want to hear either. Do we have a second? So, second. So, so for clarification purposes, that's the recommendation of staff to adopt the resolution to deny the appeal and uphold the planning commission decision? Why, yes, it is. <laughs> well, well stated. In a second. <clears throat> uh, Madam Clerk, can you please? Yeah. I will. Council Member Pappen. Yes. Council Member Lee. Yes. Council Member Gothels. Yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Yes. Mayor Rodriguez. Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that took a long time, but that was important. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to old business. Um, item number 17, general plan and housing element next steps. And we have Ms. Julia Klein presenting for staff. Mr. Mayor, do you think we could take maybe a three minute break or so? Sure. Is that okay? Yes, five minutes and we'll be back. Start five minutes sharp, please.
two more items and we hit the halfway point for this meeting? It looks like these next ones are going to go by fast. I, I should have told you never to say that. <laughs> no, I was joking. Yeah, I can hear you guys. I don't know if anybody else can. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, it looks like everyone is back. Great, thank you. We will resume. My, our apologies, uh, Julia, and you can begin whenever you're ready. Hello, I'm gonna go ahead and start us off. Um, thank you, Mayor Rodriguez and council members. The item before you at this time um, is an update on the general plan update status as we prepare to resume work on the land use alternatives um, and related outreach after putting the outreach and outfacing um, general plan update efforts on hold as we adjusted um, to the pandemic. So for tonight's presentation, we'll start with a recap of what the general plan update is and share the established general plan 2040 vision statement Next, um, Julia Klein, Principal Planner and Program Lead for the General Plan um, Update. We'll provide you with an update on general plan efforts to date, um, concentrating mainly on late 2019 and also what's transpired in 2020. And she'll give you an overview of recent influencing factors on the general plan update. Following Julia, we'll have Joanna Jansen from PlaceWorks. She's the principal and the project lead for our consultant crew that's leading the general plan update. She'll bring you up to date on where we are with the land use alternatives and potential implications of the passage of Measure Y and the recent publishing of the anticipated regional housing needs allocation um, for the city of San Mateo. Um, before that, I'd like to start with just providing a brief overview of what a general plan is. Julia, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so for anyone who needs a refresher or who hasn't been in these conversations up to date, a general plan is an overarching land use document used by cities as a tool to provide a broad blueprint for what's envisioned for the community and how a community will develop over a long range of time, usually a span of about 20 years. The general plan should reflect the community's vision for the future um, and provide goals and policies um, that facilitate that vision taking place. Um, the current general plan um, that San Mateo has in place is general plan 2030. So it provides a vision up until 2030. Um, each municipality in California is required to have a general plan. A general plan contains policies that are organized into chapters, such as land use, circulation, safety, a housing element, um, and it documents the community's visions and values that are going to be used. The general plan is developed by community members working together with the city staff and decision makers. Um, Decision makers then rely on the general plan for making decisions. We lost the presentation. We're looking at Julia's screen. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Um, so it's developed with community members working together with city staff and decision makers to share the or develop the future goal and share it for the future. And then decision makers will rely on the general plan to make decisions about land use. Um, and different things um, in the community, such as public facilities, roads, sewers, parks, infrastructures, as well um, as using it as a basis to evaluate a range of other topics, such as housing, noise, traffic, diversity, and adapting to climate change. Um, this is done by setting goals and policies um, in conjunction with community needs. That's something we've been working on while we've halted our um, outreach and land use alternatives in light of the pandemic. 
Um, cities also have additional tools such as specific plans, master plans, zoning codes, and other policies that work together with the general plan to implement that vision and those goals and policies that are developed therein. Um, but the very first step is the vision statement. So in this case, for general plan 2040, um, the vision statement was established through a collaborative effort. Julia, can we advance the slide, please? Um, thank you. Um, a collaborative effort by many in the community. It was adopted by council in April of 2020. And as we move forward, um, I think it's important to refer to the vision um, statement because it's what we're striving to achieve for San Mateo's future. And so this is something that as we work through this update process and the project and consider um, how to move forward and what to present that we as the, the staff team are keeping in mind as we move forward. And so I'd just like to read it, um, the general plan 2040 vision statement. San Mateo is a vibrant, livable, diverse and healthy community that respects the quality of life or the quality of its neighborhoods, fosters a flourishing economy, is committed to equity, and is a leader in environmental sustainability. And we highlight the values of diversity, balance, inclusivity, prosperity, and resiliency. So with that, I will hand the presentation over to Julia. She'll give you a re recap of some um, recent activities, and then she will hand it over to Joanna. Okay, and good evening, council members. And I wanna apologize. I'm still getting used to uh, the syncing. <clears throat> so um, this uh, current slide is a summary of some of our uh, recent activities, uh, updates the city council. In October, 2019, the general plan study areas was established through a public process, including meetings, uh, workshops with the community, <clears throat> the general plan subcommittee, planning commission and city council. Um, then earlier in, um, 2020, uh, between January and March, um, we had community review of the range, the possible range of alternatives, which included workshop, um, stakeholder meetings, as well as the technical advisory P, uh, meeting of the uh, various city department staff. In June 2015, during the pandemic, uh, we provide an update to city council and also sought direction to pause the public in-person uh, in activities related to the alternatives creation process until after the November election. Um, this was you know, on, on three fronts. We considered the pandemic and just the, um, the issues that the community members um, were dealing with at, you know, to adjust to the pandemic, as well as two external factors that would have uh, affected the land use process. Um, one was uh, Measure P, which we'll cover later, as well as uh, we were anticipating uh, some information from the state in, in regards to um, housing, uh, fair housing numbers, and we'll cover that in a bit as well. Then in August 17, 2020, we updated the council with a revised project schedule, um, including a, a change in the scope of work. Um, and we also provide information about a shift to virtual outreach. Um, with that, we also included an adjustment to uh, include the uh, housing element consultant uh, in the process. So we basically initiated the work for the housing element update uh, at that time. <clears throat> so for this evening, we're seeking to um, update the council on current status and the results of the election, as well as seek direction on next steps. <clears throat> Just for background in terms of uh, those who may be uh, looking at uh, the information that's in the staff report, we've also summarized it, summarized it here in, in the background slide. Um, in March, again, uh, March 2020, uh, there was the shelter in place order. Uh, with that, we paused all in person outreach. The November 2020, there was a me two competing measures on the November ballot. Measure Y was passed by San Mateo voters. In December, um, the draft regional housing needs allocation numbers was released, and we'll cover that in a little bit. And then from summer 2020 to present, staff in uh, the general plan and housing element consultants are looking. Through I'm sorry, staff from the general plan consultant group uh, have been looking at uh, existing uh, general plan 2030 goals and uh, policies. And we've been reviewing those uh, in uh, with the affected um, departments internally. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry about that. So as mentioned earlier, uh, the city initiated the update of the housing element. Uh, we're in what we are calling the sixth cycle, which covers the period from 2023 to 2030. <clears throat> and a major component of the housing element update effort is demonstrating how the city is meeting its uh, regional housing needs uh, number. And so that's the RENA number, uh, more com commonly referred to as the city's fair share of regional housing. <clears throat> On December 18, 2020, the Association of Bay Area Governments, and that's ABAG, released draft numbers for each jurisdiction within the region. So San Mateo's share of that is 7,081 uh, uh, total units, and that's net new dwelling units. Um, by comparison, for the last cycle, which covered the period from 2015 to 2020, the city's uh, number was 3,100. So it's more than double um, what our, our previous uh, requirement was. <clears throat> Um, the draft arena number is higher than previous cycles and is based on new strategies in the final blueprint for the Plan Bay Area 2050. And so that document is a policy framework that addresses regional growth in the Bay Area region. And so that's covering all nine counties, uh, uh, sort of uh, regions. <clears throat> The other thing to kind of point out is that the uh, draft arena number is, this is new information that we didn't have before. Um, since it was just released in December and was also not available as the community and, uh, and uh, through the public process was developing the range of land use alternatives um, it, through the general plan process. And we'll cover that uh, later in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, one final note um, is, is a, a question about repercussions. What happens if we don't do this, if we don't factor in um, and update the housing element to address this arena requirement? Um, there are uh, cities that have faced legal challenges, um, basically being sued by the state. Um, there's also provisions to find the local jurisdictions who do not meet um, and, and update their housing plan to comply. And uh, on a larger scale, there's a loss of funding and grant opportunities that can, uh, these are grants that apply to infrastructure improvements and you know, affordable housing. So a whole host of grants are now linked in to making sure that cities are, are meeting their uh, housing requirements. <clears throat> One other thing to note, and this is also um, as we're considering how we meet our arena allocation numbers, is that uh, the new housing laws require that cities basically, um, uh, through this process, make sure that we're not losing any housing units. So it's you know no net loss provisions. Um, so as we're looking at um, uh, updating this uh, housing element, you know, for example, under this no net loss provision, a site that can accommodate high density housing and then is later approved for townhome developments, which is typically a lower density type development of housing. When this happens, then other sites would need to be identified in order to make up that difference in terms of lost dwelling units. And so as we're looking at the city's ability to meet the arena number, which is the 7,081 uh, net new dwelling units, we also need to be looking in, uh, factoring in a substantial amount of buffer. And this is critical to making sure that through this eight year cycle, we are able to meet um, uh, the affordable housing numbers set by RENA. And this is at every income category. <clears throat> um, the state does recommend um, at least a range of 15 to 30% as the buffer, but many jurisdictions are looking at using 50%. Um, and for reference, you know, the last housing element cycle, the fifth cycle, we had a buffer of about 52%. And so what this means is that when we're looking at identifying opportunity sites for the six cycle update, we need to factor in not just the uh, RENA number, the 7,081 new units, we also need to factor in the substantial buffer. The other thing to mention is uh, the implications from, um, from Measure Y. And this was passed by San Mateo voters in November 2020, 
The measure uh, sets caps or limits on building height and density through the calendar year 2030, and this is citywide. The, it's important to mention that uh, Measure Y um, basically uh, limits the amount of development that can occur in the city. And uh, this may affect the city's ability to identify enough sites to meet the city's RENA number, as well as the, uh, the buffer that we need. Um, keep in, keep this, these two numbers in mind um, and the fact that we do have Measure Y in mind as we go into the next discussion, um, which Joanna will do about the general plan and the land use alternatives. Thank you, Julia. Uh, my name is Joanna Jansen. I am a principal with PlaceWorks and we are the consulting firm that's leading the city's uh, general plan update uh, team. Thank you very much for, for uh, your time tonight and a chance to just remind you a little bit about the land use alternatives process that we've talked about in the past. Um, as Julia mentioned, an important part of thinking about the general plan update is thinking about what the uh, land use designations should be that guide development and conservation in San Mateo over the next 20 years. And thinking about making changes to that map as part of the general plan update is the role of the land use alternatives process. So it's a multi-step process just to remind you of where we are in that process. Um, back in uh, in 2019, we went through uh, an effort to choose um, study areas. Those are the colored outlines uh, in 10 different study areas that you see over in the right. Uh, we went through a community-based process that ended in council direction uh, on those 10 study areas. We're not talking about changes to those 10 study areas tonight. This is just a reminder of the building blocks of our alternatives. Then with further community input in the fall and winter of 2019, we created a range of alternatives for each one of those three study areas. Uh, and then we, in the spring of 2020, we took three alternatives, A, B, and C, which I'll talk about in just a second, back to the community um, for review. So we paused there at step three in March 2020 when we um, went into shelter in place. When we get back to the land use alternatives process, the next step will be an evaluation that compares the three alternatives. I'll say more about that on the next slide. And then based on that evaluation, we will take um, the, the results of that evaluation through a series of community, general plan subcommittee, planning commission, and city council meetings to formulate what we call a preferred scenario. And the preferred scenario can be built from mixing and matching different pieces of each one of the three alternatives to um, create the, the most optimum future for San Mateo. And that preferred scenario will then become the basis for the general plan land use map and the circulation network and all of the other pieces of the general plan that support uh, the general plan land use map. So on the next slide, um, this just has a little bit of information, more information about the alternatives evaluation that I referenced. Already, as we start to talk about putting the alternatives together, folks have a lot of questions about the alternatives. What will this mean for schools in San Mateo? What will this mean for traffic in San Mateo? Those are really important questions and we're gonna answer them through this evaluation. So the alternatives evaluation will cons of the three alternatives that we arrive at, we'll consider things like the total amount of development that could be allowed, what kind of impacts that might have on San Mateo's character, on traffic, on public health, on impacts to utilities and services, the city's fiscal health, all of the factors that you see here listed on this slide. Um, again, the um, if we could just go back to that slide real quick, the, um, the preferred scenario then based on the pros and cons that we identify on that evaluation. We lost the presentation again. Let me just pause while we get that pulled back up. Let's see, so I think we're on slide 11, Julia. Alternatives evaluation, there you go. Thank you very much. Um, so the preferred, based on that evaluation, you might find that one alternative, you know, has positive impacts in one area and negative impacts in another. We weigh the pros and cons. We talk about that with the community, with you, um, and we can kind of pick and choose which pieces we 
like best or, or maybe hate the least from each of the alternatives and use that to craft together a preferred scenario. Just to be really clear, we're not talking tonight about picking any one of these alternatives. We're not debating the merits of, of which alternative we want and which we don't want. All of that is gonna happen with um, the evaluation and no decisions about the preferred scenario are gonna be made until we have had a chance to finalize the alternatives, complete the evaluation and talk about the results of that evaluation in public and share the outcomes with the community. So let me just remind you on the next slide of, uh, the next couple slides are just an overview of the land use alternatives. Um, this shows the land use alternatives graphically in a map. So again, we took those 10 study areas um, and we are only considering land use changes with the land use alternatives within the boundaries of those study areas um, that were approved by the council. So you can see here that each one of the maps has a slightly different set of colors within those study areas. Those colors correspond to land use categories that are intended to explore a range of different possible land use changes in San Mateo between now uh, and 2040. And then the implication is that uh, there are not land use changes being considered outside of those 10 study areas as part of the general plan update. That's all the white areas on the map. On the next slide, we have some numbers for the, the land use alternatives um, as compared to uh, the existing development in San Mateo. Um, so the uh, alternative A, in those, those land use colors that I showed you on the previous map translate into different potential amounts of development. Alternative A would have about 10,900 new homes in the 20 year life of the general plan. Alternative B has about 15,800 new homes and alternative C includes about 20,800 new homes. All three alternatives have a similar number of new jobs. So really the, the difference, the range of possible residential development is, is one of the primary differences in characterizing the alternatives right now. So what are the implications of these alternatives then when we compare them to some of the changes that, that Julie and Christina have mentioned? Uh, on the next slide, um, we have a, a chart that kind of summarizes some of the preliminary assessment that we can do when we ask our, ourselves these questions. As I mentioned, we are gonna be doing an in-depth evaluation of these alternatives um, but before we invest in that evaluation, we want to make sure that we're considering a reasonable range of alternatives um, that is responsive to not only the community's desires in San Mateo, certainly that's a priority, but we also do want to be mindful of uh, the legal obligations that the city is facing in terms of state and local regulations that influence land use planning. Based on the numbers that I showed you on that previous slide, um, we can make some preliminary assessments of what the three draft alternatives do and don't do with regard to housing and with regard to measure Y. So um, we, we believe um, that uh, we are likely to be able to meet the six cycle arena. We're still investigating that um, with alternative A. Uh, it seems pretty clear that alternatives B and C can meet the six cycle arena plus some buffer. Um, for alternative A, that would likely not accommodate a, a seventh cycle RENA. That's um, if that RENA is similar in scale to the sixth cycle, the, the regional housing needs allocation. Uh, and that means it really doesn't quite fully plan for getting the city all the way to 2040, because that seventh cycle um, is gonna last from about seven, uh, 2023 to 2031. So it wouldn't quite get you all the way to your next um, or excuse me, that's one could get you all the way to the next uh, housing element, the end of the high rise of the general plan. We do need to do some more study on measure Y to determine whether or not it's consistent with, uh, alternative A is consistent with the height and density limits there. Lower heights in the study areas may mean that eventually the city needs to identify some housing sites outside of those study areas. Um, if we look alternative B in the next column, it may uh, probably accommodate the seventh cycle arena without needing to look for housing sites outside of the study areas. So it um, is more likely to get the city to a 2040 horizon without major land use map amendments. Uh, but to do so, it would require some exceptions to measure why height limits. And of course, those changes would require uh, voter approval. Alternative C uh, to the far right, 
does accommodate both your current six cycle arena and your next seventh cycle arena without needing to find housing sites outside of the study areas. So it does get the city to 2040 uh, without the need for major land use map amendments, but it's pretty clear that it's inconsistent with the measure Y height and density limits uh, that were recently approved by the voters. Uh, and so of course, implementation of uh, any building um, height and densities that are more consistent with an alternative C type of future uh, would, would require voter approval. We can, we can say that now even in advance of, of the evaluation. On the next couple of slides, I just wanna to touch on schedule implications. Uh, I know all of us are uh, eager to see the general plan um, attain and maintain some momentum. It's a very important project to the city. Uh, and we know how engaged the community and is and anxious to engage in this again. Uh, it's clearly the city's responsibility to plan thoughtfully for future housing. That's something that's directly relevant to both the general plan and to the housing element as one of the elements of the general plan. Um, although the housing element is legally part of the general plan, the two projects are on separate but parallel tracks. That's in order to ensure that the housing element can meet the state mandated deadline for adoption uh, by the end of 2022. This slide provides some um, uh, analysis of how the two schedules line up. Uh, and we can come back to this if you have more questions. But for now on the next slide, I just wanna highlight a few of the most specific uh, relevant um, schedule implications. First is that the deadline to complete and adopt the housing element and to submit it to HCD no later than January, 2023 is a firm deadline. Uh, a lot of cities that I work with ask, you know, maybe we can get some relief, think of everything that's going on. Um, those deadlines are established by the state legislature. They cannot be unilaterally changed or relaxed or extended um, by staff at the state. So we don't have any indication right now that the legislature is going to take the step of extending those deadlines. And as um, Julia mentioned, there are serious consequences for not meeting that deadline and for having a housing element that's out of compliance. So as staff and consultants, we are treating that deadline as a very firm uh, deadline. That means that the deadline uh, that we're gonna need to make some key decisions about housing sites for your housing element and housing policies before the land use alternatives process is fully completed. So as we consider next steps tonight, we do wanna be clear that the current general plan update schedule, which would reach a general plan adoption later in 2023 following uh, the housing element adoption is based on the assumption that we will move forward with the three current draft land use alternatives. Um, however, if the council would like to ask staff to consider a different range of alternatives, we're certainly happy to do that. There may be good reasons for doing that, uh, but it would require us to add time to the general plan schedule uh, to kind of go back to the drawing board with those alternatives uh, and vet them again with the community. And uh, with that, I think we're ready for the final slide and I think Christina will wrap up. Thank you, Joanna and Julia. Um, so that brings us to our questions for council. Um, based on the presentation and the staff report provided to you, um, our questions to council are, should the general plan update effort proceed with the current range of alternatives and project schedule? Um, should the general plan effort consider making any adjustments to the range of alternatives um, and then related project schedule adjustments? And does council have any additional direction or concerns that they'd like to convey to staff um, to move forward? So we are all here and available for questions. Um, as I mentioned, we have Joanna and Julia. We also have Diana Elrod, our housing element consultant, as well as Sandy Council. Um, our housing manager, and we're all available for questions and anything else you need. Great, thank you for that very thorough presentation. And I see uh, council member Gothel's hand up. So we received a lot of comments uh, from the general public about um, alternative A, and that there are significant changes due to COVID-19 that we should pay attention to and perhaps keep alternative A in the mix. Is that gonna be a strain on staff? Is that going to delay the process? To, to keep the land, land use alternative A in the mix? Yes. That would not delay the, the process that, um, 
leaving them the same would keep us on the track that we're on. Okay, so uh, we can keep a in there, continue to look at what the impacts of COVID-19 have been and whether we can meet our arena numbers. Uh, I know some people don't even feel like we should be trying to, to meet our arena numbers, but obviously we, we have to put together a plan, the state mandates it. And so uh, we can stay on this track with plan A, B and C and continue to study all of these options. Yes. Okay, that's my only question, thank you. Are there more questions from council? I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing any hands up. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Christina, and I know I asked you this um, the other day, but I think it's important to, to talk more about it. Can you explain a little bit more about why having a buffer is important or not important? Um, you know, when I first read it, when I was thinking, well, if the state only mandates a 15% buffer or whatever, why don't we mm -hmm. just go with the minimum? And you had a, a very thorough answer. I just wanted to See if you could repeat that, please. <laughs> I'll try. Um, so basically, it's sort of as Julia described in the presentation, is that um, we have to provide the space in order to for, for the housing that's um, our fair share to be created within the city. We don't build it. We create the space for it to be constructed and developed. That means that we don't have full control over what gets constructed. And so um, if we have sites that are not developed to their full housing potential, or they are, but they don't um, represent the different range of income categories um, that we need to meet in our allotment, then we end up um, losing some of those sites that we counted. And so in order to make sure that we have everything that we need, and if some sites are not developed to their full potential or with, um, the range of income categories um, that we need to meet, then we need to make sure that we have some space somewhere else in order to be able to do that. And so that's what that buffer is for, um, to make sure that we don't end up falling short of what our what our requirement is. Great, thank you. And, and this is a, a, a similar question. Um, why is it important that we also take into account the the seventh um, iteration of RENA as opposed to not just focus on the sixth? So, um, well, first of all, I think it, it's, we're planning for general plan 2040. We're planning for a 20 year horizon, which is typical for, for general plans. Um, it's a comprehensive update, which means we are looking at the entire general plan um, it's based on the alter alternatives that we're looking at. And so we are looking at it and we will, will look at it based on the growth that, that, that we're envisioning to take place on what we hear for, from the community on those alternatives. If we come back um, not having planned for the seventh cycle arena, um, after we just did a comprehensive update, looking at the housing element, looking at the safety element, looking at circulation, and all of that as it relates, say, to one specific number that only meets our sixth arena cycle, then we have to start our evaluation again. So we're looking again, where can we fit these housing units that we have to make way for? But then we're also looking again at the general plan and saying, okay, and how is this gonna impact the safety element? How is it going to impact the land use element and the circulation element? Because now we're planning for a whole nother allocation of, house, of housing. And if it's similar to what it was this time, then it's going to be double. So basically we're repeating a lot of the work that's already been done in eight years when theoretically um, it, it could last longer. Okay, thank you. And I have one last question, and I don't know if this might be for Sean, um, but um, I was um, talking with a neighborhood association the other night, and the, uh, a question I received was, um, why doesn't the city of San Mateo um, band together with other cities and push back and on Rena? And so we, so we might not have to follow Rena. And I guess the question is, is like, what? what could our city do or what would have to happen to 
to make that RENA requirement just go away or enable us to not have to follow that RENA requirement. RENA requirement. And maybe that's a, a question for PlaceWorks or I don't mean to well, put you on but From a legal perspective, what would have to happen is massive rewriting of state housing law. And I think that that is extraordinarily unlikely to happen in the current environment where with the, with the governor and the legislature, the housing is there, one of the number one priorities. And um, so that would be a complete about face uh, and moving in a very, very different direction than the state has been moving in now for the last several years. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, if there's no more, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, please do it virtually if you're a council member and you want to, um, because I'm not seeing. I have okay. a question. Oh. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, first, I'd like to talk about uh, the question you just asked, where other cities or jurisdictions were able to get some change in their uh, um, um, the yet unsettled allocation number, which is going to be approved, uh, the methodology that is, by the uh, ABAG board, um, I think tomorrow night. But um, uh, some cities like Brisbane, for instance, were able to get a change in, oh, okay, were able to get a change based on the fact that some of the land that ABEG was looking at and considering buildable, which created their, they had a very high number, um, and uh, was not actually buildable. Part of it is 100 acres that wants, to, that, that high-speed rail wants to use for a train yard. The other part is they have a um, tank farm where there are pipes, uh, petroleum <laughs> that run from the refineries in Martinez all the way down under the bay and over to this tank farm, and from there down to the airport. And then they have what were unregulated dumps located on that site. So these areas that was determined are basically not buildable. And based on that, then RENA reassessed and gave them a lower allocation considering those numbers. Now, um, uh, uh, earlier, question was looked into about San Mateo, didn't really find any grounds that were um, acceptable under current law to be able to argue for a lower allocation. So that said, my, my question is, I guess maybe for uh, Christina, um, the Director of Community Development, could you please explain uh, for us what the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Act is and how it works, what it means to us. I think I actually would like to have our housing element consultant um, answer that. I think she probably could give a, a, a more succinct synopsis of that than, than I could and probably give you a lot better answer. Thank you. So the requirement to do that is basically looking at where are you putting housing and whether or not the housing that you are, um, whether the housing is affordable and how close it is to services and whatnot. So the effort to um, affirmatively for, for, sorry, affirmatively <laughs> fair housing is, is really about if you're going to do lower income housing, where is it located? Is it located near transit? Is it located near t uh, services and so forth? And so the new requirement is to make sure that uh, jurisdictions don't put um, multifamily housing far away from services and transit and so forth. And so that's a new lens that we have to use when we find um, when we do our uh, inventory of housing sites and figure out where they're going to go, how close are they to these services? We don't want to put them off way far away from services and transit. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions from council? Uh, Councilmember Lee. I have a process question. So um, we have, um, you know, we have, we have uh, the the height and density restrictions of of measure 
um, H, P, and um, and why that will continue. And um, and then we also have a community led process. And um, and on top of that, we have the requirements to um, to certify our housing element and, and our city goals. So I wanted to better understand, you know, from a process perspective, how do we how do we reconcile all of those things in a way that will be respecting the will of the voters and um, and threading the needle to um, to really empower a community led process to come to the preferred scenario and also meet our our um, you know our vision for our city and um, and our legal requirements. What, how do you see that pro that process playing out when we know that our community is divided and um, and we have um, you know we have uh, the the constraints of measure measure why in um, as an unknown in terms of potentially being in conflict to us actually achieving the Reno Reno cycle seven. So I'm, I'd, I'd like to hear how you will approach this. So, so that's part of the difficulty that we have um, because you know we are trying to align our schedules so that we meet our housing element um, requirements on time, but those land use alternatives are still gonna be under review and under evaluation at the same time while well, we're gonna be required to wrap up the draft of that housing element. And so I think um, the idea at this time is just that we um, are very careful with our outreach, that we stay really closely in contact and communication, that we report um, back to council often on, on what we're doing and that we are making sure that we are really um, using the information that we're getting in the land use alternatives um, process to inform what we're doing with the housing, the housing element and vice versa. So they're gonna be concurrent, but they're gonna be different. One does sort of inform the other. While we're doing this analysis for the housing element, right now there's still a lot of unknowns. And so um, we're not sure what it's gonna look like. We have a lot of data to crunch. We have a lot of sites to look at before we're even gonna have much more information to be able to figure out where to go with this and how to package it and, and see it through. Um, what kind of process is it gonna need? It's gonna depend on what happens when we start looking at the numbers a little bit, when we know where we can fit the units that we need to allocate for. Um, and we just don't have all of that information yet. And so I think it's gonna be a matter, um, especially in the, the next coming months of, um, just paying very close attention to the information that we're getting both from the land use alternatives um, activities and also from the data that we're collecting and analyzing through the housing element. It could be that we find ourselves in a place where we need to come back and ask for further direction because the data we're getting um, is indicating that. And so um, I have to say at this point, a little bit of it, of it is going to depend um, and it's gonna depend um, on what we do tonight. So if we're directed to go through with three existing land use alternatives, then we continue to move forward as we are. It's just, um, where do we land? If the writing on the wall lands us in a place where we think we're headed toward um, a scenario where we are not meeting measure Y, then we need to start thinking about that with the housing element update, which comes sooner than the close of the general plan. Um, as Joanna mentioned in her slide, uh, it's unknown whether or not we can fully meet it, but I think we did come to that land use alternative scenario in anticipation that we thought we could meet could meet it under, under measure Y, or at least we were hopeful that we could meet it under measure Y. And so, um, I think as we move forward, we'll have more information on that, but some of it is gonna depend on, on, like I said, the information that we're getting. Thank you. And my second question is, you know, I, I think that, um, I think that the public has, you know, has very strongly affirmed our commitment to affordable housing. And 
one of the things that I that um, I'm curious about in terms of our outreach and education is how how are we going to connect the dots for people who are not policy wonks and um, you know and land use experts? How do we make sure that um, that people who care about affordable housing understand what the solutions are in front of them mm -hmm. um, and what the decision points are and the trade offs? So I think that's gonna go a bit to the content and the quality of the outreach that we do. And so um, put together more concrete outreach. We do plan on having a lot of visual aids, being able to really show um, what some of the different scenarios will look like and just having those discussions and making sure that we're really clear about um, how these things work, what the in income categories are and the levels of affordability and how that plays out. So I think it's just a matter of um, during our events, just um, being really diligent about the education component of that and making sure that, you know, we're not just talking, but we're hearing and that the understanding is happening. Yeah. Well, I think that one, you know, one of the things that I would just um, put out there as a, um, as a standard feature is maybe some polling to understand baseline where people are starting in terms of their mm -hmm. understanding and then where they end up after a workshop or after an event participation. I would like to be, um, you know, more, more, um, you know, just more, more diligent about tracking people, the change in, um, in perceptions and understanding um, as we go through the process and leveraging that um, as we move forward. Good idea. Okay, um, who else has questions I'd like to ask before I open it up to public comment? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Let's, Madam Clerk, can you please uh, begin public comment? Yes, sir. Um, our first speaker is Michael Weinauer, and um, you're sharing the screen for three minutes. Uh, good evening, Mayor Rodriguez and Council members. Uh, speaking as a a um, malicious agitator, and on behalf of San Mateus for Responsive Government, SMERG has always supported the general plan update as the place where potential changes in height, density, and affordable housing requirements for Measure Y can be debated. Measure Y assures that the residents and taxpayers of San Mateo will have a seat at the development table, a process normally dominated by the special interests who financially benefit from land use changes. This very council promised that the general plan process would be fair and allow residents to fully participate in the shaping of the future of San Mateo. As we said in our submitted statement, we hear talk about including Sam, single family residential neighborhoods in the general plan study areas, a threat that seems more intended to punish than solving any problems. The effort to decide study areas was long uh, and had a decisive outcome. That outcome should be respected. However, staff's report makes it clear that upzoning single family residential neighborhoods is unnecessary to meet current and future state housing requirements through 2040 in all currently outlined general plan scenarios, despite the labeling of unknown in staff's presentation, which we feel is misleading and contradicts the initial report. The staff report neglects to point out, however, two very important points that why allows for increased height and density in selected areas provided sufficient community benefit and that state laws allow for increased height and density based upon affordability, which in the case of Midpen has already been employed. And just how appropriate are these housing requirements anyway? We believe that ABAC green housing targets created during one of the Bay Area's most extended economic booms are no longer realistic in a post-pandemic world. Staff's presentation is unfortunately stuck in a past reality. Therefore, we ask that the city of San Mateo, like many other municipalities, push back against housing targets that have increased more than 250%. Of concern is council member Rick Bonilla, who represented the building trades for his entire career and simultaneously sits on the ABAC RENA methodology committee that determines mandated housing allocations. Basically, this council member is strongly incented to approve huge numbers, the bigger the better, appropriate or not. SMERG believes that Measure Y will force the city to have a meaningful general plan process instead of just dictating a choice, quote unquote, between big buildings or huge buildings. SMERG will advocate for a plan to recognize and protect neighborhoods our historic downtown and our historic downtown. Sberg wants the process to involve entire, the entire community not be rushed or assume people's wants. Two critical uh, issues are addressing the imbalance of homes versus jobs and ensuring there's enough affordable housing. As Councilwoman Lee said, we are united as a community on the need for affordable housing. Instead of a glut of luxury housing from big developers, 
San Mateo can't just build, build, build. Trickle down, trickle down development is as much of a fallacy as debunk supply side economics. In the end, the goal of the general plan process should be founded on quality of design, how traffic and infrastructure impacts are addressed, affordable housing, et cetera, et cetera. Not on just quantity of new units built or panic stemming from fear of what Sacramento tries to impose upon us. The GP is an opportunity for the community to guide new development by using improved urban design guidelines, a menu of architecture. Let's go on, how are you going to have to wrap up, please? And a robust, I'll, I got a couple sentences, and a robust respect for the existing built environment. Councilman Goltis was quoted on January 9, 2020. Your, I'm sorry, your time is up. Public trust is very important. The council. The next speaker is Rayanne Matashemi. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi there, my name is Ryan Motoshemi. I had a quick question procedurally. Was public comment, was that before item 16 on the agenda or before item one? Uh, can you repeat? Um, Regu was just Regular public comment for items not on the agenda was before item 16. Okay, thank you, my apologies. Um, I'll begin with my discussion, my comment on the general plan. Um, so the general vein of my comments are that we must reassess the study areas. All areas of the city should be included, especially single family home neighborhoods currently that have been left out of the process and should reassess um, raising the height limits in downtown on El Camino and near train stations eventually. Um, we should not be making our, the arena requirements go away because if you wanted to make our arena requirements go away, you should make the housing crisis go away. But then again, the housing crisis exists because we do not build enough housing due to restrictionist housing policies. And also, this is a general process through 2040. Again, we're in a housing crisis, regardless of the impact of COVID or not. And in fact, I believe that city staff themselves, correct me if I'm wrong, have partnered with a consultant to address the specific issue of what they think the impact of COVID would be on our development trends and found that through 2040, the housing crisis will still exist if we don't build enough housing. This means we should plan for arena housing allocations through the year 2040. And from what I understand, the only alternative that would definitely cover these um, seventh arena cycles is alternative C, certainly not alternative A. This would mean that we would have to revisit a height limit measure at some point in time. Um, therefore, it would be fair to select an alternative that is in part based on a changed regulatory setting, given that measure Y passed by only 43 votes when about 45,000 votes were cast. I also yield to city recommendations regarding the 50% buffer. We need this buffer to ensure that at the very least we meet our expected housing goals through 2040, but also we should be setting our sites higher than these RENA goals. It is because we are in a severe housing crisis and every additional unit will lead to more affordability. Um, I also would like to talk about the areas that have been left out of this process on purpose. Um, we just celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. Day, um, his birthday yesterday. Martin Luther King would be stirring in his grave knowing that primarily white, higher income neighborhoods of our city successfully lobbied a planning process ensuring that the land uses that they are accustomed to do not change as the city rightfully engages in a process to meaningfully address the housing crisis, which in large part was created by racist policies. The city should study all areas of San Mateo, not only because we need to in order to meet our housing goals, but because it would be racist and inequitable to not do so. And a commitment to diversity and equity is supposedly a city value. I understand this may be a politically unpopular move, but it's necessary. Um, I would also like to ask the city to define the word character because the word character has historically been a dog whistle. Um, so thank you very much. And I, I just wanted to make um, one comment. You know, we're giving three minutes um, to each speaker. And of course, I'm trying to give um, a couple extra buffer seconds to finish. But we really, we have a lot of speakers this evening and we want to get through everybody. So um, please try to wrap things up in the three minutes. Thanks. The next speaker is Colin user underscore one. Please unmute yourself. Uh, this is Karen Harrell. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. I hope this was my time because the two the two bits of uh, of um, voice overwent each other. So, am I in the right place here? This is my moment. 
This is your moment. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I am uh, going to hit highlights from the SMERG uh, statement that we sent to you earlier today related specifically to the general plan and then add a few comments of my own along the way, if I can make it within the time. Um, Samitans for Responsive Government notes that there are two separate but related items on tonight's agenda, this general plan next steps item and the potential violation of the Brown Act to come up later. Public trust is the important connecting link between these two items. It has been disappointing, but perhaps not surprising, that no one from the City Council has reached across the aisle to us to acknowledge Measure Y, uh, the passage of Measure Y, um, and to confirm the Council's commitment to the general plan update being the place where changes to heights, densities, and affordable housing would be discussed and where that, that might be modified. The Council has promised that the general plan process would be fair and allow residents to fully help in shaping the future of San Mateo. Um, the problem here, and I'll skip on down in, in what we sent, because Michael has already sent, uh, spoken about some of this, uh, particularly also the idea that there seems to be an idea of singling out uh, some of the single-family residential neighborhoods, which some of us view as being simply a punitive uh, response to an unhappiness with what has happened at the last election. Um, I think we need to stick with the facts and stick with the areas that we already have. The focus should be on identifying the specific areas where changes to heights and densities result in good projects, and that's where we have to deal with that. I also would like to say that we need to um, not so quickly dismiss the idea of pushing back at the RENA target numbers. Um, I understand there are all kinds of reasons why people will tell us that's not a good idea, but you know, if you don't ask the question, the answer is already no. So, um, and also I think we need to consider that with all the changes in COVID, uh, it may well be that the seventh level will not be the same as what it is assumed to be for now, or that perhaps the buffer areas might end up being much more useful in the seventh area, and we don't need them at the 50% level. So, you know, let's not get ourselves boxed in a corner because we're already feeling so down about this. Um, in the end, the general plan update process should seek quality and not quantity, as was already mentioned. This is the opportunity for the community to guide new development toward better quality developments for the entire community. We ask you to put down your no on why pitchforks and to stop trying to find ways to say it can never work. Let's work on this together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next speaker is uh, Lisa Diaz-Nash. And Lisa, please unmute yourself. <laughs> Hi, good evening, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mayor Rodriguez and city council members. Thank you also to all the city staff and consultants for all the analysis you did on the general plan and housing elements next steps. Not easy. While there has been heated discussion on land use in San Mateo, and there is tonight, I believe we can all agree on the following. Number one, our city is divided on the direction of land use in San Mateo, particularly as it pertains to residential use. Number two, Measure Y was approved by the voters, although narrowly, and must be the filter through which all plans are developed until such time as a different land use scenario is approved by San Mateo voters. Number three, San Mateo has a strong need for more affordable housing, not just market rate housing. And number four, we need to expand how we get general plan community input. Staff's input and plans to utilize interactive tools and virtual meeting platforms are welcome, but we also have to go to where our residents are, virtually or otherwise. We need to work with trusted community leaders so that they gather their communities to provide input rather than relying just on people coming to public meetings. During my city council campaign, I heard repeatedly from residents, housing advocates, and other city council candidates that we didn't want the same 10 people showing up at all the input meetings and driving the decisions. So now we have a chance to do something about it. It is more important than ever for the long-term vitality of San Mateo that our plans remain flexible and nimble. The staff report stated that, quote, all three draft alternatives were developed to accommodate the number of units in the city's anticipated six cycle arena with a buffer, unquote. Then the report states that, quote, 
Land alternative use A will require staff to quote, reconvene only four to five years after general plan 2040 is expected to be completed. Ongoing analysis of planning assumptions and impacts is a reality in today's world. Assumptions can change dramatically. Why should city planning be any different? I can look at alternative C and some of the end results that San Mateo's population is expected to grow by 50% and that wonder how realistic that is. I therefore ask that city council direct staff to work on land use alternative A and B, drop land use alternative C and cap any buffer at 30%. That way staff can continue to provide broad planning alternatives to engage residents, businesses and city officials in robust debate as to the optimal future of our city while recognizing that we will need to reassess our plans along the way. Thank you. Um, okay, our next speaker is Martin. Martin, I've allowed you to talk. Uh, hi, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thanks to the staff and council members. I, I, I'm no fan of Measure Y, I, I'd vote against it every chance I get. Uh, and, but I wanna set aside that and just say, if, if, if alternative A really doesn't work, if you can't even fit the number of units, I feel it's better to just you know get that out on the table now. It's obviously gonna be uncomfortable given that Measure Y passed. Uh, I would just urge you just to address that full on right now uh, rather than you know if it takes longer to that for that to become known it's just taken up more of everyone's time and you know if i had voted for measure y and and it literally didn't work i feel like i'd want to know so i would just you know my personal opinions are definitely for more more housing more neighbors more people that can live here that's all kinds of housing that's not just market rate that's affordable as well but let's if if option a really isn't going to work why would we entertain it and i think it'd be i don't know how you could make a decision tonight on which ones to consider if you have incomplete information so i don't know that's my two cents and um thank you very much i appreciate it. it's a challenging situation to be in thank you martin next speaker is evelyn stivers Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Evelyn Stivers. I'm the Executive Director for Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. And um, we are also, we're very disappointed that Measure Y lost, even though it is narrow. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is Measure R failed. We weren't even able to get our own members interested in Measure R, um, primarily because they felt that it locked in exclusionary zoning. and. One thing that we heard from everyone, even people that voted for Y, is that they really care about affordable housing. So we need a land use alternative that looks at other areas in the city. Um, we don't want to be in a situation, it's, it's true we lost narrowly, but who is going to run the no on Y campaign again? I don't know if we're up for it. I don't know, I don't know if anyone else is up for it. And we don't want to be in a situation where we have to rewrite the entire general plan in five years after just doing a general plan because you, you can't find enough sites. The 50% buffer makes a lot of sense, but you need to find sites. One thing I think everyone agrees on is the study areas were not adequate. So please look for additional sites um, so we can have a Measure Y compliant plan, general plan that meets the arena cycle six, seven. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Evelyn. Um, next speaker is Doug Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, I'm going to switch and read. Um, I'm Doug Henderson. I live on North Grant Street in North Central San Mateo. I believe that the council's review of general plan housing alternatives reflect uh, among other concerns, the following concerns, which I expressed in a letter that was published in the San Mateo Daily Journal in uh, December. 
Uh, I don't see the level of analysis of potential housing units. I know there's much to be done, but here's what I said in my letter. Housing progress is possible after Measure Y passage. As the City Council moves forward with the general plan update, it is possible to accomplish a significant number of new housing opportunities without tearing down our city. Draft regional housing needs allocation numbers from the ABAG for 2023-2031 are 60, it was then 6697 units as per the draft in October of 2020. Unknown to many, the state of California's elected leaders have mandated that the cities allow potentially one accessory dwelling unit and one junior accessory dwelling unit on each single family R1 zoned lot. This is outside the city's uh, review and purview uh, or limitations now. On December 3rd, the city's community development director responded to my inquiry through a city council member. The director stated, and I, I quote, there are 16,201 parcels that are zoned R1, end quote. The director indicated that theoretically 15,954 15, R1 lots could have both an, an accessory dwelling unit and a junior accessory dwelling unit and 38 could have only a junior accessory dwelling unit, end quote. Um, in my letter, I stated this totals a potential of 15,992 new units, which can be expected to be more affordable than traditional housing as they are less expensive to construct. So in my letter, I stated as, as the city updates the accessory dwelling unit ordinance in the coming year, the council must explore more, more proactive ways to facilitate and streamline accessory unit creation. This should be prioritized for 2021 through 2023 and beyond, and the city should immediately start publicizing this to all residents and local contractors. The city can provide housing to meet identified needs. I have a note in rereading my letter while waiting to speak tonight, I realized I think my calculation of total number of potential units in this manner is actually low. Uh, due to the state adopted housing unit mandates, there seems to be a potential for two additional units on nearly 16,000 single family zoned lots in the city, or a total of approximately 32,000 new housing units. But my final comment is where in the consultants and the staff analysis are these already mandated housing units that all of our neighborhoods may be experiencing uh, evaluated and figured into our uh, our draft? Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Henderson. Your time is up. Um, Adam Lorraine. Thank you, Council and staff. Uh, Adam Lorraine's, uh, I am a city commissioner, but I'm speaking uh, my own opinions tonight as a resident of 20 plus years. Uh, I appreciate this update. I, I would support the council consider adjusting the range of alternatives and project schedule. Uh, all the alternatives uh, now look suboptimal as, as we look upon them today. Uh, alternative A looks unlikely to meet our housing needs and alternatives B and C contradict uh, the recently passed Measure Y. So it'd be one thing if we could pick and choose between them uh, to come up with a preferred scenario, but this seems difficult given that these alternatives conflict in these different ways. Uh, so given that council and staff postponed the process partially to observe the impact of the election and perhaps even the draft reading numbers that we're looking at, and given how suboptimal the alternatives look now that we have waited, I, I, I think I would like to echo some of the previous public comments in saying that uh, I think we owe it to city residents to pursue, explore an alternative that meets Measure Y and our housing needs. Uh, and I, I'm not sure we, we, we have one of those yet. Uh, and so hopefully there's a, an opportunity to do so in a way that doesn't mess up our schedule too much. I, I think I'll leave it there, thanks. 
Thank you. Next is Adam and Carolina Nugent. Good evening, Mayor Rodriguez and city council members. The topic of the general plan is vitally important to the city and my neighborhood of North Central. At least four families live in a home next door to us. Some of these households are multi-generational. One of the families has a kindergartner. There wasn't enough room for him inside to do remote learning this winter, so he has been sitting outside his front door with his laptop. We owe him a future that has a place for him. The general plan is a way to do it. I'm advocating for the city council to relook at the study areas and take as broad and inclusive approach as possible. Measure Y is the law for our next housing element and half the general plan's lifespan of 20 years. While it's possible that it gets overturned in a future election, it is unwise to build a housing element and general plan that depends on that gamble. Lastly, we desperately need more low income housing in San Mateo. We're falling far short in the current housing element cycle, and we need even more in the coming years. We should set buffers based on the reasonable chance of development occurring. 50% was our buffer last time, and even that may not be enough for moderate and low income housing going forward, which requires zoning for at least 30 units per acre, I believe. 50% 50, 50 should be a minimum. The low hanging fruit has already been picked. We need to use our past housing inventory performance to guide the buffer we use in the future. That is state law. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Sarah Fields. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so my name is Sarah Fields. I am a resident of 19th Avenue Park. Um, and I just want to remind the council of a couple of things and also say thank you for accepting these arena numbers. You know, a lot goes into uh, concluding to these numbers. They're not just numbers thrown out um, for fun. I don't think ABAG does much uh, for fun. Um, there's thoughtful research that goes into them. And so I appreciate you accepting these numbers and working closely with staff to get to them. Um, so something about San Mateo County is before the pandemic, we had a 12 to one jobs to housing ratio. Um, I believe we might have gotten closer in this last year. I don't think that's a good thing. Um, COVID has taught us several things, including that um, there are ways in which we could live healthier. There's a lot of overcrowding. I live in um, an apartment building with five units. They're all one bedroom. It's mostly couples, but there is a family of six who lives in one of these units. It's a multi-generational family. Um, and living in close proximity to each other is good, that's density, but living in crowded conditions um, has a lot of health challenges as we've learned. So we have in San Mateo a real need for both market rate housing and affordable housing. If you take a look at rental listings and if you look at, at listings for homes and condos to purchase in San Mateo and you think about what it get, what you would need to get there, it is overwhelming. And we really owe it to the community to, to try to bring some of those numbers at least into balance. Um, as evidenced earlier in this very city council meeting, it is really hard to build here in San Mateo. There are a lot of challenges within construction. Um, this is a developed area. So wherever you build, you're gonna be next to a place where people live or work or both, probably both. Um, and so the need for that 50% buffer, buffer is very clear. It was made clear earlier this evening. So it needs to stay there. Um, the other reality of this is it is important for city budgets, for working with the county, for working with the state, for working with the federal government to adequately do long-term planning. We need to really make sure we're thinking to 2040, maybe even a little more than 2040 now that this project's been a little bit delayed. Um, and so the need to really do this long-term planning is so crucial. And so I hope that the council and the staff can continue and the community, council staff and the community can continue to work closely together to, to really build that vision for the future of San Mateo. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Brian Kiefer. Hello, uh, 
Um, thank you, Council and staff. Uh, my name is Brian Kiefer. I'm on the um, steering committee of Peninsula DSA, although I'm speaking as uh, on my individual behalf at this moment. And I'm also a homeowner in the um, North Central neighborhood. And, um, you know, I have to say some of the, what could maybe be termed fear mongering earlier, uh, sounds a little empty to me. I live in a neighborhood that's already R2 zoned. I have an apartment building at each end of my, um, at my block. And um, there's, you know, no, no problems uh, <laughs> in the character of the neighborhood. It's quite a nice place to live. Um, I would say, you know, I'd urge the city to uh, oppose uh, to not oppose the arena numbers and try to get involved in an expensive and time wasting um, battle with the state. I think that's ultimately going to be futile. Uh, other cities in the Bay Area have tried it to no avail. And um, that's just a big waste of, of time and money and, um, you know, resources. Uh, and I agree with uh, some of the earlier callers that um, just building a larger number of units, even market rate housing, is going to make all housing more affordable. This has already been shown um, in other cities and other markets. We definitely need more uh, affordable housing, um, but just building any units of housing right now is going to lower the cost for everybody. Uh, and then finally, uh, you know, agreeing with an earlier caller um, about the uh, neighborhoods that have been excluded from the um, from the plan. Um, that's historically been a hallmark of uh, redlining, which is a fairly racist uh, housing policy. And so I would urge that the uh, study areas would include the entire city and not, um, you know, especially exclude certain neighborhoods. Thank you. Madam Clerk, I just um, had a question about the timer. Um, are we having some issues with our timer? I just want to make sure that we're being fair to all of our students. Yes, I have the timer running in the background. I was trying to figure out how to turn off that video. I didn't know how that dragon got on the screen. So I neglected to sh sh share the timer. I apologize for that. No worries. I just wanted to make sure that everybody yeah. knew that they were still being cracked. All right, thanks. Yeah, it's still being cracked. I was focusing on something else. Our next um, speaker is Jonathan New. Hi, this is Jonathan New, and I'm a San Mateo homeowner. Uh, as always, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, you know, as other speakers have mentioned, I would also like to advocate for expanding the study areas uh, with our arena requirements, which we should definitely keep, and our measure Y limitations. Uh, something has to give, so we should really expand our study areas and explore single-family neighborhoods. Uh, personally, uh, I live next to an apartment, across from a duplex, really kind of among lots of different housing types. And it's totally fine. I, I really don't understand what the commotion's about. Uh, a diversity of housing options allows greater flexibility for people's changing needs. Uh, other cities are coming to the same conclusion. Uh, in fact, earlier today, Sacramento became the first city in California to ban single family zoning. And you know we need significantly more housing of every type, market and below market of all different densities. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. New. And then if we could, the next speaker is E. Powell. Hi, good evening, uh, Mayor Rodriguez and uh, council members. I'm Erica Powell. I live in uh, the central neighborhood. Um, and I actually uh, wasn't going to speak tonight, but I don't know. I feel like... Um, First of all, I just thought Ms. Uh, Herensberger and Ms. Jansen did a really nice job with the presentation. I think that's the kind of education that we need. Um, it was very clear, it was very concise. You obviously have a lot of work to do. And so I'm really, I'm feeling very confident about the people who are helping us, educating all of us to make you know good decisions. So thank you so much for your work. Um, uh, the thing, the second thing I wanted to talk about is just the fact that I'm feeling a little bit like, you know, some of the comments that are being made either by residents or by, you know, council members is that we're, we're not, we're not being very inclusive. And so, um, and I agree, I think inclusivity is really key in making decisions for the entire city. And so I'm hoping that we are going to be inclusive in the future. 
Um, I think that this is an iterative process, and I think the, the planners, the planners that are working on this, know that <clears throat> an iterative process, it's you know, it, it can be difficult. It can be hard. You have to have those hard dis discussions. But we, you know, if we have go through this iterative process, we're going to have, we should be able to converge in a, in a way that <clears throat> meets all the community's needs and desires um, within our legal, you know, um, boundaries. So. All in all, I'm feeling pretty confident um, about where this is going. Um, I also want to just say it's not we and them. It's not measure Y and measure R. It's, it re we really need to stop doing that. Stop. Let, please, let's just stop talking about we and they and them and us. Can we just be neighbors? Can we just try to, we all have good intentions. Can we just be nice to each other and move on? I really, really would appreciate that. And then the last thing is, um, even though uh, um, I think in the future, if there's a resident that speaks that is also working for a developer, they should say that when they announce themselves. Because otherwise, I think what they're saying is not really representing, um, is misrepresenting who they are. So thank you so much for the time. Thank you. And our next speaker is Keeler. Uh, Keeler, please unmute yourself. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, hello. I am a lifelong San Mateo resident, and I speak to you as someone who grew up in a family who were tenants and lived with housing insecurity for most of my life. Uh, I am personally of the opinion that we need to look at the entirety of San Mateo for study, especially now in the aftermath of Measure Y, which can have limits in the current study sites, although that should not be the main reason of why like this kind of concentration should be avoided. Opening more areas for study doesn't mean necessarily like massive overdevelopment at every corner, but it does mean treating our housing crisis as something that we must all be in together. Our current form where development is limited to specified pocketed sites, it creates a burden on those often poorer and marginalized areas among us that could otherwise be spread evenly across our city, which has more than enough room to comfortably fit more neighbors. It's been obvious that we do need housing. We also need public and affordable housing policy, tenant protections, many other things, but it starts with needing more homes and we can't get anywhere while we keep opposing that. It leads to overcrowding and homelessness. I've dealt with the overcrowding. I like options that can maximize more homes built in our city. And I hope the council can keep in mind that the smartest way for us to grow is to grow. So thank you. Thank you, Kuehler. And next speaker is uh, Kelsey Baines. Please unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, uh, City Council. My name is Kelsey Baines. I'm with Peninsula for Everyone. We are a pro-housing advocacy group. We push for more homes at all income levels, better transportation choices, and protecting renters. Um, and I would like to encourage you to expand the study area to study um, increasing housing choices citywide. I think that um, the city council and staff are in a tight spot right now due to the passage of Measure Y, um, which kind of has hamstrung your efforts here with the housing element and the general plan. Um, but I think the overarching theme should be that housing is a human right. Everyone deserves access to a safe, healthy, stable home. Um, and it's really unacceptable that we have so many neighbors right now who are living in cars or in overcrowded conditions or in any kind of substandard housing. Uh, so we need all neighborhoods to step up and all neighborhoods to take responsibility for um, making room for more neighbors and for more homes. Um, and I don't think any neighborhood should be exempt from change. Um, and I think this is particularly important um, in the goal and the law to to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, in this housing element cycle, for the first time ever, cities are going to have to submit a map to show where housing sites are located. And exempting wealthy white neighborhoods from change while concentrating change and growth in low-income communities of color um, it is likely to not fly. Um, 
And I, I heard a comment that we should be valuing quality over quantity. Um, and I do think quality is important, um, but in this situation, quantity matters. Um, that's, that's what we're going for here. Um, so the numbers matter here, both from a legal perspective and a moral perspective. We need more homes for more people. And uh, I think we can certainly have quality and maintain character. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that density and character aren't the same thing. A house can look exactly the same on the outside and have more homes on the inside. You could put in a wall and create a duplex and it could look exactly the same on the outside. Um, and I think my final comment will just be to, to point out and I, I would hope that staff can explain this later is that you can't count ADUs in the way that um, one resident described, you can't just say all the possible ADUs that could be built are going to be built. Um, you're only allowed to count, I believe, um, based on how many ADUs you've developed in the past. You can kind of project what is a realistic number of ADUs that is going to be developed during the housing element cycle. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you there. Our next speaker is um, Stephen Floor. Please unmute yourself, Stephen. Hey, thank you for the chance to speak. I'll keep it brief. Um, I agree earlier with calls for, for unity. You know, I think that we're a city that has people with different views. And I think that I might also echo comments that, you know, we, we agree that we need housing and especially affordable housing for the people who live in San Mateo. You know, going into the November election, there were two possible outcomes. There was one outcome where we would have development that's concentrated in some areas of the city that might be taller and denser than had been previously allowed. And there was another outcome where we restricted development to a less dense and shorter um, development, which would necessarily mean that to get the same number of units, you need more square footage on the ground. Um, and so I don't think that expanding the study areas into uh, other areas of the city is a punitive response. I think it's just a, a response to the fact that elections have consequences. And when you make changes to limit development in specified areas, you need to expand uh, study areas for further development. And so that's what I would ask tonight is um, to, in response to this limitation, I think we need to seriously consider expanding study areas throughout the city. Um, and I would also echo the, the previous comments about equity and fairness. Um, and being in this together as a community means that we shoulder um, some of the burdens of development that we heard about earlier tonight. Um, I wanted to make two other brief points, which is that, you know, Measure Y passed by an incredibly thin margin, and individuals who may have voted against Measure Y um, uh, may not live in San Mateo, like my son's kindergarten teacher who was commuting from Hayward until she moved to Philadelphia because she couldn't stand uh, that, that lifestyle anymore. And so when we look at projections like uh, Alternative C that has increases in San Mateo residents by 50%, um, that's really accounting for the jobs housing mismatch that's existed for a long time and has gotten um, substantially worse in the last 10 years. And it's really alarming that we would consider something like um, option A, where the jobs housing mismatch would continue to get worse. So, you know, the, the growth that's being reflected here is catching up with the growth that we should have been doing for a sustained period of time, which is growth that should be shared by all of San Mateo as a city, uh, working to together to, to address the critical housing crisis. And um, thank you for your time. Um. Thank you. And our next speaker is uh, Seema Patel. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hello. Thank you so much for the opportunity to give a comment. Um, my name is Seema. I am a resident of the Central Neighborhood and a homeowner. I also wanted to echo previous comments about the importance of um, our community and our city equally shouldering responsibility. Um, the previous comments about equity and inclusion. Um, I also wanted to echo previous comments about the importance of the 2040 plan, planning until 2040, and um, making sure that we consider not just cycle seven, but potentially beyond so that we're not having to revisit this plan um, every couple of years. And then as someone who's relatively new to the general plan process, um, and the housing allocation process, it's not clear to me how these options and how these numbers account for what uh, my understanding is decades of a jobs and housing um, imbalance. Um, I know that over the last decade, San Mateo County has built 
one new unit of housing for every 19 new jobs. And it's not clear to me if these options will remedy that deficit and then plan for future growth, or if we're not even gonna make up for that deficit um, with these numbers. And so I would um, request that maybe information about that could be added in your uh, community outreach communication so people can understand um, how we're not just planning for the future, but also making up for imbalances in the past. And then lastly, I would um, also echo previous comments that I think it's really important to accept these RENA calculations um, because I think that the um, severe disparity between supply and demand and job growth and housing growth um, is something that we need to address. And um, it's causing major quality of life problems in our community and I think we need to fix it. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Okay, uh, next speaker is Tasso Zalagras. Tasso, I please. Yeah, good afternoon, good evening. I was gonna say good afternoon. Good evening, uh, Mayor Rodriguez and council members. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I could hear from the discussions uh, about the general plan, how uh, the various options and how difficult it is to um, meet the arena numbers. And I appreciate the work that's been done by um, folks during the, uh, during the time we've been in a COVID sort of lockdown restriction and haven't been able to do any kind of community um, sessions to review the data. Um, and, you know, we are a diverse community and uh, I think we all want more housing and more affordable housing. Um, I know I do. Um, the question is how best to do it in a uh, sustainable way. And given the challenges of trying to um, accommodate the arena numbers, some of us are considering a residence uh, effort to push back on ABAG on the arena numbers. Um, and so we're doing our own homework uh, with the calculations that RENA has done and how they've made their allocations to do a, a residence uh, sort of a team initiative push back on RENA numbers at ABAG. And then we want to get more details. So we want to accept the, uh, the outcomes that you have presented today. But we want to look at all the details that uh, came to those conclusions. So we'll probably be doing a, a public records request for all the data so that the team that's looking at the housing numbers uh, here in the city can evaluate um, how those decisions came about. And we can also use that information as we try to push back on ABAG on those RENA numbers. And then hopefully then we can align the RENA numbers to what we can um, inclusively and equitably and smartly uh, sustain um, in our city uh, general plan. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Jordan Grimes. Good evening, Council Honorable Mayor. Uh, Jordan Grimes, 19th Avenue Park. I will try to keep this brief. I'd just like to start by saying I'm very glad to see the general plan back on the agenda. And I'd like to thank staff for providing us with such a comprehensive presentation. While it is disappointing, of course, that San Mateo voters chose, though very narrowly, to authorize another decade of racism, classism, and exclusion via Measure Y, we still thankfully have state law, the arena, and the housing element process to keep us on track. I would note that it's all but assured that in the next few years, state laws will alter these plans and unlike Measure Y, will help to ensure housing abundance in San Mateo. As to the alternatives, I'm not sure, uh, excuse me, I'm sure it will come as no surprise that I support alternative C, which would provide the highest amount of new housing. However, I really want to advocate for a blended approach that also re-examines the study areas, which absolutely need to be reevaluated. Single family home neighborhoods must be considered for upzoning, not just duplexes and triplexes, but for small apartment buildings as well. This is not only an issue of meeting state requirements, but is a deeply important issue to further equity in our city. Thank you. Okay, uh, next speaker is Carol Steinfeld. Hi. 
I've never heard it explain why there are specific, uh, specific study areas in this general plan. I've never seen that in my previous community's master plans. Uh, and wasn't it mentioned at a meeting in 2019 that the general plan is not just about housing. So I just went to the website and I see our general plan website identifies the general, or it says that a general plan identifies, quote, where housing, businesses, industry, open space, schools, civic buildings, and other land uses will be located uh, and density intensity of use. So for that reason alone, the whole city should be studied. Um, right now, this looks just like a specific plan. Um, and so we really need to expand the study area to be the entire city and perhaps also discuss the value of so-called middle housing, which is duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, the value of diversity of housing. I know my neighbors uh, in Baywood are sad that their kids can't afford to live here. Thank you. And our next speaker is Nicole Fernandez. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicole Fernandez. I'm a commissioner here in San Mateo. Um, I just wanted to start off with, uh, as we celebrated the birth of Martin Luther King yesterday, I just want to give a quote. We may all have come on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. We are all a city. We are all one entity, and we have to make housing for those who want to, who are in our communities already and who want to stay here in the long term. Um, I'm a homeowner in North Central. I'm a commissioner, but I speak as a citizen today. And I think that um, the study uh, the study points should be the whole city, including uh, any areas that can, are currently single family zoned. Um, I live in a multifamily housing. It's a wonderful experience. It brings diversity. It maintains diversity. Our community is better for it. And I hope that you will, um, I hope you will consider putting the whole city on the table. Thank you so much. And I believe those are all the speakers. Okay. Thank you to all of our speakers. And we'll bring it back uh, to city council. Um, do we have any one that would like to kick things off? So we have no comments from city council. Okay, that might be a first. I, I uh, oh. happy to comment. Deputy Mayor Bonilla, please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I want to say that I really do belong to the uh, clan that feels that we should heal the divide and try and respect and trust each other um, and I'll talk more about that later under another item. But that said, we're all entitled to our own opinions, our own thoughts, our own beliefs. <clears throat> uh, I have worked long and hard on this arena cycle, and I probably have a much better understanding of how it got to be what it is. And um, uh, by the way, I do actually resent some comments that were made earlier. Sorry. But um, uh, uh, it's a very thoughtful process, and it's intended to take into account a huge list of needs, which I can describe with five words, but, but it, behind all of them are huge things, right? So it has to do with, first, providing adequate housing for all of the people who live or work here who need housing. I mean, just on the face of it, we have future generations, right? When we were doing Bay Meadows, I was on that committee way back in 2001. Um, when we got to the end of that three year plus process, one, I think the major factor that, that convinced people to support it after much back and forth and two organized groups opposing it and everything else um, was the fact that people wanted their kids and grandkids to be able to live somewhere near them. Right. Um, so that said, even just that argument alone call, calls for more and for affordable housing. Um, 
So we need a general plan that takes us through 2040. Um, and we need to account for growth that I have to say, you know, it's eight years, 10 years from now, actually, the arena cycle seven. But we have very smart people who this is what they do as their profession, right? They're skilled professionals who look at and make these projections. They build these models. They run these things. COVID was taken into account. The current uh, uh, situation with people working from home is not going to stay static uh, forever because many employers do like to see their employees' faces at work. Not every single employer is running to Texas um, or any other Florida kind of place. Um, so that said, um, we also have an eviction crisis looming, and I think we may be talking about that later too. So there's a, here's a question about economic difficulties, and here are the five things that Rena and, and Plan Barrier 2050 are really built on. So it's housing, transportation, economy, environment, and equity. And that's really what morally all cities are expect to look at when they think about planning our future. Um, I didn't join the union because I was just looking for the best deal. I joined it because it was a place where you got some respect as a worker. You were on the other side of the table from the owner. I know what you're talking about. The developer is the owner. Believe me, they don't just get their way around here. Okay? They say what they want, but they end up getting what's approved or not. They can take it or leave it. Um, they don't control the city council or me. Um, so that said, I think the uh, alternative one is really a waste of time. Um, and I would like to see us go forward with studying alternatives two and three. And further, like I have always said from the beginning of this process, I really believe we need to look at and study the entire city. There are many changes that can be made um, that aren't going to be huge changes in everybody's face but they can be made and collectively they'll make a difference. Okay, those are my comments, thanks. So, so Deputy Mayor um, Bonilla, I wanted, I should have done this before and I apologize. Um, can we get slide number uh, 17 up um, with the three questions for council that, that can kind of help guide this conversation a little bit. Make sure you, they make sure staff gets all the information they need from council. Okay. Um, did you, Deputy Mayor Bonilla, do you want to maybe just, I, I think you touched on all these, but just succinctly kind of summarize what you're, what you're thinking? So the answer to one is no. I think we should drop alternative one and look at two and three. Um, uh, consider adjusting the range of alternatives. Yeah, I think um, the range of alternatives um, is I think we have I like two and three, and, and I'd like to see studies performed on those options. Um, the project schedule, I, don't, I think it's early to try and uh, decide whether we need to uh, adjust that or not. Um, and do I have, well, the additional direction, okay, is I think we should look at the entire city, okay? And um, like I say, we should try and do it inclusively as possible with all voices at the table, which I have always said, and I really mean. So um, thank you for the time. Thank you. I saw um, Council Member Gothel's hand up next. So in my mind, there are two questions being asked. One is, do we need more growth at all? Um, and to that, some residents say no, and I think Many of us who see the jobs housing imbalance understand that we do need more housing. And so the question then becomes, if we need more housing, if we're going to build more housing, if we're gonna to try to reach our, our arena numbers, where do we put it? And I have always wanted to concentrate the housing close to transit. I've always wanted to put it close to our train stations, uh, in our transit corridor, close to El Camino. I think that that is where it is best served rather than um, 
spreading it out all over the city. And, and to me, that's what R represented, was concentrating the growth close to our transit. Um, my answer to number one is that we should go forward with the three alternatives. Um, in this, uh, in the current environment with measure Y, uh, we have to look at these three alternatives and see what we're able to build and, and how close we can get to our arena numbers and how big of a buffer we can get. Um, I would stick with the current range of alternatives uh, and I don't have any additional direction. I think this is what we're stuck with and we have to, to do the best we can with it. Um, I don't think we need to open it up to the whole city to study uh, junior units and ADUs. Those are gonna happen, it's state law. We've effectively, at a state level, I don't know that there is any single family zoning anymore. Um, I don't know how we put into our housing element the uh, junior units and ADUs and predict what level of success we're gonna have building those. Uh, but I don't think that we need to include all of our single family neighborhoods in our study areas in order to, to capture that. Uh, so I would stick with what we have. Uh, I think we have to and see what we can get Uh, Council Member Pepin. You're on mute, Council Member Pepin. Twice. Okay, that's twice in one meeting. Third time I'm out. I apologize. Um, I say welcome to the general plan. This is where we wanted it to happen. Any planner that's worth a grain of salt tells you not to do it at the ballot box. Let's get to the general plan. I concur with Council Member Gothels. Um, uh, I, let's take up the current ranges. I, I, what was explained to me in the report um, by staff was that you can draw from certain parts. You're not necessarily, you know, you don't have to go all alternative A, that you might wanna see alternative A maybe in one area, or you might wanna see more of alternative C uh, over in Bridgepoint, you know, whatever it may be, you can pluck from each one. So I, I let's, let's put the ranges through the grist in the general plan. And that's what I'd like to see happen. So that would answer number one, yes, number two, no. And I don't have anything else to add. Okay, I'm not seeing a hand up from Council Member Lee, so I can chime in while she's thinking. Um, I mean, my I I basically ditto on the the previous uh, two comments. Uh, I think that I think it's important to just reiterate that we still need a lot of information here. To we need staff to have their time to figure out just how viable these various options are. And, and I'm hoping that, that once these options comes out that we can begin the general plan process and I take um, SMERG leadership at, at their word that, that we are gonna be able to, to work on this as a community and, and look at um, places where we can compromise, um, making sure that all of the all of the values that we all care about very strongly are, are taken into account. And, and I'm hoping that this is the general plan that we've, we've been talking about, the process we've been talking about. And, uh, and I'm really hoping that we can strike the right compromise because I, I think that this, these are the, the, three, um, the three alternatives that we're kind of going with and and I'm I, I'm a little bit I, I'm I'm nervous about scenario number one A. Uh, I I think that I think that that's going to be very difficult to achieve. Um, I I want to see the data. I, I I'm just from my my hunch is it's going to be very difficult to achieve and do it right. And that's going to mean that if we're going to do it right, we're going to need some compromises some places. So um, I'm I'm optimistic. Uh, and I'm hopeful, um, but I'm I'm also cautious on here. So we're moving forward. So those are, um, and the answer number three, uh, no, I don't have any additional directions or have other concerns other than what I just stated. So, um, 
I'm not seeing Councilmember Lee. If she maybe she doesn't have any comments. I have comments. Okay. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I need to see your virtual hand, or else I can't. You're off. It's, it keeps disappearing. So. <laughs> um. So, um, you know, I. I've always said that I don't think any any person or any um, any neighborhood should be exempt from change, and that um, and that we do need to move forward together as a city, and um, and that that is um, you know this is the the fight of our life to to build a future together, um, and many of us are on on different sides, but this is the time that we need to come together, and. Um, and that means sometimes hashing it out, and um, and we're going to differ on ideas and approaches, and um, and have to seek compromise. One of the reasons that I didn't support um, Measure R is because I felt a deep discomfort with the fact that they did not squarely align with the um, the study area map, and that it left out key areas that I felt were important and had been determined by the community as a whole. Um, that that were are important to our economy and um and so i i am in favor of moving forward with studying all of um all of the scenarios a b and c um for me the the you know the rena cycle seven is a huge variable and um and i i want to um you know, I, I think it's prudent to approach it with sort of, um, you know, a, a low, medium, high estimate of what um, what our our seven cycle could be, and um, and maybe that means that we end up in some sort of um, intermediate. Uh, place between you know drawing on some of the components of of all of of the um, the scenarios, so uh, you know that that's a possibility. Um, in terms of number two, um, I I don't I don't see a need to adjust the range except that to say that I I want to make sure that we're accounting for a broad range of potential options in cycle seven. And then number three, I think that, um, you know, measure why is the law of the land? I, I do think that it does, uh, it, it does force us to look at what a seventh cycle under um, the constraints of measure Y would be. Um, I don't think that we should, um, we should move forward assuming that um, Smurg is going to, um, it, you know, is going to let it sunset without another campaign. And so I think that it is prudent to to think about what um, what meeting Rena Cycle Seven could be under the constraints of Measure Y. I think that that is worth studying, and I think that that could require an expansion of the um, of the study area map. So, but I, at this point, I don't know if this is a decision point that needs to be made. Um, I, you know, I think that it's possible that we move forward with what we, where we are um, with the, the current scenarios and, um, and see where that gets us through the evaluation process. Okay, thank you. So what I'm hearing, just to sum up, I'm hearing four council members that are comfortable with, pretty much comfortable with, with um, the proposed plan that staff presented to us and uh, another council member, um, Deputy Mayor Bonilla, that's comfortable, but would also like to, um, you know, expand a, another a scenario to to all of San Mateo. Is that, does that feel like properly captures things? And does staff feel like they have all the information they need? Yes. All right. We'll move on. Thank you. Through the mayor, if I could, a point of order. Um, your council rules um, inform that when you hit 11 o'clock, you stop and get concurrence on moving forward. And I just wanted to um, let you know we've blown through 11 and there's still seven remaining items on this agenda. So just you should take a moment and um, figure out how you want to handle that. Yeah, I'd like to um, ask the uh, city manager what he, what he thinks about um, the rest of our agenda and 
if anything makes sense to push anything off. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, the next item will be very quick, uh, under two minutes um, in terms of the presentation. Um, item 19 should be, should be fairly quick as well. Um, item 20, um, I think could be pushed. I don't think it's time sensitive, but I do think people are probably here to, to comment on that item. Uh, items 21 and 22 are ordinance introductions, so they've been widely noticed and they also may have people uh, here uh, for them. Um, or excuse me, tw uh, 21, again, uh, is not excessively time sensitive, but we have been, we have noticed it widely um, that uh, for people to uh, attend. Uh, the one item that I think could be pushed uh, is item 24, the mid-year budget update. Um, alternatively to doing that tonight, we could lead off the Blue Sky Workshop with, with the mid-year bud budget update to set the context. Um, you know, the, the one I think slight downside to that is that I know that for Thursday's State of the City event that there are a few finance related slides, um, but I don't think that that would make a huge impact either way if, if we wanted to push that item and send Rich home. Okay, who went to send Rich home? No. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I would, I personally would be in favor of moving that, that last item to to make things more reasonable this evening do, how do other council members feel about that is it rich already home <laughs> no, he, he came in tonight it's a good bed okay so we're good there and and then your recommendation is uh drew that we that we go, go through everything else or yes based on what we've noticed i think we try to push through um, okay. because i know people are here to to hear those those items any any objections to that? All right, thank you, Madam Clerk, for that notice. And we're moving on to item number 18, COVID-19 update number 23, and consideration for letter of support bills. Yes, and I, this will be a very brief item. Okay, so um, just very briefly, we are uh, remain under the regional stay home order. We've been that way since December 18th. Uh, the only operational update I wanted to make tonight was that um, the fields at Los Prados, Bayside, Joinville, and King have been closed for the past three weekends to try to avoid large gatherings. Uh, at this point, we're still assessing um, the weekend reopening plans. Um, we're trying to uh, you know balance. Uh, being able to reopen, reopen with it, with being able to do so safely and without gathering large crowds. So we will keep the community updated uh, as we continue to assess that. Uh, the other item on this particular update is the consideration of support for Assembly Bills 15 and 16. Uh, AB 15 would extend um, eviction protections uh, for tenants unable to pay rent due to the pandemic. And AB 16 uh, provides a framework for debt for addressing rent debt to provide relief to both tenants and landlords. Um, and if council is interested in supporting uh, these assembly bills, uh, council could direct staff to write a letter to the assembly on behalf of the mayor, which we could do this week and, and get sent off. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, do we have any questions from council? I'm not seeing any hands okay so i will open up public comment oh, oops sorry we have one uh two public comment uh, let's see jordan grimes hi uh good evening again council speaking uh now on this item both uh for myself and on behalf of one san mateo we just want to express our thanks for your consideration uh, of support for Assembly Bills 15 and 16. We hope you'll decide to move forward with them, uh, uh, to move forward with a letter to that effect. So AB 3088, the previous eviction moratorium bill passed last year, expires in just a week and a half. While there are a number of efforts underway to address this, the most comprehensive by far is AB 15, which would extend protections through the end of 2021. It's an unfortunate reality that we are still living under these conditions, but this is where we are. 
given the sluggishness of the vaccine rollout, um, we're still months away from any kind of substantial reopening and keeping people housed during that time really is quite literally a matter of life and death. Moreover, this also gives a new, more sympathetic and uh, responsible federal administration time to address things at a higher level. We understand that small property owners need relief as well, which is why we're supporting both AB 15 and AB 16. So we thank you for your time and hope you'll express uh, the council's support to the legislature for both of these bills. Okay, and Adam Lorraine. Good evening, council and staff. Adam, the 20 plus year resident, just uh, essentially concurring with everything Jordan Grimes just said. Thank you. Okay, and then Michael Weinauer. Evening, agreeing 100% <laughs> with Adam Lorraine and, and unbelievably Jordan Grimes. 100% uh, of what he just said uh, that we should extend these protections and allow the more competent administration about to take power, God willing, um, these things should be extended. So thank you. Those are all the speakers we have. Oh, no, we have a, a new oh. Kyle Cruz. I wanted to agree as well with the prior speakers entirely. We should send the letter of support for both bills. Thank you. There are no other speakers, Mr. Mayor. You're on mute, Mr. Mayor. Oh. Can't go go through this once without that happening to me. No, I, I just want to say I appreciated the the commenters brevity the commenters brevity on that. Um, that's how you do it. I, and um, I want to bring this back to council. And I see uh, I saw the uh, council member Pappin's hand up first. Um, yeah, so I just, um, I think this should be at the state level accompanied by money. The one thing that I might ask be um, added to the letter, if it's okay with my uh, colleagues here, is to um, encourage the, the state to include the banks on this, because I think the banks have to start giving some relief or continue to give relief as well. So if we could just add that to part of the, to, as a, a provision in the letter of support, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Great. I agree. Okay, and Deputy Mayor Bonilla, you were. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to just add a little flesh to the bones here. Uh, did a little uh, statistic research this afternoon because if you think about it, if people get evicted, they're going to be in shelters or they'll be on the street. Okay, either place is not good considering we're in the middle of a pandemic. So I looked up some numbers. Today, national cases of COVID today, 95,000. California, 23,000. So bear in mind that we're only 12% of the population of this country, but in terms of cases, 25%, right? So that means we're a little worse off than the country overall. And we don't want to have, I think, people in, in super spreader shelters, right? Where they're gonna then go to work. Uh, at the restaurant where they're fixing the food that Uber's going to bring over to your house tonight. Okay, we definitely don't want that. Um, the evictees, like I said, many of them have jobs, uh, so forth. Cases, I think, would skyrocket if we don't do something to keep roofs over people's heads. So I definitely support uh, writing a letter, and I can support what uh, uh, Council Member Pappen added. Thank you. Oh. Also, I'd like to make sure that we send a copy to our state senator, Josh Becker, um, so that he can be aware of uh, our position too. Okay, um, I concur with my fellow council members. Are there any final comments? Uh, Drew, do you need anything else from us? No, thank you. Okay, great. Um, moving right along to new business. Uh, item number 19, continued from January 4th, 2021 meeting, 123 Waters Park subdivision, final map approval. 
And we have a staff presentation, I believe. Welcome, Tracy. Uh, one moment. It's my first time sharing in a city council meeting. So far, so good. So far, so good. All right. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. My name is Tracy Scramalia, and I'm a senior engineer in public works. Um, I'll be conducting a very quick presentation tonight um, on the approval of the final map for waters. Uh, typically, our final maps are on uh, the consent, um, but this evening, because of the appeal, it was moved to, to new business. Oops, I skipped way far ahead. Oh, now I've gone. Okay, what is going on? Sorry about that. All right. So, um, background. So, the City Council uh, approved the original project um, Wait, back. Do you, do you have a slide that you want us to see? Oh no, did it stop sharing? I apologize. I don't know if it ever was sharing. Oh, you you never saw my, okay. All right, uh, let's see, apologize. Just the green share screen button should work. Hmm. Sharing before. You, you guys are not seeing the presentation? No. Apologize. Okay, showing that it's sharing. I can't get this to work. I'll just wing it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, one more time. I think we've all read the staff report. If you want to just maybe. <laughs> Here we go. Can you see it now? No. Still can't see it. Oh. oh, there you go. Ah, oh, all right. All right. I'm so sorry. Um, let me return back to the presentation. So um, the City Council approved the project in February 2019. And then there was a modification um, that was uh, heard and approved by Planning Commission in October uh, two uh, 2020. Uh, the developer filed the final map in 2020. Uh, there is a subdivision improvement agreement required for this map because they are um, doing the map first before the improvements. And the CCNRs um, will be uh, reviewed and um, approved prior to the, um, the project's uh, completion. So with that very brief presentation, I apologize. Um, I am recommending adoption of a resolution to approve the final map and approve the subdivision improvement agreement uh, for the Waters Park development, creating the 27 single family residential units and the 163 residential condominium units and authorize the acting public works director to sign the agreement and substantially the form presented. And with that concludes my very brief presentation. It took longer for me to get to share it than it was to actually present it, so I apologize. That's okay. It was a great presentation. Um, do we have any questions from council? I'm not seeing any. Uh, I'd like to open up public comment. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have a, two speakers. The first speaker, Loriana Sujo Diaz. Um, I, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, so I'm back. And I don't think I can share my screen, um, but I'll explain to you what I'm looking at. And then um, without a problem, um, I can go ahead and send this over to you. Um, back on January 11th, we had communication with Tracy who just presented, thank you. And we voiced as a neighborhood a concern about one of the maps that was presented in the package. Um, I believe it's page 22, but you, you know, Tracy, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, it is the only map in this package that does share all of the neighbors' homes. After clarification, it was brought to uh, our attention by Tracy, um, who got the information confirmed from the city attorney that names are not required. Um, we voiced privacy issues. Um, with this information and knowing that it is not a requirement in order for you to pass this, 
Um, I'm requesting that City Council strike this document from the package, that it does not move forward with recording this as a public document and that you replace it with a map without the names. Um, that's the first request. Um, and then I also want to make public um, a list of uh, more than 10 ongoing violations within the last 48 hours of, um, of today. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to run through them. And like I said, I'll follow up with the presentation that you can't see. Um, Violation uh, condition approval one requires a barrier along um, north to south of the US 101. Um, that is not there, has not been there. Um, and then we have condition 21, we have the sound barrier. Um, it is required and it should be above the existing fence, not below. Um, we have violation 23. Uh, it does not allow for any signage and along 101, you will find Pulte signage. Um, I'll continue. We've already talked about the vector control. We've kind of killed that one into the ground. Uh, violation 38, it does require surveillance. The first sentence says the project shall install and operate for the life of the project a video surveillance system. These are all conditions that we've voiced about being violated and they still have not been rectified. Approval, um, condition of approval 56, huge violations. Um, approval condition 56, 52, 82. Um, I will go ahead and file the complaint with all pertinent par parties so that everybody in public works and code enforcement can follow up with them. And then I want to make sure that the city council sees uh, the previous uh, violations, current violations. Um, and that you, you know, help us out like you said you would in uh, the previous hearing. Thank you. The next speaker is Gregory Powers. You're still on mute. There you go. Gregory. There we go. Hi, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, Greg Powers with Jackson Titus, Land Use Council for Pulte Homes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Uh, just to respond to Ms. Diaz, and yes, I'm still here too, <laughs> and you are too. Uh, just wanted to say that, um, first of all, we've I think we've beaten that, that topic to death. And uh, so I'm not going to reopen anything that we discussed before. As far as the map goes for tonight, um, I'm sure the city attorney has advised you uh, that a final map, as long as it substantially conforms to the tentative track map uh, based on your municipal code, um, to the opinion of the city, city engineer and community development director is a ministerial act. So we're hoping that it's treated that way and that the final map is approved tonight. And uh, I will leave it at that unless you have questions for me. Thank you very much. It looks like it's it, Madam Clerk. Um, yes, that's it. Okay, I will close public comment, and bring it back to council. Do we have any comments or I will entertain a motion. I would make a motion to approve. And for that, for the record, record that's the staff's recommendation. Yes, I would make a motion to approve the staff's recommendation. Yes, thank you. Second. Hey, it's been motions been made and seconded. Madam Clerk, can you please call? Yes, us? sir. Yes, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Yes. Councilmember Gothels. Yes. Councilmember Pappen. Yes. Council yes. Member Lee. Yes. And Mayor Rodriguez. Yes. Carried 5 0. Great. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to item number 20 report on Housing Leadership Council post election event. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of Council. I'll be making this presentation tonight. I do, I do not have a PowerPoint uh, slideshow for this. It should be brief. So at your last meeting, uh, 
the day of your last meeting, the council received several emails claiming that three members of the council had attended a secret closed door meeting with developers and housing advocates to discuss the results of the recent election and the passage of Measure Y. The claims related to a post-election event held by the Housing Leadership Council. These emails came as somewhat of a surprise to the city staff and the council. The event was well publicized and appeared to be open to anyone wanting to attend. In addition, while only three members of the council were scheduled to speak at the event, all five members did attend. These emails plus a complaint received by a resident who claimed to have been denied access to the meeting prompted the city council to direct staff to find out if members of the public may have been excluded from the event, and if so, how and why. In response to this direction, I spoke with two members of HLC staff and two individuals who claimed to have been denied access to the HLC event. Through these conversations, I was able to establish the following facts. One, the event was well publicized and intended to be open to the public. This was substantiated by the fact that over 100 attendees registered for the event. And two, on the day before the event, the HL staff HLC staff person organizing the event noticed two individuals known as persons who supported Measure Y who had registered for the event. The staff member canceled their registration for the event. And this information was not shared with the members of the city council. These facts show that there was no reason for the council to know that the members of the public were denied access to the event and the, the meeting did appear to be well publicized and open to the public. In addition, the person registering the complaint requested that the city council provide, I'm sorry, the city provide him with a recording of the event so that he could see what transpired. HL staff, HLC staff agreed to provide access to the recording to the city, which was forwarded to the complainant. In addition, HLC has posted a recording of the event on YouTube to allow access to anyone wishing to see it. And I checked this morning, as of this morning, over 130 people had, had, had viewed it. So that concludes the presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Do we have any questions from City Council? I'm not seeing any hands. Um, I'd like to open up public comment. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I have three hands in the air. First, I'm going to um, Tasso, if you want to unmute. Thank you, uh, Mayor Rodriguez and council members. And I also extend my thanks to City Clerk Patrice Holds and City Attorney Sean Mason for their professionalism. I respect the, our democratic process and the will of my fellow residents. As City Council members, each of you serves in a governance capacity, a result of a fair election process. When each of you ran your respective campaigns, it was the collective voice of voters who put their trust in you to equi equitably serve all residents. And whether people voted for you or not, there is an expectation that each of you will serve all residents in a balanced, fair, inclusive, open, and transparent manner. I want to know that my city council will represent me equally and inclusively with all who live in the city, and that the council will fully support the will of the people when the democratic process delivers an outcome, whatever that outcome may be. Imagine for a moment if, shortly if, after each of you were elected to office, that a contingent of folks decided to meet and discuss plans to actively work on ways to oust you from the office you had just won in a fair election, seeking to undo the will of the people. Would any of you see this as a good thing? Would you see this as fair, respectful, with the democratic process, with the voice of voters? I would think not. I appreciate the city's action to get the HLC December 9 meeting tape recording link released to me directly. And I have heard few others have been given this video link as well. While I am an advocate member of the HLC, I have not yet heard from them directly about this matter since my last communication with them in December. After recently watching the tape recording of the HLC December 9 meeting, I was disappointed and disheartened to see city council members there at the meeting 
where active discussions took place about sitting housing policy, thoughts on how to undo the recent election results, this is my opinion, and how to control the general plan process outcomes. I believe others should see the tape and judge their own, make their own judgment. I believe this act was a damaging effect on the public trust of the city council. The city council cannot govern effectively without public trust. My complaint of a presumed perceived Brown Act violation was intended to ensure that we protect that public trust. It is sacred. I want city council members to uphold a high bar standard for a general, general plan process that is inclusive, fair, open, and transparent. Given that a majority of the city council attended this HLC December 9 meeting and that the public trust relies on transparency, I strongly urge the city council to vote to make this tape recording link available to the public, not just to me, and by making it known here tonight and by formally including it in tonight's city council meeting minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tasso. Our next speaker is Lisa Tanner. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, thank you for staying awake this long. Um, I am speaking on behalf of myself and um, Council Member Gothels, Benia, and Lee. Regardless of whether your staff finds any Brown Act violations this evening, there was certainly a violation of public trust. I watched the HLC video of the meeting where you spoke, and I'm almost at a loss to find words for the situation. I don't know what's worse, your pride in being part of a coalition that is obviously not representative of tens of thousands of San Mateans, or the fact that you are breaking the hearts of your constituency. Your actions have wounded us, and these are just the actions we know about. Councilmember Bonilla, when you campaigned, you promised to work hard for the neighborhoods. Councilmember Lee, when you campaigned, you spoke of your ability to bring people together. Councilmember Gothels, just 10 days ago, you stated that the public trust is very important, and yet here we are. You can only operate in the darkness for so long, and if a picture is worth a thousand words, how many words is this HLC video worth? I guess at least as many as you'll be hearing from the residents <laughs> who've also viewed it. While I fully expect that your coalition will come to your defense and push for business as usual, I want you to consider this. All San Mateans should consider this. We haven't just lost our faith and trust in you, you removed it. How can you fix that? How can we begin to move forward from this to think that we can work collaboratively on a general plan process that is committed to serving the residents, the residents of the city of San Mateo? Also, if you can't do right by your constituency at the city level, what can we expect when you run for higher office? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Next um, speaker is Kyle Cruz. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. During this meeting, Council Member Benia discussed expanding areas of study for the general plan. The last time residents heard the phrase expanding areas of study from council members, it meant studying single family home neighborhoods for upzoning. And there was a strong reaction from the public, which is why I, that's one of the reasons why I feel it was so inappropriate for this meeting to have denied people access. This was such a hot button issue that Diane Pappen stated on her council campaign trail that she would protect R1 neighborhoods from upzoning. Some council members accepted gifts from the meeting organizer, a pro-development advocacy group. Notably, council members Gothels and Bonilla accepted multifamily gingerbread houses that per the meeting organizer would quote unquote, look good in Baywood. While I believe the organizer made the statement jokingly, it seriously appears like the decision to upzone single family homes in San Mateo is being made without public criticism and outside the public view in the sense that people are being denied access to these meetings. And that's not appropriate. Irrespective of the final outcome, of the general plan process, San Mateans deserve to have honest leadership throughout the process. I hope that our council can live up to the standards set by Mayor Rodriguez last week when he stated that the council values transparency. At this point, I'm not so sure that the council does value transparency. I'm not sure if that's the truth because the actions have shown somewhat to the otherwise because I don't think people that are on this meeting realize that they took gifts from the Housing Leadership Council. 
until I stated it publicly, right? I don't think that that's something that necessarily people know, but I guess that it's aware now. Thank you for the time to speak. Okay, next speaker is Erica Powell. Good evening. Um, thank you, uh, Patrice, for the introduction. Um, I spoke to Mason uh, briefly, not too long ago. I expressed my concerns about uh, speaking um, in public. Um, I have been uh, attended some meetings in the past and I've had family members and I've had friends attend meetings and at least actually last year and been disrespected. And so, um, you know, when certain council members didn't agree with, with them. And so that's why I was afraid, but I'm here. And um, he directed me to, you know, well, I told him that I was wanted to see, you know, uh, the writing about violating the Brown Act. And I went and I found it. It says, action taken, as used in this chapter, action taken means a collective decision made by a majority of the members of the legislative body, a collective com commitment or a promise by a majority of the members of the legislative body. So if three council members say, you know, we promise you that we're going to fight this, or we promised you that we're going to do, you know, we, we don't like the results and we're going we're gonna to do it when, everything we can in our power. Any, and I'm just paraphrasing here, but after watching that video, <laughs> that's why I stayed up late because I watched it today for the first time. I just found out about it and it was very upsetting. I had just, it was the call that I made to um, Mason was just, you know, based on what somebody told me, but I actually saw the video today and it really upset me. So I voted for several of you more than once. So I'm hoping again, that we get past this us and them, you know, attitude, and then we try to work together um, on the general plan. But it's, it's, it's a matter of, it's a matter of optics. You got to think about that. It's a matter of trust. And right now I feel like my trust has been violated. And so I'm, I'm very upset about it. Otherwise I wouldn't stay up <laughs> and talked about it. So I'm hoping that we can get past this and that we can be inclusive. I heard somebody else use the word inclusive. I've used it, you know, earlier today. Um, I've heard one of the council members use it as well after I used it. Inclusive, really mean it. Inclusivity, that's what we should be striving for. Um, again, I am, I am thankful that there is a process. You know, there was a democratic process. We voted and, you know, one of the measures passed. Now we have the general plan and we can work together on that. And there's such a great opportunity for, for us to work together on that and forget about our differences and start working on what we have in common and try to do that for our entire community. So again, um, it might be a while before I get that trust back. Before we get that trust back. Thank you for your time. Okay, next speaker is, um, it says call in user two, which I think is Karen Harrell. Yes, it's Karen Harrell, thank you very much. Um, and I thank the council for continuing to uh, stick with this item and, and with the agenda this evening. I would like to say that one of the things that sort of um, caught my eye about this agenda item and, and the report is that it is capsuled as receive report on the events leading to the denial of access of two persons registered to attend the post-election event. Believe me, I wouldn't be up here after midnight, and I really don't think you would have to be either if the only thing we were talking about here was two people weren't allowed into an event. The real issue here is public trust, as, as Erica before me just said. And the real issue is as much as somebody wants to say that the meeting that, that the uh, council members attended and three of you were heralded as speakers for the event uh, was not, quote, widely public, publicized. Um, and I, I really don't think that um, city proper publicity and notice of meetings is, is anything close to a closed email notice uh, from from a particular advocacy group within the city. I'm sure that certain people who are very much connected to the HLC knew about the meeting, but the general public certainly did not. Um, 
basically, as I mentioned before, the issue is public trust, and a lot of that public trust has been broken. Um, I, it, I'm pleased to hear that uh, uh, over 100 people have watched the video so far. It is really quite eye-opening. Um, I think that some of the comments that were made earlier by the council on the general plan discussion are a good start, and I hope that there's really some heart behind them. But it, we're still stuck with the devil in the details on the general plan process. When we can watch a video of a meeting where council members talk about continuing to work against Measure Y, Council Member Gothel said he was, quote, glad to be part of the No on Y coalition. Council Member Bonilla encouraged marching the No on Y campaign right into the general plan process. And Council Member Lee said, I'm with you on this. The fight is not over. Now, I know after a campaign, because I've been involved with a lot of them, emotions run high and everybody gets together and it's easy to get carried away. But this is not where things should be with members of the council. And we are very, very upset with that. I personally am very upset with that. In the end, the issue is, you know, what are we going to do to move forward? Let's hope that those measure why, those no on measure why pitchforks stay on the ground, because uh, let's all work together on what we need to do to try to rebuild some public trust. But that really starts with the five of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker I have is Dee Shum. Hi, my name is David Shum and I'm a resident of the San Mateo Glendale Village. I was uh, president of the Neighborhood Association back in 2001 when uh, Council Member Bonilla was on that committee. Uh, the CAC is what they called it. And that was one of the more collaborative and uh, cohesive and um, compromising committees uh, that I think the city has ever had. And I think that's the direction the city council needs to take now with the, uh, with the whole city here, the, the Measure Y people, the Measure R people, um, your own um, thoughts and concerns about uh, the housing issues because that video, that uh, the YouTube video that I watched was very disappointing. Again, I've been to several council meetings um, in my uh, 30 years as a resident here in San Mateo, and I'm very disappointed in what I saw um, on that YouTube video. But I know we can do better and we should be doing better. So. And I know we can do better because it has happened in the past. And, you know, the neighborhood associations are strong. If we can get the neighborhood associations to, to send representatives to a committee and do whatever it takes, you know, you're going to get all kinds of representation. And that's what happened in 2001. And I think that's what needs to happen again. Thank you. That's okay. it. Okay. Um, thank you. And the next uh, speaker is Loriana Diaz. Uh, just a correction, Patrice. My first name is Loriana. My last name, two words, Seha Diaz. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and read to you um, something. I'm not going to, you know, I don't have an opinion either way about what you did. You, you know, sometimes we can be our own critics. I'm gonna let you guys be your own critics this evening. I do not envy your position tonight or really any other day. I was asked to run for city council of San Mateo by, by a dear friend of mine uh, who was looking for a democratic Latina to help uh, the city of San Mateo. And today I'm really disappointed in myself not in you, in myself, uh, because what I'm seeing and hearing this, name, this evening from the public and from you all, it, it, it's almost embarrassing. And, and it's disappointing to myself to not have taken a little, this, that, that offer a little bit more seriously to try to prevent some of this um, nonsense. But everyone deserves a second chance. 
So I'm going to report back to your constituents and advise them on how you treat my neighborhood's ongoing issue. Council member, Council member Bonilla has already let us down, came here, uh, toured, the, toured a home, and never came back, nor did he ever respond to emails that everybody sent on multiple occasions. Tomorrow, it's a big day for our country. President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Madame Kamala Harris's inauguration is happening. They were elected by the people to serve the people. There is much hope that that's just what they're going to do. And I'm gonna say this with all the respect that city council members here and everywhere else deserve. I dare you, every single one of you, to do the same with, with every matter that comes before you. By definition, a city council is a group of duly affected official, officials, I'm sorry, who serve as the legislative, legislative body of a city. Council members are tasked with the duty and responsibility of representing the interest of their constituents. I'm gonna repeat that. Your duty and your responsibility is representing the interest of, they, of your constituents. Leadership, and I'm gonna end with a quote for, from Colin Powell. Leadership is solving problems. The day your soldiers stop bringing you their problems is the day that you have stopped leading them. They either have lost, lost confidence that you can help or concluded that you do not care. Either case is a failure of leadership. Good night to you all. Okay, our next speaker is Seema Patel. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for staying up so late to hear input from your constituents. I really appreciate it. Um, again, my name is Seema. I'm a resident and a homeowner in Central. Um, I just wanted to comment on the amount of demonization I've seen, particularly in social media and news media of the city council members and commissioners. Um, I've read comments um, accusing city council members of being, quote, shady or in the pockets of developers or um, acting in their own self-interest simply for meeting with and listening to housing advocates. Um, I, you know, as we heard in the earlier item about the general plan, we're experiencing a severe housing crisis in San Mateo, um, one that has led to skyrocketing housing costs and displacement and traffic congestion, among other issues. And it's my opinion that it's completely appropriate for council members to speak to and commissions to appoint subject matter experts when trying to figure out solutions to a crisis that affects in one way or another the daily lives of all San Mateans. Um, you know, if we had a, a crisis caused by an invasive pest, um, I don't think anybody would be criticizing the council for going out and talking to pest control companies about the right way to deal with the problem. And, and I don't see this issue as any different. Um, in fact, not talking to subject matter experts would, would be a pretty big dereliction of duty. Um, as others have pointed out, um, it's city council members' jobs to represent all residents of San Mateo, um, not just the very slim majority that voted for Y or the very slim minority that voted against it. And I, for one, appreciate council members taking the time to speak with housing advocates to understand how decades of exclusionary zoning is impacting the quality of life of San Mateans. And I would fully expect and encourage council members to speak to um, interest groups that are against development to fully understand what their concerns are. I think in a community as evenly divided as ours, perhaps as polarized as ours, the only path forward is through compromise and only by really listening to and talking to people on both sides can we find solutions that benefit all San Mateans. So I wanna thank you for taking the time to meet with everyone and listen to everyone and to um, try and find compromise solutions like Measure R 
um, and encourage you to keep trying to find those compromises. Because um, as others have said, I think the path forward is through compromise. Thank you. Okay, and our next speaker is Michael Weinauer. Good evening, Mayor Rodriguez and Council. Um, the, the, let's just get some facts straight for the, for the for starters that the meeting was not public. It was not advertised to the public, and we were expressly targeted. We registered for the event, and were accepted, and then a day before the event, were canceled. And it, it wasn't as some people have claimed that that right before the event that we were um, canceled out and it was some technical glitch or some other thing. That is not the case. And and if that's the case, then then if this was so above board, then why were, were there claims that there's no video and that we're going to release the video and then suddenly there's a video? If this was so above board, then why were there claims that Joe Councilman Gultos was only there for five minutes? And why was HLC claiming that people like me were there when we were in fact not? So if you're discussing extending the campaign and getting the no people involved in the general process, as Council Member Bonilla stated, isn't city business, then what really qualifies as a Brown Act violation? So setting all that aside, the rhetoric and the actions of the council don't align. We hear outgoing Mayor Gothel saying that we want to heal the divides, and yet he participates in this meeting where they s seek to subvert Measure Y. So you violate the Brown Act in the spirit, if not the letter. In the court of public perception, it's easy to find someone guilty. We're disappointed that instead of an admission of errors and et cetera, we see recalcitrance and entrenchment in their positions. If this is what happens when we happen to uncover it, then what happens or what else is going on that we're not uncovering? It doesn't take a genius to deduce that this meeting wasn't, uh, wasn't convenient to say, oh, darn it, we lost. Let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya. No, when you have that cast of council, HLC, the most housing uh, antithetical to R1 housing and a developer that seeks to profit from uh, rezoning. You can assume the agenda was about silencing the voice of the voters through the subversion or obviation of why. And to Councilman Gothel, as I say to you, am I a malicious agitator, really? Is that how you feel about me and any of the others who want transparency and honesty from our elected officials, about those who want legislation we worked so hard to pass so our voices would be heard to be respected and honored. You claimed to respect the outcome of wise victory, but that sure doesn't seem to be the case. And I ask you to respect that along with the rest of the council. Thank you. Um. Uh, next speaker is Rayon Montashemi. Hello, everyone. My name is Rayon Montashemi. Um, I am a resident of Hillsborough who was born and raised in San Mateo and have many connections to the city and call it my home. I would just like to echo the sentiments of previous commenter Seema Patel, who discussed that we really should um, be ending this kind of demonization that exists with the different groups who are attempting to find solutions to our housing crisis. And in the rhetoric of previous commenters, such as the commenter immediately previous to me, Mike Weinhauer, I would just like to point out that there was an equating with developers and the Housing Leadership Council as a demon, as a demon group and demon um, group of people who are interested in subverting the will of the people, which I do not agree with and think is definitely the wrong way to be having discourse on solving the housing um, crises that we face. It seems um, unproductive to me, unnecessary, uh, and- Who the hell am I? Um, I even went on. There is a- the, well, you didn't Someone read. muted. Um, 
but yeah, yes. And as They're I was red. saying, this is the attorney when they, when everything was good, he looked white. Try to. And he looks red again. Miss. Sorry. <clears throat> yes. Because everybody's taking them down. Is there so, any way? To... I'm muting everyone. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. And um, as I was saying, I believe that this language of demonization should not exist. And I believe that I would like to commend the bravery of the council members who did attend that event, knowing that they might be subject to this kind of demonization for I associating see. themselves with um, groups that have been demonized by those who seek to preserve R1 housing at the expense of all else. Thank you very much. All right. Um, have we heard from Lisa Tanner? We have, haven't we? I believe we have. Okay, I haven't been able to lower hands. So I think that is everyone I have who wanted to talk. So I've missed anyone, please raise your hand right now. Okay, looks like we have, we're done with that. I'll close public comment and bring it back to council. And I see council member Gothel's hand up. You can kick things off. Sure, um, I'll be brief. I am sorry that anyone was excluded from the meeting. Uh, I don't think we knew that that happened and it shouldn't have happened. I'm glad that everyone has access to it and I'm glad that everyone uh, has had an opportunity to see it. And I think we should continue to give access to anybody who wants to watch it. I don't think it's a secret. It certainly was not a secret that the entire city council opposed measure Y and some of us supported measure R. Uh, I've talked previously in this meeting about how I still believe in, in density close to our train stations and not spread out all over the city. I do want to comment that this city council, not a single city council member is here for self-interest. None of us are getting rich being council members. This isn't something we do because it makes us feel good. It's actually incredibly difficult and requires huge personal sacrifice that I personally know my fellow council members have taken again and again. Uh, and I applaud them for doing that. And we continue to do it. We're not here for ourselves. We're not here just for our neighborhood. We're here for the whole city. We have very real, very serious challenges that we face. And one of the biggest ones is our housing crisis. Uh, and when you see the looks on people's faces who are in the throes of that housing crisis, you realize what a serious problem it, it is. And you roll up your sleeves and you try to solve it. And that's what this council has done. And so I applaud my fellow council members for doing that. It's not an easy challenge to fix. That's all I have. Thanks. Any other council members like to comment on this? Uh, I could say a few words, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I want to say that I wish more of the homeowners associations would invite me to speak with them. They don't. I'd be happy to speak with those people or anybody else uh, who feels that um, they have uh, 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 positions that I need to be informed of. Now, clearly they think I need to be informed of them, but they don't care to talk to me about it, okay? I do talk with the people who want to hear from me because they invite me. And by the way, in terms of the HLC meeting, if it wasn't offered publicly, then I don't know how Michael Weinhauer and Tasso Zagrafos were able to register. Um, uh, but that said, I had no idea that anybody was uh, excluded. Um, and I wasn't doing anything or saying anything different than, than anything that I will say to anybody any day, things that I've already been saying for years. Um, 
I was urging people to get involved in the general plan process, which is the same thing I would do in any other room full of people. Um, I, I did make mention of certain facts regarding the reality of RENA and uh, the fact that there are state legislators out there um, that, in other words, you know, Measure Y passed, yes, it is the law, but um, in an effort to seek to build for the common good, for all the people in the city who need to have housing they can afford, right? And I know about that because I worked hard. I strained my muscles, I sweated, I bled. I was a carpenter, right? I know about rolling up your sleeves and working hard. I wasn't able to afford a lot there for quite a few years. But finally, I was able to find a home and get some help from my wife's parents. And we bought a home here in San Mateo. Okay. And we're very happy to live here in San Mateo because it's a great place. But I really think we need to take steps to be a bit more equitable. And um, all that said, um, I mean, I said it earlier, Measure Y is the law. I know that. Okay. And I never said anything about trying to get rid of Measure Y. Okay. But I do believe we need to work to build more affordable housing. So thank you very much. Councilmember Lee, I saw your hand up before. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's important to start with the facts. I mean, all of us as council members took a position in opposition to Measure Y. Um, we were all part of that coalition uh, opposing Measure Y. All of us were in attendance and all of us support an inclusive general plan process. And that is, um, that's, that's been consistent um, and transparent and open since, um, since very early on. So um, I think that for me, the, the important point of upholding the public trust and holding that as sacred, it does require listening. It does require um, bringing all voices to the table. And it was, um, it was shocking to me to hear that, um, that members uh, who had registered for, to the event had been excluded. Uh, I think that that's true uh, for all of us. Uh, the only thing that I had to go on was my own experience with the registration process. I was um, I was directed to a web page, a public web page, and went through an open registration process. Um, it was. Um, it, it was as public and non-secret as a, an event can be. Um, it was widely promoted on social media and through email marketing and, um, and available on a publicly accessible web page and um, a publicly accessible registration process. So um, there was no indication from um, from the process that I went through and the vis visibility to the event that I had, that um, that there would be any effort to exclude anyone. Um, I have sat down with um, with Michael Weinhauer. I sat down with Karen Harrell and Maxine Turner. Um, I pride myself on on sitting down with anyone who will sit down with me um, to have a conversation. That is of the utmost importance, and um, and I believe that it is my duty as um, you know as. A, a representative to have my ear to the ground and to listen to everybody. And that also includes um, the, the affordable housing advocates and the developers and the business owners. I'm here to have conversations with everyone and meet with everyone. Um, and, and that's what I have been doing and will continue to do. And, um, and my role and, um, and promise is, is to uphold the integrity of process and to make sure that we do um, move forward in an inclusive um, and in an inclusive structure so that all voices can come to the table and be heard. Um, my takeaway from this experience is that if the whole council is ever invited to a meeting, I will um, elevate that to the city attorney immediately and do um, do a check in. This is happening. This invitation is there. Um, what do we need to know? What 
um, from the organizers? What do the organizers need to know from us to make sure that um, that that we are, um, you know, that that this is an open and inclusive and um, a, and transparent process and that we are not in any way threatening the trust that the public holds. Um, so, so that is my commitment. Um, and just by way of a little background of my, my personal process um, in terms of how I came to be on, um, you know, attending that event and speaking on the event, I do feel um, that, that taking uh you know a sentence out of context um to to you know to further a, a point um about about the council subverting the will of of the of the community and um and trying to overturn measure y it's um it's really so far from from what um is happening in terms of what you just saw in this meeting where our council was what reached consensus to continue doing the general plan process, um, including um, the study of scenario A um, and moving forward with um, with a plan um, that will that will take into account the constraints of, of measure Y um, and and also try to find a way to meet our renewal goals. So this council has demonstrated in this meeting and time and time again through um, through our history and, uh, and our action that we are working hard for the people, all of you, all people, um, and that we will continue to uphold the process, a fair process. And we do not in any way take for granted the public trust. Anyone else? Councilmember Pepin. Yeah, um, you know, I, from my perspective, I went to the meeting to listen. That's what I did. I thought it was a public meeting. I think some of it is a sign of the times because we are in a pandemic. Um, we assumed that it was a public meeting and that the operator of the meeting was conducting it as such. If this meeting were held in a conference room or a rec center, it would be very easy to physically see somebody being excluded we're at a tremendous disadvantage, at least with respect to Zoom and the pandemic, to understand whether or not somebody is being excluded. That would have made an issue for every single person on this council. I can guarantee you that. Um, so that was something that was made it very difficult was the, um, the fact that this is a sign of the times and how we must operate at this moment in time. But part of this job is listening and it is listening to all sides. And I will continue to do that. And I will make sure in the future that who's ever controlling the meeting isn't excluding anyone. Thank you. I don't have much to add, much more to add, but I just say that when um, Mr. Zagrafos um, first approached me with his concerns, um, he, 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 said that he wanted um, transparency, he wanted access to the video. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased that that video has been made public so, um, so everybody can, can see what, what happened in that meeting. I, I commend um, how, how staff uh, did their report on this and how we did basically all we could do after um, we learned about these events. And, and I think that's uh, in the spirit of uh, transparency as well. I think we all um, have realized that in the age of Zoom, we got to be even more careful about uh, about how people can be excluded from from meetings. And I also think that we're going to need to take it upon ourselves more to um, not assume that other organizers of events understand the nuances and and various aspects of the Brown Act. Um, we're going to have to take responsibility for that ourselves. Um, and uh, I don't have much more to add than that, but thanks everybody. Uh, for, and thank you to the public for bringing these concerns. I think this is a healthy conversation. Okay. Um, we are moving on to lucky number 21, Community Wellness and Crisis Response Team Mental Health Partnership Agreement. 
and we have yes good oh, morning good. council yes see if i can share my screen all right are you able to uh to see we are great um so council members good morning uh my name is matt lafine i'm a lieutenant with the san mateo police department uh, even with uh, the late hour uh, it, it really is my pleasure to be able to speak with you tonight uh, and to bring forward a proposal that our city implement a community wellness and crisis response team. Um, I want to really drive home a point that this is a collaborative partnership. Uh, it's the result of local government coming together to try and address incidents of people experiencing behavioral health crises in the best way possible. Uh, it's uh, involved our city, the cities of Daly City, Redwood City, and South San Francisco, uh, the County of San Mateo uh, with uh, Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, the County Manager's Office, and also County Supervisor Don Horsley. Um, several members of the program's development team are uh, in attendance, uh, even with the late hour. Uh, I want to sincerely thank them all for their hard work in, in developing this proposal. Uh, it would not have been possible without everyone coming together to try to uh, best serve our community. Uh, I want to go over briefly the presentation outline. Uh, here you can see what I intend to share with you in the community. Uh, we'll start with a brief review of the background for the program, explain the program design, and go into specific operational details, uh, discuss our plans for ongoing assessment and uh, how we are going to involve the community and solicit feedback, and also uh, we will discuss the budgetary impact. Uh, so to start off going into some background, uh, in past years, there's been a growing demand for law enforcement to respond to calls for service involving people experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Uh, our department, San Mateo Police, handles approximately 500 such calls every year. Uh, now, especially in recent years, there has been increased attention, uh, reflection, and also focus on how we as society and government can best respond and provide service to people experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Uh, our county and city governments are considering this topic uh, to try and find ways uh, to improve how we do just this. Uh, there are, I think many of us are aware, there are many different models out there uh, of how to do this. Uh, some of these include the CAHOOTS model uh, in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, San Francisco has the street crisis response team. Uh, there is the mobile crisis response team in San Jose, and there's various others. Uh, our uh, planning team considered all of these uh, and also the specific dynamics in our county and respective cities. And our proposal tonight is really what we feel best meets the specific needs of the San Mateo community. Okay, uh, program design. Um, again, I just want to stress that this is a partnership. Uh, what we intend to do is to uh, have a mental health clinician uh, in bed or to work out of uh, each of the four participating police departments. The clinician will be stationed at the police department uh, they'll have dedicated office space, and uh, when calls for service come in that involve or seem to involve a behavioral health crisis, police officers and the clinician uh, will respond. Uh, they're going to respond separately uh, in what is referred to as a co-response model. Uh, now, this, this separate response is intentional, and it allows us to acknowledge uh, certain considerations that I'll, I'll go into in just a few slides. Um, one other thing. Uh, to stress is once they're on scene, even though they respond separately, they're gonna to work together to best address the specific individual incident. They're gonna be able to share their expertise and resources uh, for improved outcomes. And the priority is going to be and will continue to be, how do we best serve the involved individual and the community as a whole? Uh, lastly, um, in this last bullet point, you can see that we're really intending to establish a foundation and that there's gonna be ongoing evaluation so that we can continue to improve. Uh, I'll call it an evolutionary approach. Uh, we know that we're gonna learn as we move forward and we wanna apply what we learn. Uh, we've partnered with outside experts uh, in the area of program review and research. And uh, I'll share more about this in just a few slides. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about something called uh, sequential intercept. Um, and now, this slide outlines the uh, sequential intercept model 
it, uh, it maps out how people with behavioral health issues often come into contact and move through the criminal justice system. Uh, it can help serve as a roadmap for us in our community to identify specific intercept points where interventions are possible to interrupt the process um, and to keep them out of the criminal justice system if possible. As you can see by the red box, uh, we really focused on intercepts zero and one. Uh, when people with behavioral health issues are, are first coming in, into contact with the criminal justice system. Moving on into operations. Uh, so for this program, our response is gonna start when we first get a call for service. And these come through our dispatch centers. When someone calls either 911 or our non-emergency lines, our dispatchers are gonna work. Uh, they're gonna get specific individual facts about the incident to figure out what's happening and how we can best respond. Uh, during this triage process, our dispatchers who are going to receive additional training and support about this exact program will send officers and the clinicians out into the field. Uh, one goal that has been asked about and that we want to uh, proactively address during the planning and design process was, can clinicians respond without officers? Um, and I want to acknowledge that uh, BHRS does have certain programs already in existence uh, where their staff are out in the field on their own, uh, they are not actually responding to emergency level or style crises. So at this point, we're not recommending that option. Uh, and the primary reason is safety. Uh, behavioral health crises very often can carry with them uncertainty and can involve safety concerns. Uh, these concerns can involve <clears throat> the individual in question, but also the people responding and uh, the larger community. So to ensure that all people, uh, everyone is safe as, as safe as possible, officers are gonna respond alongside clinicians. And uh, I do wanna note and stress for council that uh, this is a topic that we've identified thanks to feedback from the community. Uh, we and our partners intend to consider it as we move forward with our ongoing assessment if it's feasible. Okay, moving on into our operations for police officers. Uh, so in our response, uh, the priority, again, for officers is going to be the safety of all. Uh, so when they're dispatched, the officers are going to, uh, they're going to arrive first on scene. Uh, they're going to use their training and experience in scene assessment, crisis intervention, and de-escalation to focus on determining if the scene is safe. Once they do that, they will radio for the clinician to join them uh, so they can start to work together on to how to best uh, address and handle the incident. And now depending, depending on the specific incident, uh, the background on what has happened and the needs of the individual, uh, the officers may leave the scene or, or they may remain. And I'll explain more about that in just a, a few slides. Now going into the operations for our clinicians, um, these uh, the clinicians are going to be employees of the county in BHRS. Uh, they'll have dedicated workspace like I mentioned, uh, but really they're, they're intended to be out there in the field. They're intended to be responding to the incidents that are occurring in present time. Uh, they're not going to be case managers, uh, and they're not going to be intended to be conducting a lot of follow-up or coordination. Um, they're going to work uh, 40 hours every week, uh, and they're going to have a schedule that's designed to best meet uh, our needs in San Mateo. Um, now, again, because they're working 40 hours a week, this is not a 24-7 program, but we're going to target hours that best meet our, our city's needs. Uh, there will be times when they are off-duty, not available, and as we move forward, um, based on kind of how our research uh, plays out, we may adjust those hours if appropriate. All right, um, this is what I wanted to go into a little more detail about how the officers and clinicians will respond. Um, and so it goes into a little bit about uh, the different options and also decision-making authority, because I know some people have had some questions about that. So our, our goal is that these two part these two parties, right, the officers and clinicians are going to work together and they're going to always strive to reach agreement on how to best resolve incidents. Um, sometimes there may be different things going on with the incident, so I wanted to break down the three options here. Uh, if you look in the middle of the screen where it reads the co-response by officer and clinician to call for service, uh, that's the start of the response. Um, and so both the officer and clinician will respond. Um, and uh, again, right, the officer responds first, make sure that it's safe, and then radios for the dispatch or for the uh, clinician to respond. They, they will respond nearby and stage um, for, that, uh, for that notification from the officer and so they can respond in short manner. Um, so to work through some different options, if you look on the right side of your screen where it says crisis only, 
Um, if the incident is determined to only involve a behavioral health crisis, uh, the clinician is going to drive and determine how that matter is resolved, and they'll have decision-making authority. Uh, and in most cases like that, the officer will leave once they are no longer needed and it's uh, confirmed that it's safe there. Uh, the second option, which is on the left side here, crime only. Um, if it's determined to involve just a crime and no behavioral health crisis, the officer is going to determine the resolution. They'll have the decision-making authority. Uh, and lastly, the third option right here on the bottom, if it involves both, um, we are going to be stressing and we're confident that it's going to uh, really, we're going to reach resolution through collaboration between both. Um, I'll tell you that currently our practice is that our officers um, really are, are already out there on, in the field um, and looking to balance exactly what's in the best interest of the individuals in the, in the community. Um, and oftentimes, if they're out there, depending on the severity of the, the crime they're investigating, Sometimes they will uh, be taking that person to service providers and writing reports for later prosecution. Um, and the, the opposite is true as well. Um, ultimately though, the officer and clinician are gonna work together to figure out how to best provide service. Uh, if there ever did happen to be a disagreement where both a crime and behavioral crisis are involved, the officer is gonna have uh, final decision-making authority uh, because of uh, that underlying crime. Okay. Uh, going on, I mentioned this, uh, so we're excited about this part. We're excited about the ongoing assessment. Uh, we partnered with the John W. Gardner Center of Stanford University. <clears throat> the Gardner Center staff, uh, they're experts. They have extensive experience as researchers. Uh, they help to drive policy and program design. Uh, and actually, we have uh, their executive director with us tonight. Um, so this program is new. It's novel, and we know it. Uh, we also um, we know that we need to really make a point to deliberately reflect and assess how this program works so we can identify ways to improve and work to evolve the program. So um, you heard me mention it before, this program's foundational. Uh, we've designed it to establish a strong foundation that we can build on. And uh, to be able to build on it, we need to bring in experts. And those experts are the Gardner Center staff. Um, so our planning team have identified some areas we intend to study. We also expect that once we or they, uh, they really dive into our data. They're gonna uncover other areas uh, for study as well. Um, some areas we think will bear some exploration include reduced numbers of calls for service involving behavioral health crises, uh, reduced use of public safety and emergency services, uh, improved outcomes for involved individuals, improve residential stability, uh, and reduce contact with their criminal justice system. Um, the ongoing assessment is going to help us identify, again, ways we can improve this, this program as we move through the two-year term. Uh, again, I want to stress, we're not waiting until the end to start the assessment. We're going to be uh, starting assessment uh, as soon as we kick off this program. Uh, we're really we're, we're confident, we're excited about how that uh, ongoing assessment is going to allow us to use the lessons we learn uh, as close to kind of as close in time to when they're occurring so we can really make sure this program is best meeting our community's needs. All right. Um, wanted to drive home that uh, a key part will be community and stakeholder input. Um, so at the county level, coordinating between all the different cities and the involved groups, uh, we intend to reach out to stakeholders uh, and to share program results and ask for input on how this program can best serve everyone. Uh, some of the intended stakeholders you can see, there, uh, see them on the screen. And that list, we believe, will continue to grow as we move forward and identify others. Uh, ultimately, we recognize this program has to be community informed for it to be successful. And we're planning on doing just that. And lastly, uh, but not leastly, uh, we need to discuss, uh, discuss and consider the budgetary impact. So by design, <clears throat> each involved city is going to pay one eighth of the total program costs so our total uh, for the two-year term will be approximately $156,000. Uh, council earlier in the evening approved on the consent calendar the assignment of a sergeant uh, to the county gang intelligence unit. That action freed up funding that will further uh, will fully cover this program costs. So the result is there's no net impact to the city's general fund. Uh, the recommendation of staff for you as council tonight is that you approve the formal memorandum of understanding between the county and four cities. 
And additionally, uh, we're recommending that U.S. Council adopt a resolution to appropriate funds in the amount uh, shown on the bottom of the screen, uh, $19,235 to the police department's fiscal year 2021 budget uh, to address anticipated costs. And that ends, uh, concludes my presentation. I, I do wanna thank you for your time. I know it is late in the evening. Uh, the chief and I are available to field any questions. I also wanna acknowledge that we have uh, Scott Gilman, the director of County BHRS and Amy Gerstein from uh, the Gardner Center, the executive director. They're also here uh, in case you have any questions uh, for us. Thank you for that presentation. I'll bring it to council. Do, do any council members have any questions? I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, please try to use the virtual hands. It, that's it, it makes it a little bit easier to see. I saw uh, council member Lee first. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, I I want to ask just a clarifying question. When you listed there were 500 calls per year um, for behavior health, are those um, non-criminal? No, um, those are what we were able to weed through our data and try to get our, our best approximation of uh, mental health detentions uh, or behavior health crises. Some of those do involve crimes and some of them are just crises alone. Okay. Um, do we know, I mean, do you know offhand like what, what proportion um, are, okay. No, I don't. Okay. Um, well, that would be an interesting data point to track. <laughs> um, well, I'm, uh, there are a couple of questions I was going to ask that you already answered in the presentation, but I got one question that came up as you were talking was, um, how will this new team work with the hot team and the PERT program? Like what, what are sort of the overlapping areas or intersections there in terms of our, the now more comprehensive service model that we have? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll uh, answer the, the hot team, um, and then and I'll let the chief, if he wants to weigh in as well, maybe in Scott for the PERT uh, consideration. But for our, um, our homeless outreach team, uh, we anticipate that the clinician, if they have unallocated time, if there are days where they, you know, knock on wood, there's not a lot of calls for service involving a crisis, uh, we intend to have them partner up with our, um, our hot team members and to go out and proactively provide service uh, and especially try to, um, to identify those people. Our hot team uh, members, uh, they have already established relationships with a lot of the people who are out there in the community and could uh, identify kind of ways we can use the clinician. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll mute and let uh, either the Chief Barberini or uh, Scott Gilman weigh in. Yeah, I will jump in real quick and then I, I will turn it over to uh, Director Gilman. Um, we did look at the PERT team uh, when developing this program, uh, and there are a lot of benefits to the PERT team. For those who are not familiar with it, it's the Psychiatric Emergency Response Team that does partner a, a mental health professional with a, um, a detective. Uh, their model re um, calls for a more of a follow-up model where they'll follow up on, on calls for service um, after the fact. Uh, what we're trying to accomplish here is more of a first responder model where we actually um, uh, establish that co-response um, model in a timely manner so that the clinician is partnered with law enforcement as soon as possible or is um, interacting with, with the subject experience, experience in the crisis um, right away in response to the call for service rather than it being a referral system where law enforcement would go out there and make a referral to per and, and then they would, uh, they would follow up after the fact. So that's the primary difference between the model that we're seeking and the model that um, is established with PERT. And I'll let uh, Director Gilman um, elaborate on that if, if you'd like, Scott. Well, I'd like to expand on what you said, Chief, but you hit it perfectly. Uh, you know, that is that is the that is the link. Um, we know that crisis intervention without follow-up really isn't, isn't gonna be that valuable for the individual. Most likely they'll be, you know, back in trouble within hours if we don't, if we don't link them to services or, Make sure they're getting the support that they need, um, medication follow up, whatever that is. So, so that's that's I think the main difference. So, so does this augment what part 
is already offering or it sort of in some ways replaces a better version because the co-response model already has the clinician available to do the follow-up? Um, I would say there, as Lieutenant had up on, on the screen earlier with the sequential intercept model, it's not replacing per, it's really different, um, a, a different point in the continuum. I think if you if you look at all the different services and programs we have, they serve different points in different populations at different points in their um, criminal history, if you will. And so, you know, we have diversion courts and we have, you know, reentry programs that are all designed to hit that person where they're at. And so, uh, and we already have programs that we have mental health clinicians that go out to to crises every day. You know, without without police um, presence. And this will this will take us a little bit closer to that that point in time where dispatch is calling us and and our goal our long term goal is folks that we know folks that we've had interactions with that we'd be able to respond sooner um, or with the with uh, without the police uh, officer present um, but it's going to take a minute to get there but that that is our ultimate goal. That's great. And then one, sorry, one more question. Just what, do we have a sense of what the, um, what the intervals for the gathering community and put in the evaluation process will be? Is that, is that on a schedule that's been set? It's not been set yet. No. Um, the, the Mental Health and Substance Abuse Commission, they're, they're the commission that's appointed by the Board of Supervisors is really taking this under their wing. Um, they want to oversee that, that process and be, you know, a major part of that. Um, I know some of the chiefs and the county manager and supervisor Horsley have all talked about a listening to her. So, you know, it, this is a, this is a really, really, really important topic for a lot of people. And it's really important that we get it straight. And, and we, so we want to, um, take the time that we need to, to make sure we get input from all the different groups. And, and so that'll be happening over the next, um, probably two or three months. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Bernier. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I, you know, I'm concerned with the approach, you know, where the approach is sending mental health professional to accompany the police. And I think I was encouraged when I saw a part of uh, Officer Leithen's report where he mentioned that um, eventually some calls may be able to be handled just by an emergency uh, um, mental health worker. Um, so I understand um, because I feel like we need to keep our mental health care workers safe. Um, and Deputy Mayor, if I may interrupt, do you have a question? I want to really make sure we get yeah. to public yeah, comment we before we give our comments. Sorry. So I got three questions. Um, he called this an evolutionary process. Um, does that mean that eventually we could go from uh, this this where the police lead the process to where the mental health care worker leads the process. And then finally, through good training to dispatchers, knowing when we can just send mental health people out there to deal with these things. Do we think that's uh, a doable evolution? Yes, uh, that's something we're considering. Um, we don't want to rush and get too far out uh, ahead, but that is something that's been raised. And so that's something that our planning group has identified as as a possibility for the future. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, another thing, 40 hours a week, there are 168 hours in a week. Uh, crises don't all have a, a 40 hour a week job. Um, how do we plan to account for off hour situations? Back to normal? Yes, so when the clinician is not working, um, we would revert back to what we're doing now and been doing up to this point, uh, where our officers would be dispatched to, uh, to crisis situations. Okay, so do we foresee a time where if this is really working out, it's very beneficial, we would be able to have a clinician on staff full time? I mean, one, you know, not just one, but around the clock. That, that's something we've discussed, uh, and I'll mute and let the chief weigh in. Yeah, the, the, the premise behind this whole approach, and, and, I'll, and I'll let Scott again, um, chime in is is really um, a pilot program approach, not only to expand the coverage during the hours a day, like like, um, uh, like you mentioned, but also to um, expand the capacity as a county as a whole. So 
Um, we'd like to we'd like to see whether we can expand this to um, to beyond the four cities that that we're um, piloting now over the next couple of years, and then go back to the county and um, and with the Gardner Center's help, um, be able to articulate the effectiveness of the program, um, and then look at, hey, how can we expand? Is it worth expanding? Is what we're doing working? Is this a worthwhile endeavor? And if so, um, we see a, a, a great deal of potential. And one of those would be to expand the hours. Right now, what we do um, is we're, we're looking at calls for service and, and trying to figure out when our peak times of, of calls for service are for these types of calls and have that clinician available during those during those hours, inevitably, we're going to get we're going to get calls when uh, when that clinician is not available now. But this is a pilot approach um, that can expand in more ways than one. And one of them would be the the number of hours during the day that they're available. Okay, good. My final question, very quickly, and it's related to the first question I asked. But you know about um, the criminal justice system, and you know sometimes when a person sees a, a middle, you know person who is having a crisis sees an officer approaching, they might get agitated, right? And things happen. It's not a perfect world. Um, um, some people get hurt sometimes when these things happen, right? Including officers, right? And I, 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 I wish it were a more perfect world. But um, is it possible in some instances where it may appear there's some sort of a crime, but it's not a major crime, it's kind of a minor crime, right? that uh, we could avoid the criminal justice system and just try to get the people the help they need? Uh, I, I, and I, I won't, I'll, I'll let Matt um, uh, expand on this, but I, I believe that happens now. So um, there's a great deal of discretion that we use currently. Um, a, a lot of times we'll go out to calls for service and there's a crime that's been committed, um, but we recognize that this is not somebody that, that needs to go to jail. This is somebody that needs um, some services. The problem is, is oftentimes there's a victim to that crime. So what we'll do is, is we'll, we'll offer that person services initially. We'll write a report. We'll forward it on to the district attorney's office. Uh, we are not judge and jury, um, so we don't make those filing decisions. But we'll make sure that the district attorney uh, makes a, uh, is able to make as well-informed a decision as possible um, and letting that, you know, it'll be, it'll be apparent that, hey, there was some mental health or, or behavioral um, health crisis um, that contributed to this event. And then ultimately it would be the decision of the district attorney to, to make that filing charge. So that, that currently happens. Um, you know, hopefully we'll be better at it when we have the, the expertise of a clinician standing next to an officer um, that may be able to, uh, right now we're basically just triaging these types of calls where we're just trying to get them to services as fast as possible. And then we really don't know what happens at, at, to that point. So hopefully this will help us close the loop with that regard. And, um, and like Matt mentioned earlier, I'm hopeful that we see a reduction in these types of calls for service because the, the repetitive calls that we get now for folks that we know that have problems and, and our only, our only means to deal with it is to forward them off to, to the hospital. And then they're out a few hours later. Now we're hoping to, to be able to close that loop and hopefully um, make, make more of an impact on the, on the lives of those folks. So I didn't mean to jump in there, Matt, but feel free to. Actually, that was a great answer, Chief, and that's, that's all I needed. I want to thank you for expanding my thinking on that. Thank you. That, those are my questions. Okay, any other questions before we open up public comment? Okay, seeing none, we, I will open up public comment. Looks like we have two hands. Uh, first speaker is David Escher. Please unmute yourself. Mr. Usher, are you there? Maybe move on to the next one, we'll come back. Okay, uh, next speaker is Martin. Martin, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone staying up late <clears throat> to share this information. I Just as a, a citizen in San Mateo, I say I'm very encouraged seeing this report. I can't pretend to be any kind of an expert uh, but it, it feels like the right steps are being made to to bring the right services and integrate them into the, the police force. So I just 
you know, wanted to give encouragement to, to everyone working on it from a sort of layperson's point of view. It seems like a good thing to do, especially in light of what we've seen in the last year and more. Um, and I wanted to take a moment to just commend the, the police department and in my personal experience as a, as a resident in San Mateo, I've seen someone, um, uh, it was about one in the morning, actually, uh, <clears throat> knocking on the door of our neighbors uh, with a hammer and demanding that they needed help. Uh, SMPD was out within minutes. It, it didn't look to me like they had any, um, you know, special counselors. They just had officers that recognized what was going on. They de-escalated, and uh, I, you know, I, you know, would would be remiss not to acknowledge that, you know, to to the. Uh, Chief Barbarini's point. I think there's a lot of good things already happening, and I feel like it, it warrants mentioning. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. And if we can go to Adam Lorraine next. Yes, thank you. Good morning, uh, council and staff. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to uh, indicate my support uh, for this, uh, what looks to be a, a good step forward. I remember uh, being in some city council meetings uh, last summer uh, with you uh, discussing uh, some of the... Uh... Oops. Test, test. We got you, Adam. Sorry about that. Oh, sure, of course. Uh, I presume you've heard me. I, I'm, I'm basically just supporting this step forward. It may not be exactly all that everybody may have wanted uh, in response to the events we've seen, but uh, as, as has been discussed, uh, this is not necessarily the end, but rather a beginning, and I look forward to next steps. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Stephanie Reyes. Hi, yes, Stephanie Reyes, resident of the Bay Meadows neighborhood and a member of Surge San Mateo. Um, I'm very glad to see the city and county looking into creative responses to mental health crises, including this first response program. Um, I, I was one of the folks who wrote in and said that, you know, I'd really like to see a crisis response team that's solely mental health clinicians and support, rather than kind of a co-response with law enforcement. Um, Part of that is because I, I really agree that safety is is of prime importance. And I think ending only unarmed responders would increase the likelihood of a safe outcome, both for the person in crisis as well as for the responders themselves. Um, because as uh, Deputy Mayor Bonilla mentioned, sometimes the presence of an armed officer in and of itself can just increase tension in a situation and become an escalating factor. Um, and then I also want to say, um, I very much appreciate kind of the sense of urgency around this issue and, and folks' interest in addressing it. Um, I am concerned that there was little to no opportunity for public input up to this point that I'm aware of. Um, and I've been part of the conversations around policing during the summer, which I appreciated. Um, I did hear the presenter say that there will be public input in the future um, after the program has launched. Uh, but I, I would just urge the council to make time for public input on the design of the program uh, before approving and launching it. Um, and then finally, I just wanna note that there were several other folks who I know wanted to make similar comments, but were unable to stay until this late hour. Um, and I believe that uh, David Usher is still on the call and would like to make a comment. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And David Usher, you please unmute yourself if you would like to comment. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. So, uh, yes, I'm, my name is David Usher. I'm a resident of San Mateo and also a member of San Mateo Surge. And I want to thank you for recognizing the, recognizing the importance of this issue and for taking an initiative towards dealing with people with mental suffering from mental health issues in a more empathic and professionally qualified way. However, Although having mental health experts accompanying police officers might seem a step in the right direction, and it is certainly well-intentioned, 
it is in fact uh, misguided uh, because for many mental health conditions, most notably autism, Asperger's, schizophrenia, the very presence of an armed police officer can cause panic, confusion in the sufferer and will only exacerbate the situation. Uh, acts like shouting orders, any physical contact, not let alone rough physical contact, can be direct triggers to reactions which too easily can be interpreted by police wow. officers as resistance or aggression. So, And would police officers accede to the superior knowledge and experience of the mental health exp expert? Or would they, as has tragically happened too many times to count, resort to violent suppression, often with lethal, lethal consequences? Uh, Lieutenant Lethen mentions the importance of safety, and the person whose safety is most at risk is the person suffering the mental health crisis. What is needed is a mental health response team independent of the police and accountable to the mental health disciplines, not to law enforcement. Um, and so that when people call 911 and they're offered uh, different services, they can say mental health in addition to fire, police, ambulance. Um, uh, because being mentally ill is not a crime and should not be treated as such. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have no other speakers. Okay, great. I'll Oops, close. wait, Lawrence just popped up. Lawrence, please unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I was a part of the conversations over the summer as well, and uh, to one of the previous comments, when it comes to having public input on basically what would happen going forward, I don't recall seeing much of anything when it comes to public discussions coming about to uh, get more input from the public. Um, so to me, it's it's good to hear some of these things come about. Um, it's just more concerning that it just seems like little to no public input that I'm aware of. And I've been staying up on these meetings as much as possible. I may have missed maybe a two within the last six months, two or three in the last six months, and I have not seen anything. Um, in regard to the, the ask for, what is it, 19,000? Uh, to me, I guess when it comes to there was no change in the budget last year, and for there to be an ask for increase in the budget for this fiscal year, it just makes me question, was there any efforts taken on the police department's part to find any other way to make room for these changes. Um, if anything, it just seemed like that would have been a better way of handling the situation to at least show we're trying to make an effort to uh, make something work. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I do believe we have no other speakers now. Okay, I'll close public comment, bring it back to council, and I see Councilmember Gothel's hand up. Great presentation, Matt. This is a critical strategy to better serve our community. More than half of the county jail are individuals suffering from some form of mental health issues. Interventions like this I support very much because health professionals uh, are a proven solution to reducing incarceration in favor of treatment and diversion. Thanks again, Matt. Okay. Anyone else have any comments or I'll entertain a motion? I'd just like to say that I support it. Okay. Anyone else? Make a motion to approve. Second. Madam Clerk, can you call roll, please? Uh, Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Yes. Councilmember Gothos. Yes. Councilmember Pappen. Yes. Councilmember Lee. Yes. Mayor Rodriguez. Yes. Passed five zero. 
Thank you, everyone, on that one. So now we're moving on to item number 22, temporary storage containers in the public right of way in or, uh, ordinance introduction. And we have a staff presentation, I believe. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. Getting uh, figured here. Hello. We're not seeing your presentation right now. Just okay. waiting. Um, and should be up now. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, hello, and I guess good morning, Mayor Rodriguez and Council members. My name is Nicolette Chan, and I am a transportation planner for the city's public works department. And tonight I'll be presenting about temporary storage containers in the public right of way. Uh, for a brief overview, I'll first go over some background information on what uh, temporary storage containers are and the city's current policies and procedures on them. Next, I will pre present staff's analysis on uh, requirements other ju jurisdictions have uh, relating to storage containers. And lastly, I will present staff's recommendations for how we can permit storage containers in the right of way. Uh, so temporary storage containers are enclosed containers used to temporarily store household items, and we commonly refer to them as portable on-demand storage or pods. Uh, currently, these containers may be placed on private property without an encroachment permit. However, staff have received many requests to place these containers on the street because many residents don't have private property to place the container on. Uh, for example, residents who live in multifamily housing or um, those houses that may have um, insufficiently sized driveways and the container can't fit on them. Uh, this shows that there is a need to allow storage containers in the public right of way. The city's municipal code states that containers may not be placed in the right of way for more than one hour at a time, and that containers are not expressly allowed with an encroachment permit, meaning staff cannot issue an encroachment permit to allow a container to be on the street for longer than one hour. Um, for comparison, uh, similarly sized items such as garbage containers and debris boxes are currently allowed in the public right of way with an encroachment permit. In the current comprehensive fee schedule, debris boxes and storage containers are grouped together into one permit fee, and that fee is $381 with a $500 deposit. Uh, but this fee does not currently apply to storage containers because the municipal code does not allow an encroachment permit to be issued for a storage container. Uh, next, I will review uh, staff's analysis. Uh, so staff collected requirements from other jurisdictions that apply to storage containers, and they included where containers may or may not be placed and a maximum container size. Um, a complete list can be found in the agenda report. San Mateo currently requires a detailed site plan to be submitted to apply for an encroachment permit. A site plan is a detailed diagram showing the dimensions of the proposed work location. Um, staff's research found that some cities allow a sketch drawing or map markup to be submitted in place of a site plan. Uh, for example, the city of Seattle in Washington provides this template shown here for residents who apply for a permit to place a storage container on the street. And how it works is um, the applicant would fill out the required information and then submit it as their site plan. Allowing a sketch drawing or map markup to be submitted in place of a site plan simplifies the application process for residents who may not be familiar with the encroachment permit process. Um, a draft policy was presented to the Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission last October. Commissioners provided feedback on a permit renewal option and a fee waiver for low income households. Staff returned in November with a revised policy where the commissioners unanimously recommended approval. The proposed uh, recommendations that I'll go over in a second uh, do include modifications staff made to the commission's feedback. 
And now I will present staff's recommendations for how we can permit storage containers in the right of way. Uh, so staff recommends that the conditions of approval requirements for storage containers be expanded. A complete list of recommended requirements uh, can be found in the agenda report. Highlighted here in the next few slides are a few of the conditions. Um, so containers may be placed on residential streets only and in the public right of way for a maximum of seven days. Um, staff have also recommended a permit renewal option, which I will speak to shortly. Uh, for placement, staff recommend that storage containers be placed on private property if that property is available and sufficiently sized. Um, if that's not an option, then containers must be placed on street in front of the permittee's residence. Um, and if that space does not fit the container or causes site visibility issues, uh, then the container may be placed at the next closest on street space. And courtesy notification from the permittee must be sent to the property owner or tenants nearest to the container. Um, and a copy of the encroachment permit must be posted on the container. Uh, staff also developed measurements to make it clear which street storage containers may be placed on. We came up with two categories, and the first are streets with unmarked parking stalls and without a center line. Um, Flora Street shown here is an example of that. Containers will be allowed to be placed on these streets as long as a 12-foot clear path of travel for vehicles is maintained. The other category of street uh, we created was streets with a marked center line, um, just like Palm Avenue shown here. And a container will be allowed to be placed on these types of streets if a 10 foot travel lane can be maintained. The Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission expressed interest in permit renewals um, and staff recommend that we allow permit renewals at a rate of $10 per container per day for up to a maximum of seven additional days. This means that containers uh, would be allowed to be on the street for a total of two weeks if a permit renewal uh, to, for a container was approved. Um, staff also recommends that renewals be contingent upon whether safe, valid safety related complaints have been received about the container. Uh, for example, if, this, if staff receive a complaint that a container affects site visibility for drivers, uh, then a permit renewal to allow permit renewal requests to allow a container to remain on the street would not be approved. Uh, staff also recommend that the municipal code be updated to allow staff to issue an encroachment permit for temporary storage containers and to allow containers to be placed in the right of way for a maximum term of 14 days. Uh, this slide shows current permit fees from other jurisdictions that allow storage containers in the public right of way. The average permit cost amongst the studied cities was $198. The green bar represents San Mateo's current permit fee for like items like debris boxes, uh, and San Mateo ranked the second highest of all studied cities. Based on this research, staff recommend a reduced fee for storage containers in the fee schedule that is separate from debris boxes. And that proposed fee is $160 plus a $350 deposit. The permit fee is based on the one hour of staff time needed to review and process an application, um, and the deposit encourages removal of the container. And the deposit will be refunded once a public works inspector confirms that the container has been removed. Um, additionally, uh, the Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission requested staff to consider a fee waiver option, and staff recommend allowing a fee waiver option for low-income households the qualifications process will be consistent with other city policies and programs. Uh, and at this time, we are accepting feedback on the permit fee amount, and we'll come back with a resolution to implement the fee into the current fee schedule. Following this meeting, staff will bring the proposed ordinance for a second reading to adopt the municipal code amendments, and we'll prepare a resolution to implement the fee for temporary storage containers in the current fee schedule. And that concludes my presentation. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for <clears throat> that outstanding presentation. Um, do we have any questions from city council? It was that good of a presentation. Um, I would like to um, open it up to public comment. Not seeing any hands going once, going twice. Okay. Um, 
closing public comment. I will like to hear uh, comments from council or um, is there a moment? Is there, do we need a motion? I think so, yes, right? Yes. Yes. I make a motion to approve. Second. And for the, for the record, that motion would be to introduce the ordinance to uh, yes. amend the chapter, placing certain objects in the right of public right of way. I'll try to remember that stuff in the future, Sean. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Yes. Councilmember Lee. Yes. Councilmember Gothals. Yes. Councilmember Pappen. Yes. Mayor Rodriguez. Yes. Carries five zero. Okay. We got number 23, disposable food service ware regulations ordinance introduction. And last but not least, Andrea Chow is going to be presenting. Great. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good evening uh, or good morning, whatever we're saying now. Uh, my presentation tonight is on disposable food service for regulations, and I have a very brief presentation. Uh, so on February 25th of last year, the County of San Mateo adopted a disposable food service for ordinance addressing the use of plastic disposables in food facilities. Addressing plastic disposables is very important since plastic often becomes litter that pollutes our streets and waterways. On October 14th of 2020, the Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission meeting, uh, staff brought forward a report on different disposable food service wear policy options. The commissioners all supported adopting the county's approach because it addresses all types of disposable food service wear, leverages the county services, and promotes consistency across the region. The commission then recommended that the city council consider adoption of the county ordinance. And then at the November 16th uh, city council meeting, the council agreed with the commission's recommendation, recommendation and directed staff to return with the county ordinance for adoption. Very briefly, the ordinance impacts all food facilities that provide prepared food or beverages, and it requires the use of compostable disposable products instead of petroleum-based plastic products. The county ordinance is structured to have a delayed enforcement date. This delay in enforcement allows time for the jurisdiction to educate and inform food facilities of the required changes, and it also allows food facilities to use up their existing inventory of disposable food serviceware that does not meet the requirements of the new ordinance. So initially in February of 2020, when the county had adopted the ordinance, they had scheduled enforcement to begin one year after the adoption. So that would be March 2021. That's just a few months away. Due to COVID-19, the County Board of Supervisors will consider further delaying enforcement at a future board meeting. County staff will recommend delaying enforcement until March 2022. All of the cities that had adopted the ordinance plan to align with the county's new date of enforcement, except for the city of Half Moon Bay. Half Moon Bay has selected a faster enforcement date, July 2021, uh, because of the amount of litter that ends up on the city's beaches. Staff recommend that the city of San Mateo begin enforcement of the proposed ordinance six months after the county's enforcement date, which would be October 1, 2022. Staff has several reasons for recommending a later enforcement date. The first uh, reason is that the county is still in the process of developing resources for food facilities. These resources include a guide that will have example of compliant disposable food serviceware and a list of all the local and online vendors that provide this type of uh, disposables. The county also will provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to food facilities to help them come into compliance with the ordinance. Uh, staff thinks it is critical that food facilities have access to these county's resources and technical support 
uh, both to maximize compliance and also, also ensure a smooth transition. The city would also benefit from any lessons learned from the county's early enforcement uh, in other cities. And then finally, a delayed enforcement date for the ordinance uh, is important because the ordinance is likely to increase costs for businesses. At the last meeting, I showed the cost of composable products versus their plastic alternatives. Um, and on average, they cost a bit more. Staff would like to recommend a delayed enforcement date to also maximize economic recovered, co recovery as we're sensitive during this time. So the proposed ordinance before you tonight repeals chapter 5.89, the polystyrene based disposable food service wear, wear chapter, and it adds a new chapter 5.89 disposable food service wear. So this new chapter will retain the provisions of the city's polystyrene ban and continue to prohibit the distribution of styrofoam based disposable food service wear. The proposed ordinance is modeled after the county ordinance and it was reviewed and approved by county staff. And then to be eligible for the county's enforcement services and all those technical uh, support services that I mentioned, the proposed ordinance also contains all of the provisions of the county ordinance and it authorizes the county manager or designee to enforce the city's municipal code. In addition to this, the city must enter into a memorandum of understanding with the county to be eligible for those services. Uh, the MOU is still under development and will be brought to the council for review and approval later this year. Uh, and then here on the slide is staff's recommendation and I'd love to answer questions for you if you have any. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, bring it to questions for council, from council. I'm not seeing many questions, um, so I will open up public comment. We have one a speaker, Mr. Mayor, Adam Lorraine. Go ahead, Adam. Thank you, City Clerk. Good morning, y'all. Um, I am a Sustainability and Infrastructure Commissioner, but I'm speaking as a resident. These are my opinions only. Uh, that said, um, of course, I was at the meetings in which this item was discussed before and the city council uh, meeting as well. And uh, I'm basically in support, of course, of, of the ordinance, except I, I do question the decision to delay implementation beyond the county's date. That's, that's a new uh, item brought to the council today, uh, was not necessarily brought to the uh, commission earlier. And um, I, based on what's been presented today, have to respectfully disagree with the arguments for doing that. Um, if anything, for one thing, I, I think in the discussions with the Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission, uh, the commission was interested in pursuing as soon as possible and, and really only going ahead with the, the county's deadline to be in uh, solidarity with a broader movement and, and getting the, the assistance from county staff in implementation. Um, it appears that the city of Half Moon Bay is going forward a little earlier than the county's uh, date. And, and so to me, I, I think there may be an opportunity to learn from them uh, and their early adoption, as well as some other cities in the Bay Area that, that have similar ordinances going on, perhaps in advance of the county date. Uh, you know, with regard to cost, I, I feel that the vendors are likely going to be passing these costs on to consumers, as has been discussed in previous meetings. And, and I, I, I guess I would, would, would question whether it's necessary for us to go later than the county. I, I, I personally think that um, it, it, it may, you know, most of what's been raised as concerns will likely be taken into consideration by county staff when implementing their program. Uh, and, and indeed, if, if they feel they need to delay their implementation, we can go along with them as, as we are currently discussing with the delay already to go to 2022. So my, my, my feeling is that uh, we might be okay 
uh, sticking with the other cities and the county with uh, their deadline. Otherwise, I'm in favor. Thank you. Okay, that's okay. it. <clears throat> I have no other speakers. Okay, I'll close public comment, bring it back to council for comments or a motion. Andrea, what do you think about the timeline? Um, we thought a lot about the timeline and I think that I laid out some pretty strong reasons why we wanted to suggest a delayed timeline. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in council's feedback and uh, of the timeline. I, I would propose no earlier than the county's enforcement date, which is likely to be March, 2022. I, I like the county's date. I think if we go with the county, that, that would make sense. Council member Pepin. I don't know. I kind I kind of like, figuring out if any other city has any glitches and giving it the time that uh, Andrea suggested, but I could be persuaded, but I, I kind of like the idea of giving it a little extra time. I agree as well. Um, I think that it's important that we, we, we get this done, but it, it, I don't see, given the situation that we're in right now and that restaurants are in, I don't, I don't see this as hurting um, but the, the, looking at the bigger picture, but that's just my two cents. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Uh, forget it. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, Council Member Lee. Mm, um, I think I, I see the advantage in delaying also. Um, and especially because the County doesn't have even a fraction as many restaurants as we do mm -hmm. um and so you know um their economic impact and is going to be significantly less um and then we do have the advantage of learning from the other cities and as we know from the previous report there's a lot to be worked out with the vendors and some of the products um and so i yeah, I think that actually we might be setting up the businesses for success um, in implementation and compliance, um, being able to have more um, tested products and watching other people struggle up the hill first. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I'm in favor of the, the staff recommendation. But I could be, I could be strong armed the other way too. <laughs> Okay, do we have a motion? Uh, unmuted one. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> move, motion. I'll move uh, uh, to um, adopt a resolution to introduce the ordinance. I don't know, it's kind of late, Sean. How did I do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sean's <laughs> muted now. Sean, you're muted. Still are. Introduce the ordinance. I'll make a motion to introduce the ordinance. I'll second. Okay, Council Member Pappen. Yes. Council Member Lee. Yes. Council Member Gothels. Yes. Deputy Mayor Bonilla. Yes. Mayor Rodriguez. Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so we're, do we need to do anything uh, special to move the item number 24? I think I can just note in the minutes that, that it is being continued to, um, January 30th meeting, a date certain. Okay. Um, great. Is that right, Sean? That'd be fine. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. So, um, very, very lightning round of reports and announcements. <laughs> I'd just like to adjourn in memory of someone again. Okay, I just have one quick announcement. Um, applications are now being accepted until January 29th for a vacancy on the library board. Okay, um, all yours, Council Member Pepin. One come all. So um, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to adjourn in memory of Floyd Ganella. He is the husband of Margaret Taylor, who is on our um, 
Financial Investment Advisory Committee, and they live here in San Mateo. And Floyd was a long time, um, he was head of, of uh, the County Board of Education, I believe. And he also was head of the Jefferson Union High School District. He was a legend when it comes to public education, an absolute legend. And it's my honor to ask that we uh, have a adjourn in his memory tonight. Okay. All right, everyone, thank you so much. And good morning. Have a big day tomorrow. Be safe, everyone. Take care.